I'm here to share with you my knowledge of the game of chess. It's not just checks and attacks. You have to be creative. Check. And now we can look at few studies when changing pieces could lead to a decisive advantage for one side or to be a defensive mechanism to save the game that looks otherwise desperate. White has an extra piece, but our pawn is under attack and our knight is under attack. In the middle game, or in the opening, you definitely have to pay attention to this threat because knight is more valuable than a pawn. But we're in the end game. So protecting the knight doesn't do us any good. If we protect the knight and black takes the pawn, that's a theoretically drawn position. Rook and knight cannot win against a lone rook. But how can we benefit from keeping this pawn alive? The trick is that we play a quiet move, a3. It doesn't seem logical. Black simply takes the knight with a check, but then king g2, and surprise, surprise, the rook that has so many moves cannot avoid the exchange. If rook goes back on h1 or g1, then rook d1 will exchange rooks, and our pawn is unstoppable. But instead of moving to the first rank, rook h1 or g1, black rook can go back to f4. And then we understand why our pawn moved not to a4, but to a3. Sometimes it's very important. You make a, just a small move, one square, but it has devastating effect because this pawn protects square before. And after rook b3 check, king goes on c2 or a2, doesn't matter, then we'll go rook b4. And rook, black rook is trapped. Technically it's not trapped because like an exchange rule, either taking on before, and after a before, our pawn is unstoppable, or moving rook on g4, and then after exchange, our pawn is again unstoppable. And that's one of the lessons of this endgame. What lessons will we learn today? Grandmaster Robert Hess with me for the Magnus Carlsen versus Alexander Grishuk semi-final of the 2017 Speed Chess Championship. It's getting bigger and better every single round, Robert. Both the players are sitting and waiting and ready. How excited are you to get this party started? Well, Danny, I'm absolutely stoked. Last year, these two had an epic clash, and yes, Magnus Carlsen won by a large score, but Grishuk actually was pretty much dominating in the early sections of that match, and he slipped up. I remember a really bad tactic that he overlooked, and, of course, Magnus pulled away in the bullet portion. So I think it will be a close match, much closer, certainly, than Magnus Carlsen versus Wesley So. Shout out to Impala10, who's already subscri subscribed, and the show is just getting started. But it started with 16, everybody, those amazing and brilliant 16 faces you see in front of you, some of the best chess players in the world. It was cut down to eight in round two. The matches were bigger, better, and just even more scary. These guys, it looks, looks like their faces get more serious as we go on. And now we're down to four. Magnus Carlsen versus Sasha Grishik right here, right now, today. Sergey Karyakin versus Hikaru Nakamura, likely for December 15th. There's the bracket as it stands, and as I said, very likely Sergey Karyakin and Hikaru Nakamura for December 15th. That date could change, but mark your calendars for somewhere in the middle of December, all of you fans. Uh, Robert, the, uh, the show is about to get started. Shout out once again to our, our sponsor, Masterclass. As of today, if you sign up early at masterclass.com slash chess for Gary Kasparov's course with Masterclass, you can actually get the entire course now. It is ready, Robert. It is out. So I know you've been sitting there waiting, saving up your money. It's time for you to go pull the trigger and get yourself Gary Kasparov's course. Yeah, absolutely. You know me, Danny. I've been reading my great predecessors in anticipation for the full Masterclass by Gary Kasparov. Well, the game should be getting started here any moment, and, uh, and just like that, we are off to see the wizard. The wonderful, wonderful wizard of Magnus Carlsen in his cloak today. He brings out the headphones and the hoodie. He's leaving right after this to go join Eminem in an underground rap circle in Detroit. I don't know if you knew that, Bobby, but that's what he's doing right after this match. So there you go. Yeah, I thought he was joining Carmelo Anthony in OKC because hoodie mellow, hoodie Magnus is a perfect fit. That's right. Um, but, you know, with the match underway... Um, and I always forget that we, you know, last year the 960 came first, but this year just regular games until the 960. And we see Grishuk get off to a pretty solid start, not a huge opening theory whatsoever in these lines of the King's Indian attack, but probably Grishuk just trying to build up 
um, an initiative, uh, keep the tension, and try to outplay Magnus in the long run. Yeah, this is uh, going to be interesting if we see this repeated approach. I don't feel like the King's Indian attack was something that Grishik played consistently last year against Magnus. You and I had the call for that, though we both admit that our memories are not that good. Maybe your memory is, but I don't remember all the openings we saw that day uh, when Grishik and Magnus went at it. But we, I do remember what you said. Sasha Grishik jumped out to a big lead in that match. He was actually up 2-0 to start and maintained it. Really, out, as you said, outplayed Magnus in the blitz portion until Carlson showed uh, showed uh, uh, his class in bullet. But we earlier this year, Robert, we saw Sasha against Maxime Vashe Legrave really stretch out some of the ending games in the 3-2 portion, really trying to put himself in a position to not let the bullet decide the match, knowing MBL's a better bullet player. I'll be interested to see if that plays a factor today. If he jumps out to a lead against Magnus, look for Grishuk to take away uh, take away time off that overall game clock. Remember, everybody, that's one thing that makes this format different and interesting and more like other sports. You're not just racing to score, you're racing against a clock, which is not something they normally do in a regular tournament. So, shout out once again to Gummy Bear, ba Gummy Bear Man 01 for subscribing to our channel. Your thoughts, Robert, on, on that match strategy potentially coming from Sasha? Well, he definitely has to do better in the longer time controls because as we saw last year, Magnus completely dominated him in the bullet portion. I believe... Magnus is only at one point heading into the bullet and then end up winning by eight. So um, clearly not Grishuk's strong suit. But um, in on-the-board chess, um, Grishuk has several 80-plus move wins against Magnus. And you know, the, the more moves these games have, the fewer actual games at this time control. So you know, if Grishuk is going to stay in the match, he needs to jump out to a lead. Hopefully he's been practicing his bullet. And right now, I, you know, his position actually I don't particularly like. I think Black has done well to not just equalize, but after this move Castle right now, I see absolutely no issues whatsoever for Black. White's pieces are a little strange. Um, yes, you know, White's expanding on the, the king side here, but after bishop g6, you know, f4, it's not like this bishop on g6 is actually getting trapped, um, right. unless I'm overlooking some sort of um, tactic. I guess after bishop g6, f4, um, you can't go f5 for Black because queen e6 check hits that bishop over there on uh, d6. But, wow, look at that move, Danny. Rook e8. Well, actually, now I'm not sure about this. What if I just take this bishop on h5? You, you do discovery with knight g6. If I take the rook on e8, queen takes e8, and then pawn takes g6. White seems to have a lot of material for the sacrifice queen. Yeah, after knight takes f5 at the end of that line, white officially has a rook and a couple minors. So I'm curious to see what happens here or what what Magnus evaluates about that position. Wow, knight, e, knight c8 unleashing the queen to hit the knight. That's but what we missed. G5, Bishop g5 is just good for white, I think, because it hits the queen on d8. And, oh, it didn't play it, but okay, bishop g5 if Bishop there, g5, maybe there was f6? But that's a move you want to entice from white's perspective, because then even even then you go bishop back to e3, actually, and then on h4 is under attack. So do they just miss uh, what seems to me like a straightforward tactic, or am I just uh, overlooking something this early uh, in the day? Uh, you know, I... Uh... I would be more likely to believe, believe it or not, that um, that they're missing something than you at this point. I know you ate your Wheaties this morning, and uh, I'm not <laughs> I'm not worried about your calculation. It's interesting. I, I don't know. It's one of those things we'd have to look back and uh, you know take take a look back at. Um, here comes the uh, the knight into e5 though. With the transition that happened, whether Grishuk missed a chance or not, we're liking black again. I believe. Look at this move knight e5, forking the queen and the pawn on d3, and uh, if this black queen gets to h4. Seems like Black's pieces are naturally finding good counterplay on the king side. Yeah, absolutely. I don't even see a way that White protects his pawn at c4 because uh, if you go queen d4, that's a terrible square for the queen. The knight just comes e7 over to f5, and Black's initiative is huge over there on the king side with uh, the white pawn structure very strange, you double h pawns and just an f pawn. So now just pawn takes c4, it looks like a free pawn. Yeah, Magnus calculating there. We see some some RCM, rapid calculation movement there from the eyes. I think Magnus is considering whether he wants to take it or maybe even just go um, a move like D4, keep the position closed and, and, and try to focus in on the king side. Um, as much as that seems weird, I wonder if you could play D4 and, and keep the D3 pawn backward and then kind of build up on a, on a king side attack. So we'll see if Magnus decides it's better to take the pawn or to keep the position closed and, and try to go for a king side attack. Yeah, I guess I'm being a bit greedy at the moment. I just don't see any way to kind of rebut my plan of just 
DC4, DC4, Knight takes C4. But I agree with you, Danny, that actually if Black had played D4 there, there's this weakness, long-term weakness on D3. The Knight on E5 is in prime position. I guess there, perhaps, White would have attempted to go F4, F5 very quickly. And, you know, that's White's only real play is an attack on the King's side. However, for the time being, Black's King is perfectly safe because there's no way, there's no uh, conceivable way at the moment for that Queen to get to G7 and deliver a checkmate. And the only other thing that White can do is really go B3, Bishop B2, and then you know try to get them diagonal. But I think it's uh, very slow. And after B3, there's always going to be problems in the diagonal for, from White's perspective as well, because a move like Knight to D3 um, will be quite annoying. Yeah, that would be a, a brute force way to take advantage of the Rook on A1 with a piece sacrifice, as I show your analysis on the analysis board. Uh, but uh, all right, well, either way, Grishik knows he needs to do something quickly, decides to sacrifice the C4 pawn just to get developed. Uh, now officially down a pawn, and that H6 pawn is even potentially weak uh, for, for White in the long run. But um, but does he have some compensation now? I'm looking at a move like Bishop G5 potentially coming for White and maybe trying to get some, some access into these dark squares, starting with F6. Yeah, that's a good strategy. Perhaps you can trade the Queens, Bishop G5, and... Like you said, try to go through F6. The main issue I see from White's perspective is the form of compensation that you need is very uh, quick play and a huge initiative. I'm not really seeing exactly how to, to make that. Even if you get the bishop off E5 uh, by going knight F6 check at some point and trading it off, I just think that you're down a pawn. And especially this bishop on G2 is staring at a rock. This B7 yep. pawn structure is uh, it's, you know, blunting that bishop, quite frankly. And so I don't really see the full compensation for the pawn, especially now. I think black can unleash this move f5 here, and that kicks the knight away from e4. It's sometimes a risky move, but with black with much better development, I don't see how white is going to uh, fight back against a move like f5. Yeah, I like f5 too. I think f5, obviously, we have to look at the most aggressive move, knight c5. And then what's the move? Even a move like queen e7, right? Hit the knight on c5, protect the pawn on b7, and, and get back to work with a move like rook to d8 coming to follow it. Yeah, and white's pieces are just not on particularly good squares, and his bishop on c1 is stuck at home. So, you know, it, it looks a bit threatening in a sense with his knight on g5. But I don't like that move bishop takes b2. Yeah. That was... I, I was not his, expecting that at all. What is his plan? Because, by the way, everybody, bishop takes b2, knight takes b2 would fall to queen to c3, double attack on the knight and checkmate. So that can't be Magnus's plan. What's he What's he planning with bishop takes b2? He I must, think he's just trying to queen takes g5. Right, but, but even that, queen to c3 is super scary to me. Yeah, I don't like that at all. I don't, um, I'm trying to see if I'm overlooking something, but you're right, Dan, just bishop takes b2. And queen c3 happening next, no matter what. Bishop f4. Wow. Super strange whatever both players calculated, because uh, the evaluation bar agreed with you, Robert. It did not like bishop takes b2 from Magnus and suggested Grisha go exactly the variation you're talking about, taking in queen c3. But, uh, but now that uh, Grisha has played bishop f4, it's back to loving black's position, naturally. Yeah, I'm just up so much material. The, the only compensation is kind of phantom compensation. It's, uh, you know, hope, hopeful chess, essentially, that black will somehow go awry and all of a sudden the king will be checkmated because, I mean, black is up so much material. They're nice knights on b6 and c4, and it's a phantom attack, like I'm saying. So yeah. if this is over, now is completely winning at this point. Yeah, so how do you uh, convert on this? I mean, okay, so h4, h5, this will be a last stab here by Grishuk, potentially. Um, rook but to d4. Yeah, just more. This is a perfect continuation here by Magnus. Oh, now, gonna, yeah, Rook D one is coming, and that's going to force a queen trade, and with it, uh, all your attacking chances are gone once the ladies come off the board. White, black is. I, I think White can safely resign here and not be. Uh, yeah, I'm too early. Grishik uh, doesn't doesn't look super thrilled with this first game here, um, but uh, we will will. We'll see if Magnus converts it cleanly or gives him any more chances. Uh, we only have, not only, we still have uh, an hour and 20 minutes left here in the uh, in the 2017 Speed Chess uh, Championship here. Round one is just 5-2 Blitz, everybody. If you're just joining us, we still have a lot more to go. So uh, you, uh, you didn't miss much. Stay tuned. You know, when you said only there, you reminded me of a teacher being like, oh, we only have 90 minutes left in yeah. third period physics. <laughs> it's only 90 more minutes, right? <laughs> um, Magnus going but, with knight f3 and c4. 
Yo. Interesting stuff. This looks a little like it's going to reach something a little more mainline. The last King's Indian attack by Grishik was not super theoretical. Yeah, and th this is um, definitely popular um, at, even at the highest levels. And exactly, I was going to say bishop b5 by Magnus is a good point. It's that you're putting pressure on this knight on c6. If black ever captures on d4, or even if it doesn't, black is left an isolated d-pawn, and um, white is happy to just start putting pressure on it. Now, black can make a move here like a6, um, but white should not capture on c6, but instead retreat the bishop probably to a4, also consider going through e2. Um, so you play against that isolated pawn, and that is white's main benefit in this position. So should black take back with the B pawn then, right? It's a transition where you have to choose. Do you want the hanging pawns, where at the very least they protect each other and you have more potential for space? Ah, but then comes E4, right? Magnus actually immediately ready for that. This is a very common uh, teaching moment here, Robert, where you, where you attack the lead pawn in one of these hanging pawn structures, trying to get the trade to happen, which will force the C6 and A6 pawns to be even weaker uh, and even easier to target. So this, I really like this E4 move by Magnus, especially given that black hasn't gotten castled yet. And certainly overlooked by Grishuk because the bishop on d6 is hanging, right? So if you ever take on e4, just queen yep. takes d6, and that's problematic. However, I don't think that black is doing too poorly here because even if you either go bishop d4, maybe bishop e7 is a little more safe, but bishop e7 and we all capture on d5, the queen takes on d5 at the end, but these two bishops provide good compensation for the pawn. Of course, white will be slightly better there, uh, but two bishops are two bishops have a lot of open space to work with. And with only two on one on the queen side, I actually think that black can equalize without too much difficulty with proper play. Yeah, uh, agreed with you. And, and we'll see now, uh, Grishik choosing the other move you mentioned quickly. Wow, he plans to castle after taking the pawn. Similar ideas of what you're saying. He And shout out to uh, K1SKU and Sam Copeland before for subscribing. Sorry, I forgot to mention you. Um, if white takes on c6 and bishop takes, it's the type of compensation you were talking about, but maybe even more aggressive for black. So much so that Magnus doesn't even want to gobble the pawn yet. He wants to increase the pressure and see if he can get more than just a pawn in the center here. Yeah, and it's very smart, honestly, because the, the advantage that he wants is not materialistic, but instead he wants a positional edge where he's playing a, a knight, knight on f3 against his bishop on d7 and right. hoping using the square on d4, which we'll call a transit square. And what that means is that any of white's pieces can use it and not actually be attacked. So the knight can come to d4. At some point, a rook can come to d4 and uh, be very solidly protected on that square. Even now, queen d4 actually is a good option, right? Trying to shatter black's kingside pawn structure. So that right. was very smart by Magnus, understanding that the material advantage was actually helping black in his, pack, in his quest to equalize, whereas this type of advantage makes it much more difficult with many threats down the, down the line. But in the end, Magnus is a material girl in a material world, Robert. He is <laughs> going to have to try to go for some sort of pawn, right? You're going to see the pressure on f6 mount to the point where the d5 pawn is something Magnus is still going to be try to try to be winning. Yeah, I mean, for sure. But now with this bishop on e6, it's really difficult to actually go for that pawn. And I think there's been, I don't know, something feels a bit inaccurate the last few moves because I don't, I, mean, I wasn't hoping for from White's perspective to take on f6 now. It just seems right. like, yes, as, as it's being played, the rook is infiltrating via b6. But again, these pawns for White are quite weak. Their queenside pawns are not connected. So at some point, a move like queen f5 going into c2 will be a nuisance. And so um, even rook c7 and rook f to c8 hitting c3, I just don't see how White can claim a real advantage here. Yeah, agreed 100%. I'm not exactly sure what happened with the tension there. Maybe Magnus overplayed uh, with the move 95, the thought that this tension on f6 would, would yield more of an advantage. But I agree. Right now it looks like, yes, white is going to be probably the first to win a pawn, whether that's the a pawn or the d pawn. But these c, these c and a pawns are just as weak and hard to claim an advantage for white at all as they head to the endgame. And this move a5 by Grishuk, he's clearly unwilling to part with the pawn. And after f4, of course, now you have to be very careful about white threatening f5. However, I mean, a move here like rook to b8, trying to trade those rooks, or I guess queen f5 runs right into g4. So that's yep. not a good move. So I guess, and g6 is ugly. So yeah, I don't like the move a5. It just felt, it felt a little bit slow there. So queen f5 instead of a5 was what I was saying, and just getting the activity again. Yeah, I, I, I liked it, and I was highlighting it on the analysis board. I had a hard time also believing the black 
wouldn't be equalizing in that endgame. But but we'll see. I mean, one of the reasons that Magnus Carlsen is so good is not just the moves he's playing on the board, but his time management. We know how good he is in Rapid and Blitz, Robert. I mean, you can look at uh, look at the time right now, right? He's almost up two minutes on the clock. And fun fact about Magnus, for those wondering, we did a little research, Robert, before this match on just how good is Magnus Carlsen in Rapid and Blitz. Well, just in the month of November... He has had a an overall record on online and the St. Louis showdown of 88.5 to 23.5, crushing Wesley So, Dingley Wren. We're just doing even more and more research after that performance against Wesley So on Saturday of, of how good Magnus is in this format and in these faster time controls. Yeah, he's an absolute monster, and it's just, you know, hardly anybody can contend with him or even come close to contending with him. Um, Grishuk is one of those players who has a shot if he's on his absolute best form. And because he's just so talented, a World Blitz champion. Um, but right now, I just like Mags' chances, not just because he won the first game, because I just don't like the decision-making I'm seeing from Grisha. I just, he's prioritizing material, especially in this game. Right. And now he's out, actually, I think he's now with the Queen on C2, he's better, because that Bishop on E6 might quickly find its way to E4, in which case White better be careful. So maybe I'm going to eat my words, but what I was going to say is that I think Grishuk is prioritizing the wrong things at this point. He was looking at the material instead of looking at the activity. And right now he has found activity, and look at him go. His, I believe his advantage is quite large here because, firstly, White's not even threatening any pawns. Right. And more importantly, this Bishop coming to E4 is a deadly threat. So... And that's exactly why Magnus plays this move, knight c6, everybody, trying to prevent bishop of 5 via the knight e7 check fork, which would simplify white's position and uh, and defend against the threat. You're right. If, if black could get this bishop to e4, that could be lights out very, very quickly, and that would be a surprising end of this game. But what, what if black plays a simple move here, right? Like rook e8, just guard e7, and you're even, a move like rook e8, Robert, threatens something like bishop takes h3 in some positions due to rook e1 checkmate coming, so... Actually, I love wow. rookie eight. Rookie eight looks great. Perfect. Because I was going to say, Danny, and because king h7, but I was going to say after rookie eight, if rook b7 still threatening his 97 check, bishop takes h3 is winning on the spot. So right. um, yeah, rookie eight was a nice move there, but black is still better. So, I mean, how is white going to knight e7? It's such an ugly move to play because now your knight is um, you know, threatening. You're threatening to go pawn f5 at some point, but that knight is weirdly placed on e7. And so I guess A2, can A2 be picked off here? Maybe then F5. It's getting a bit complicated. So I guess I have to be a little more cautious in what I'm suggesting here, but perhaps even Bishop F5 from black, just um, saying, okay, I'll get, we'll trade the minor pieces, but your king on G1 is less safe than my king on H7. And this is the downside of playing a move like F2 to F4 earlier is that your king is going to suffer uh, in these positions with the rook and queen on the board. So maybe bishop c8 here is even better, right? Because if yeah. knight takes c8 and there's rookie 2 stuff. Yeah, I wonder I mean, if knight takes c8 is rookie 2 just winning on the spot, right? Heading over to g2 and forgetting about the pony all the way over there on the edge of the board. I, th I think yeah. bishop c8 and bishop f5, I think bishop f5 would be the simpler way uh, to, like, okay, and, and Grishik decides that's what he wants. But I agree with you. I think bishop c8 was actually the strongest move there for black. Um but, uh, but I, I love Black's position. the biggest issue I have with Black's position, Robert, again, is on the clock. That's what got me a little bit on my tangent about Magnus Carlson's incredible November. Uh, shout out to uh, K1SKU, who has cheered both 1,000 and 2,000 uh, bits. So uh, thank you for loving the show, and thanks to all of our supporters and viewers tuning in, no matter where you are. We also had a ton of people playing Guess the Move last game. Go to chess.com slash live or, or click those buttons right below the chess.com TV player. And you can try to guess along with the players. Um, okay, so Ma Magnus taking this approach, he's going to try to go after Black's weak pawns before his king gets in too much trouble. But something tells me Grishik is still uh, driving the driving the bus here. Maybe Queen G6, maybe uh, Queen C2 still. Well, so Queen, yeah, Queen D5. Now you pick up the pawn and protect G2, which is essential. And I don't see how Black is going to keep the queens on the board. And in fact. He does not, yeah. and this game should peter out into a draw, and Grishuk, in fact, offered a oh, draw wow. okay. and agreed. So, Well, that happened quickly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that was a very strange game. Magnus looked better at first, slightly yep. better, nothing too huge, and I thought Grishuk did not do well to um, stifle that advantage. Instead, he actually let Magnus' advantage grow, but then all of a sudden, Magnus went F4, perhaps not seeing the consequences of that move, 
and he was in a bit of trouble there. And if Grishuk had been precise, and if, in fact, if Grishuk had had more time on the clock, so he could have been more precise, then Magnus could have seen himself go down in flames. But now um, we see some kind of weird, it's going to be a weird theoretical battle at this moment. I don't know the theory. I don't play this line. Um, but this lots is, uh, of yeah, this, this early B5 line is super, super double-edged for black. Um, but uh, I don't know the theory either. I would be I would be kidding myself if I pretended to have something knowledgeable to say right now. Who are we kidding? Uh, but <laughs> okay, but I guess we're going to learn something. And I can already say that comparing this match, Robert, to yester not yesterday's but Saturday's match with Wesley, so really night and day in terms of the different approaches by the two players. If if Grishik is going to stay in mainline theory. Uh, Wesley played a Nimzo Larson ready kind of hybrid deal and avoided theory all day against Magnus. But uh, I, I think Eric Hansen and I were both a little critical of that, even though Wesley afterwards in the post-interview said he just didn't think there's any reason to challenge Magnus in the main lines. He knows them all too well. But I think a lot of people feel like the opposite approach is really the best way to challenge Magnus and to go into some theoretical stuff and see if you can catch him sleeping in a line and, and get some sharp tactics. What are your thoughts on, on the different approach in terms of how can you possibly play and expect to beat the best player on the planet? Well, I think saying that the other player knows more than I do or knows everything is not a sign of weakness. That's that would be too strong, but it is a sign of nervousness. And if you're being nervous, you're not playing ch objective chess. And quite frankly, that is redundant because chess is objective, right? If you're getting all scared and nervous and saying, I need to switch everything because you know, there's a difference between being practical and saying, my opponent's a very great theoretician and Sicilian, so let me avoid Sicilian and, and do something else versus saying he knows everything. Let me just, play B3 on the first move. Not only does he, if he know openings, he's, I mean, his forte is in these just random neutral positions where he outplays right. everyone in the world. Yeah. So I think it's a bad strategy. I think it's a sign of um, kind of, you know, like I said, nervousness. It's not good for you. And I think Grishuk is off to the right start in terms of opening choices thus far. Well, Wesley, um, or Eric and I also agree with that, that Wesley in, in some ways maybe gives Magnus too much credit. And, okay, either way, not trying to hash out the past to beat up on Wesley or anything else, but talking about the approach in this moment where I believe that uh, Grishuk is... He's got a small edge here, and at the very least in these sharper positions where if you don't know the theory or if you're falling asleep or in Magnus's case last match, watching a soccer game of Real Madrid at the same time, you might get caught and, and lose a game really quickly, right? So I, I'll be interested to see, and I, I would bet that we see Grishuk try to be a little more uh, direct and use some real preparation. Something about this game, Robert, the fact that this is totally different than the last game where they're both using real time in the opening tells me they may even be trying to remember a little bit of their ideas in this line. Well, frankly, I hate White's position because okay. there's a lot of hanging pieces. You're up a pawn, but it's a pawn on b6. It should be able to be scooped up quite easily. And right now, for example, rook d8, the only saving move for White looks like is e5 because that pin on d4 is quite annoying. And going e5, hoping that queen takes on e5, and then um, you know you can go queen f3, for example, and the rook on a8 is hanging. But so just bit, simple moves for Black. Bishop b7, follow that up maybe with knight c6. Once you regain this pawn on b6, you have the two bishops in open, semi-open board, and I think just superior position. So I, I don't love White's position. Maybe I'm a little harsh. I think White's position is okay. It, it sounded be. a little harsh. I'm going to be honest with you. Shout out to <laughs> Shaitan Nudachi and um, our last subscriber. Sorry, I, I forgot to shout your name while Robert was offering me some teaching moments. Um, but no, okay, I understand. Yeah, obviously the, the bishop pair for black, and certainly if the b6 pawn doesn't become an asset, it can only become a weakness when it's extended as far to the 6th rank. Uh, but is, is rook d8 really that strong of a threat? I guess that's the question. If, if white is forced to sacrifice the e5 pawn and, and release the, uh, the pin with a tempo, um, doesn't that also help white, though? Because the queen on f3 kind of makes the b6 pawn a little more dangerous in some of those lines. For sure, but what I always hate when I have these kind of structures, making this move e5, and then when the queens get traded off, it's very difficult to protect it. It's overextended. And so if I'm, from Black's perspective, going rook d8, and if white goes e5, just going queen to e7, following that up with bishop to b7, and again, that natural development. What I will say is, in the interim, the e4 square is nice for the white knight, if it can get there safely. And, and this pawn on b6 can only be an asset because it's an extra pawn. But I really, I'm, I think forcing this move, you know, rook d8, forcing e5 from white is uh, strategically very good from Magnus's perspective. 
Okay, so let's analyze it. Magnus is obviously taking his time here to try to confirm that he agrees with you. Let's say e5, queen takes e5, queen to f3 from white. Well, What's your I'm not taking on e5. Sorry, I'm going to go queen back to e7. I don't want to allow queen f3 and, you know, just hurting my queen side. So I have to rook d8, okay, e5. But I guess my thought was that if queen e7, now maybe white has queen to g4 with threats of things like knight e4, knight f6, and white is sort of uh, using that e5 pawn and the newly opened e4 square to get an attack going. Yeah, no, that that definitely is the drawback of allowing from e5 when you, the knight coming to e4. Um, but what, so he just decided to take on c3 instead. But now I feel like yeah, that knight was a little b7 a threat. Like, is can you go knight e6 and b, yeah, b7? You could, you could almost play b7 first if you wanted to get that bishop to remove itself from c8. Everybody, that's Robert's idea. Then you take on e6, and you've got a discovery on the newly undefended knight because the bishop's not there. So I think both b7 and knight takes e6 seem to be threats. Also, what if I just play the simple rook to b1, guard the b-pawn, threaten b7, and by the way, if rook b1, bishop b7, I can still go for this idea of knight takes e6, and now I haven't even given up the b6-pawn. That's true. I guess I was concerned rook b1, rook b8, but I then you could still do this knight e6 stuff anyway. But yeah, this is, I think, an oversight on Magnus's part. Perhaps he thinks that, you know, once a bunch of pieces gets traded, he can still have good strong chance but i thought he was better before i mean i i don't know i, I feel like this has to be you know a miscalculation on his part because he did spend a lot of time so um it's unclear to me what i guess he might have been worried about what you were saying danny with e5 queen g4 knight e4 stuff but now this is just a pawn so white yeah. is up clear pawn well, uh, Grishik is cashing in on that pawn. He's taking on e6 and expect the b7 pawn to come next. Everybody, shout out to Casual Sax who just subscribed. Here comes queen takes d7, and the e6 pawn is falling with check now. Do we trade queens as white or keep the bishops, keep the queens on the board? What's your advice for the uh, for the viewers? Okay. Yeah, he already traded queens. I was going to suggest the same. The problem is that white's king could actually become under fire with eventual queen g5, and not to mention the queen on f6 hit the pawn on c3. So here it's actually more difficult for black to attack the pawn on c3 because the bishop on e6 covers that c8 square. So from white's perspective now, maybe start with pawn f3 to hit the bishop on e4. Then that way you can get your king out quickly via f2. And um, you know, rook a3 is another very natural move coming up to both protect the c3 pawn and to threaten rook f to a1, uh, applying pressure on that a pawn. So um, I don't know. White has very good winning chances here, I think, uh, from a practical perspective that you know just a retreat here like bishop I, I might keep it this is a tough decision actually I, I it's just you can't go bishop h3 i guess bishop f5 will be played offering an exchange uh, because if those bishops are traded then the rook um the both black rooks will head the c file so if it's a trade of the a pawn for the c pawn the three on two on the king side would result in a theoretical draw so from white's perspective you do want to keep the bishop on the board which leads me to believe bishop b3 is probably best because after bishop b3, if the bishop removes itself from the b1 to h7 diagonal, then white, and he plays bishop b3. Um, so now, yeah, rook a3, very natural. So I'm really liking white's position more and more uh, because, again, you have this past c pawn. You can easily apply pressure on this pawn a5. And um, the time situation with both sides having under two minutes, I think that also favors um, white in this case because it's much more difficult to defend and to start pushing forward. Yeah, agreed. And uh, now I wonder if White can just start bringing the king up, king of two, king e3, and why not go all the way to d4? I'm not exactly sure if Black's blockade, even though everything's protected now. The rooks both guard a5, the bishop on c6 is protected, but I wonder if White just brings the king up, if Black can really afford to hold ground the way he is. Um, but time pressure will be, I mean, one of the things, okay, Magnus was down a couple minutes on time, really, and now he's now he's back to being up, and, and Sasha may be deciding he doesn't even want to risk losing this game because of time pressure. I, I was I was paying close attention to that because I think that one thing we've seen Grishuk do, even though he jumped out to a lead in the blitz portion, is overall Magnus is the much faster player. And so I think that Grishuk has a little bit of hesitancy or a bad taste in his mouth from losing some games under time pressure in their last match. Just a, Just a hunch. Yeah, that's that's a very fair point because um, you know he is the slower player. He got crushed in the bullet, so he needs to keep time on his clock, which he has not done a good job of thus far. And okay, this is a theoretical draw, though. You know, it, I mean, I guess it's possible to lose, but I don't see Magnus losing this one. 
We have a few questions in the chat about Magnus's hoodie. Some comments. Maybe we can get a. Uh, maybe we get Magnus as a Sith Lord. Let's get a Photoshop competition going on here, right? But uh, fun fact about that hoodie, Robert. He wore it at the Isle of Man and. Uh, at the Champions Showdown in St. Louis. So that, that hoodie, whatever it is, maybe it's got a soft, silky touch on his skin. You know how we feel about soft, silky st touches. Um, <laughs> maybe that's why he's wearing it. But uh, yes, that hoodie is, is becoming a regularly featured part of Magnus's wardrobe. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to comment on his fashion style or anything like that. That's my job. Looks, you focus on the chest, yeah. <laughs> it looks comfortable, quite frankly. It does look so. comfortable, yeah. Um, okay, well, right, right now... the. the the Black King is perfectly placed. I guess the only attempt White will have is if somehow Black doesn't know what he's doing. I mean, okay, I don't want to kind of make this seem more simplistic than it is. But the, the problem for White is you can't get this king to the uh, fifth rank. And the only way to do so is to go G4, F4, F5, so the king can come over to H5. But when you do that, the rook will come uh, to A1 and threaten rook H1 check. So you, um, you cannot get two pieces attacking this pawn h6. And if that's the case, and even if white goes g4 and pushes the f pawn, you're not going to actually be able to make progress as black will harass the white king from behind. So um, this is a uh, well-known theoretical draw. And um, you know if you go g3, g4, g5, and try to trade the g pawns, well, rook, against, rook and f pawn versus rook is also an easy draw. Um, so I, I think that in, I mean, I guess it's, if, Danny, I guess my question is, if you're Grishuk, do you actually want to play this out, or do you want to get more games in the five-minute portion so that you don't have to get to the bullet portion uh, you know, with you know, trying to you know, rack before bullet? It's a good question, and we already know that Grishuk has maybe put even more thought into the overall match strategy of this format than maybe any of the other players we've ever had play, right? I mean, uh, he talked a lot about that after he beat MBL there. Everybody, you can see there was 58 minutes officially remaining in the 5-2 portion. So we know Sasha thinks about that. I, I would I would say it's twofold, Robert. I think, yeah, I think Grishuk's best chance is the longer time controls to get a lead in the match. But you have to play out positions where you're better against Magnus Carlsen because last we checked, you don't get many of those, right? So it's not to say that Magnus is, is going to mess up this endgame and blow the draw, but but he might, right? And, and you're not going to have a lot of chances to grind him out and and win a game where under time pressure, it's a lot easier to be the person with the better position than it is to play the worst position when you're under time pressure, right? Yeah, that's perfectly true. I just think that, you know, for example, if Grishuk was with the black pieces, he would draw this with his eyes closed and in a right. sleep, right? Um, you know, recognizing right. that, hmm. it just might H5? make sense. H5 really. draw. Yeah, H5. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay, Magnus sees it. And it is a draw. Nietzsche, the draw is offered. Uh, not yet. I was just saying that. That was me. That was me looking into a crystal ball. Um, but okay, there we have it. And uh, and well, we still to... we still have a one game lead for Magnus Carlson. If you're just joining us, Magnus won the first game in this match, but since then we have had two peaceful results. And, and Dan, I would say shout out to Bazanji for getting 25 out of 49 as the top guesser and guess the move there. That was that's actually quite impressive, getting over half the moves right. Yeah, I can't remember. It. I got half of anything right last time. <laughs> Very good. Wow, that is pretty good. Yeah, a lot of people playing Guess the Move. Uh, log on to chess.com's live server and play the move on the board before the players do, and and you will be uh, it'll, it tracks and lets you know how you're doing. Kind of fun stuff. There's also an extension poll here on Twitch. If you're watching at Twitch TV slash chess, you can vote on who you expect to win the match. Most of the votes leaning Magnus Carlson's way. Uh, but um, okay, we have another. Uh, not as sharp as the last one we saw here as white, um, but uh, still still a theoretically, uh, a decently known theoretical position here. Right, and uh, before black had gone, gone D5, the pawns in E5 and C5 might have seemed a little strange because it creates a hole on D5, but the best way to shore that up is by trading uh, this backward D pawn for that C pawn. So now black is sitting comfortable for the moment with his knight on c7 that can eventually go to e6. And importantly, black is stopping white from going d4 anytime soon. And so it's going to be a slow kind of methodical game here where both sides are trying to build up a plan. From white's perspective, you're trying to break through a d4 at the right moment. Again, it's very, very difficult with this the pawn structure being e5, c5, knight on c6. Um, this is why a move like a3 is played, hopefully, hoping to eventually play 
uh, B4. That doesn't look very plausible, but also stopping the knight from going to B4 uh, to be a nuisance on the white queen. So if I'm, if I'm black here, I consider a variety of moves. Well, bishop E6 is the most natural. I was going to say G6 uh, can sometimes be uh, considered to put that bishop on F5. But again, black is doing very well here, very comfortable. And so, um, you know, I think that Grishuk is should be very happy with his current position. Yeah, it's a uh, it's it's the kind of Maroxy bind you normally see with white, uh, where with the colors reversed, right? White having this type of structure, uh, the Maroxy bind, everyone being this pawn structure here, where black has more space, and uh, as long as you can keep control over these breaks, d4 and b4, you're usually happy um, with the person. Well, on, on the normally I, I would say it's the white side of a Maroxy bind structure, but this is for black. Uh, but that's exactly what Magnus is going to try to do, right? You're going to see. I, I wonder if is Knight A5 a shot that is potentially coming here from Black. Sorry, I had to say that before I finish the instructional point, which is that White's going to Magnus is going to try to maneuver his pieces and get in a position to make a strike of either D4 and B4 because that's the kind of thing that liberates the 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 pieces behind the pawns. But or not, or he's going for a different idea where he wants to highlight the other weakness in a Maroxy bind, which is potentially this D5 outpost square. Uh, I think bishop c4 was almost more defensive-minded, though, Robert, to stop threats of this move knight a5 coming in to gang up on the b3 pawn. Right. I mean, knight a5 was an interesting shot there. I'm curious to, to know what the players thought about that. But, um, you know, the good move by Grishuk is he's he's hoping that white will take on, on e6, the knight then from c7 will capture an e6, and once more d4 is stopped. But if I'm white, again, it's important to know when to release the tension. Leave it for now. Go knight e2. That way you threaten the pawn on e5. Um, you try to go d2 to d4 and blast open the center, particularly because the rook on d1 is staring down a queen on d8. It's always good for the side with the rook. And so, um, you know, from Black's perspective, I would have preferred at some point to have gone f7, f5, which would have allowed um, Black to try to push forward in the center with e5 to e4. Now I think knight e2, and it's, the position is definitely turning in White's favor. Yeah, if knight e2 forces a move, um, well, okay, f6 isn't even possible because the bishop is hanging. But no, even it's if, not hanging. Knight on c7. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, duh. Okay, need, need a little more coffee here. But yeah, in, in fact, uh, the main but the main drawback of f6 is it's you know black is passively now having to defend this extended center, which you don't really want to be doing the Maroxy bind. And as Robert said, if white can strike with d4, usually white's pieces are a little more ready for the open lines that are about to happen as the pawns start getting traded in the center. So um, Magnus taking his sweet time here. Wow. And then plays a move Whoa. on the other side of the board that we didn't see coming. So Honey Badger doesn't care about the H pawn. What if Black just what goes and I... takes the H pawn? I was just saying Bishop G4 here, right? Because, you know, I, what, you can't take the H pawn. I would be uh, very hesitant before capturing it. But my thought is, OK, Bishop G4. Uh -huh. That way I'm pinning your knight on F3. Uh -huh. So you can't go knight G5. And the whole idea from White's perspective is to get the two bishops even at the cost of a pawn. So if I go bishop g4, well, you're not moving that knight because knight g5, I capture knight g5 and then take on d1. That's a free exchange. And so bishop g4, maybe queen to e4, but then queen d7. And now f5 is a huge threat. This pin on the f3 knight is still quite frustrating to deal with. So uh, from my point of view here, I think bishop g4 is just great for black. Yeah, I don't understand uh, what Magnus was thinking about h4. It feels a little reckless for white, uh, especially given the 92 and, and going for the more traditional plan. But but again, Grishuk not looking for aggressive shots, doesn't find this opportunity to go for something different. Uh, and, and now we see the reason why that h-pawn is rushing up the board. It's going uh, to be kamikaze here, it's probably going to try to just get that pawn to h6 and do whatever you can to open up counterplay against the black king. Although after h6, like Black could probably just capture on h6 and then try to use the g file yeah, for his and I, benefit. So. And I think Grishik's going to do exactly that. The bishop on c4 guards g8 as it currently stands, but but uh, I then still... You know me, I'm, I'm happy to sacrifice an exchange by going queen d7, next move rook g8, you can capture me all you want, I'll take yep. back with the rook. Not yep. to mention that f5, no, not f5 now because the, that diagonal's open, but uh, bishop f5 might be a, a bit of an annoying threat in the near future so um knight e8 to d6 is another perfectly reasonable idea that i think black has to be extremely careful about allowing this knight on c3 to move as you just been knight b5 because uh -huh. then sacrifice on e5 could be deadly at some moment with the bishops um just really uh, raking on the open board but 
Yeah, it's unclear position to be sure. So knight takes b5, bishop b5, uh, for example. Yeah, th this could be really funny, right? You start to have fantasies of the bishop uh, and knight and everybody coming together on e5, you know, um, the kind of fantasies you usually have, sacrifices <laughs> on e5. Yeah, I mean, but I guess if you're from Black's perspective, you know that that's in, uh, in, in the cards, right? You have to be cognizant of that sacrifice, but don't be afraid of it. Be objective. Knight takes b5, bishop takes b5, go bishop f5. Right, or even, even still, bishop f5 now. I mean, you've mentioned it before, and I don't usually like repeating the things you say, but I agree. It puts the queen on an awkward square, and I feel like Black is, is maybe even there capable of playing a move like Drook g8 because the potential compensation on this uh, open file when the light square bishop is gone could be really big for Black. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think bishop f5, queen's for The reason why I take on b5, and okay, now I'll go bishop f5. So, I, okay, queen e6. I, okay, decent move for sure. Uh, I would have preferred bishop f5, rook g8, but I guess um, Grishuk is trying to go rook g8 at some point, but now rook g8 always runs into bishop c4. So, um, I think Black is still doing well because white has to prove the compensation yes that the extra pawn is a weird double h pawn yeah but this time okay now that the queens come off the board i, wow. I don't think uh black is doing two points queen takes b3 i was wondering if queen takes b3 could have been a shot there yeah by black it... um magnus sort of pushing all the right buttons even if some of these moves are not the not the best objective moves magnus is creating a practical scenario where this king is now a sitting duck to the bishop on the diagonal. These doubled h pawns are nobody's favorite. Um, suddenly, I, I I'm starting to get this weird creeping feeling that the position's going to open up and Magnus is going to have devastating tricks on the long diagonal and the open e file. I'm not sure if if Grishik got everything he could have out of that position. Right, and I still would say that Black should be better here because yeah, you're up two pawns, and more importantly. You're up a two, well, three on two from the D to A files, but likely if that pawn captures on C5, then you're up two to one on the queen side. And um, if white's attack fizzles out, and right now the attack is only with his bishop on B2, so, I mean, I guess knight D2 is an option here for white. Knight D2 to... and knight E4 is an interesting one I was looking at because you hit the bishop, everybody, and then you try to bring this knight to E4 where, where they can gang D5. up together on F6. But wow, Magnus is... Okay, d5 must have the intention if bishop takes to play a move like rook to d1, sacrificing another pawn just to eliminate black's bishop pair. Um, I just, but it, I it does. It feels a little bit like like Magnus is really playing overly aggressive chess here. You know, trying to trying to uh, play the big stack, trying to push push the table around here. I, d I don't know exactly what what he's calculating with d5. Okay, and, and I think this is a smart decision by Grisha because. Maybe not even a go for tactics on the D file. Simplify it out because at the end, as you already said, Black has this three on on one over here on the queen side. Going to have a big advantage in the end game, and that C pawn is looking more and more dangerous for Black every second. Oh wow! Yeah, I was expecting this exchange sacrifice, but I think it's a bluff. I think it's sort of out of desperation in the fact that well, Black was doing quite well. If you take it on E five with the bishop and the rook, that C pawn was running to the board very quickly. Yep. And now it's an exchange up. There's no check on that diagonal. You know, if the bishop was gone from b3, the bishop c4 check would be a huge threat. But now it's kind of, I don't know, I think it's, like I said, it's bluffing. Rook e3 to rook g3 is now a threat. Or is it? Can the black king then escape king f7 to e6? Yep. Right? So it's kind of a lot of hopeful chess from yep. Max's point of view. And from Grishuk's point of view, it's, well, I'm up in exchange. I have this past c pawn. And so a move here like, I don't know, king f7. Right, just bring well, the king, king of seven might allow g4. That would have been the trap that Magnus was looking for, right? Say goodbye to the rook, so. Ah, well, that's true. I guess I was going to take on e5 and then put my king on e6. And again, my queenside pass pawns are, at least from my point of view, are, are superior to the to the things going on in the center. But it is it is a tricky position. I, I don't think we should dismiss white's chances completely. But I think black, I mean, black should just eventually just push forward over there on the queen side. So, yeah. I agree. I, I, I think it's strange. We don't normally speak in these terms, right? Using a lot of poker terminology. Magnus sort of bluffing, maybe overplaying his hand a little bit. But the position has felt very much like Magnus was forcing dynamic uh, dynamic tactics. And uh, Grishik seems to have parried all the issues up to this point. But time pressure is real. 
And we know that uh, Grishik with only 16 seconds is, is going to be nervous here. I think this is going to be one of the things that decides today, Robert, whether Grishik can make an upset, can pull the upset and win this match. Is going to be how he handles moments right here, right now. Like this moment here, he's winning, but now there goes the clock. There goes the time, right? I mean, this is exactly the kind of issue that I think uh, Grishik will be facing against Magnus. It's, it's the Mikel Tal thing, right? It's Magnus bringing the practical pressure, even though objectively Black should be just fine here. This looks. This is looking scarier and scarier now. Right. You never want to see a bishop on e5 with a bear black king on g8, especially with a rook on the seventh rank. Yep. But again, it, it kind of appears just to be a check. And right. so if you know, but like you said, Dan, the time situation is really bad for Grishuk and continues to be. And so he made an inaccuracy with rook takes d7. If he taken d7 with the bishop, he would have been in a perfectly good shape. And even yep. still here, he should be all right. But I mean that. It has to favor white considering yep. the time situation. And you're right. Back in that critical moment, we saw that Magnus, you know, his sixth sense or whatever, he played this move D7, everybody, right? When Grishik didn't have much time, you can see on the analysis board, and that's what got Sasha to take. F6, and then F7 check is coming, right? Yeah. Rookie 7 check, King D8, F7, game over. And, and, uh, and already Magnus does what he does best. He just swindled his way to a victory based mainly on the fact that Grishik didn't have enough time to solve the issues that uh, to solve the landmine of tricks that Magnus laid out. So, you know, Robert, talking a little bit. So, apply give give some of your advice here to the uh, to the fans and how do you handle moments like that psychologically? You know, your opponent is playing something that's unsound. Should Grishik have just trusted his intuition and just taken the pawn with the bishop and say prove it, or do you have to try to solve the tactics there? I mean, we see Magnus basically working it right he's working his mojo against Grishik in games where he shouldn't be winning so how, how do you deal with that well I think one of the things to say is it's easier sometimes to be on a losing or much worse side of a game because when you're better you're trying to think how do I convert this how do I make right. sure that I don't slip up and let my opponent back in the game so from Magnus's point of view his actual game plan was easy he had a bishop on e5 he's like hopefully I can just push forward and start attacking the king and then he went D7 when Grishuk had like 10 seconds left, and all of a sudden Grishuk was kind of flustered and didn't know how to right. handle it. So from Grishuk's point of view, you do have to trust yourself. You have to say, you know what? I am one of the strongest players in the world. Obviously he is. He's much stronger than I am as a chess player, no doubt. Robert, and so he's, come on. No, just kidding. No, yeah. no, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to be realistic here. Like You have to just trust your instincts. Say, even if this isn't as good as some other line, I have to go with it with the in intuition, the knowledge that I am still better in the position. So um, Grishuk just needs to move faster also earlier in the game. It seems like he's getting decent positions and all of a sudden spending really way too much time and getting himself into uh, really dire straits in the clock. Yep. Well, uh, we kind of called it, right? We said the this moment right there in that critical situation with Grishuk under time pressure despite being winning was going to be one of the things that decides whether Grishuk can win this match. So far, we're seeing why Magnus Carlsen is up two games, is, is handling those moments like Robert said. It's a little easier said than done, right? You do have to trust yourself. You have to move quickly, and you have to push your opponent to prove it. But, you, you know, it, it's, it's hard for any chess player of the highest level to make a move that they haven't fully thought through, right? So your instinct as a chess player, Robert, almost gets the better of you when, you know, as a practical almost, you know, as a gamer, as an athlete, you just have to go under time pressure. You can't solve everything when you have no time on the clock, right? Right. You often can't solve everything, even if you have kind of infinite time on the clock. So right. to, to an extent, you just have to trust yourself frequently in chess games, not just in these uh, very fast blitz time controls. Um, but it just seems like either, you know, hopefully Grishuk can get it together because he's just not on his A game right now. There was that moment in uh, the game with he had black, when his queen was on c2, it looked like all of a sudden that he was the one in charge, and then it just fizzed out to a draw very quickly. So I, 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 we haven't seen the best of Grishuk yet. There's obviously still a lot of time left in this match, but Grishuk really needs to be much more precise when he has a better position or when he's you know in a kind of neutral or complicated position because as of yet, we have not seen the Sasha Grishuk that we've become accustomed to and that we love. Agreed. Uh, the Sasha Grishik that we've come accustomed to and that we love. And he'll be here. Don't worry. I invited him. I invited Sasha. Um, not Uncle Sasha. All right. Don't get too excited, Robert.
All right, so what's going on here? We have a Rui Lopez. Again, mainline theory. Again, I think this is the kind of thing we'll see Grisha trying to do more of than, than Wesley So did. But just whether it's been mainline openings or uh, sidelines, Magnus Carlsen has been up on the clock, and he is up almost a minute again in every game so far. Right, and in this current position, so the two bishops versus two knights. Now, in the old Russian school, classical training, we love bishops over knights. That said, this is a very closed position. Look at the position of the bishop on d3. It's just around two pawns. It's not actually attacking anything. So what Grishuk is doing is he's opening or trying to open the queen side, excuse me, the king side, rather, and expand on that side of the board where black has no actual counterplay. So a move like h4 can come, eventually h5. And from uh, Magnus's perspective, what is the plan? Chess is a game of plans, not of moves. And so it's very difficult for Magnus to actually do anything here as Grishuk has very simple play. And Magnus, Magnus is singing along. He's got some tunes in his head. I think he's entertaining the fans here. Magnus knows that he's on camera. We'll, uh, we'll have to ask him about that. But Danny, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I really like White's position here. It seems very riskless chess. And I mean, I guess if you're from Black's perspective, you always are going to consider this knight f4 move, right? Hoping that White captures an f4 to open the e file for that rook on e7 and to, of course, remove a protector of the dark squares. And that knight on c5 in any endgame will dominate a light square bishop. That said, if a move knight f4 is played, I don't think White is going to take that knight and maybe still try to push forward with h4 or rook g4 and uh, you know, continue with the plan that's been set forth. So, yeah, it looks really good for um, White in the current moment, but I don't know. I, the, the question becomes how to break through. So White can continue shuffling, right, and go uh, Rook to G4 after um, Black plays, but you know, Black should try to go A6. Maybe okay, Knight of Four played first. I was saying earlier that knight f4 is, of course, a plan because you're hoping to get rid of the two bishops from, from white and make use of the dark squares, not to mention the pawn e4 will become a target. But again, rook g4 ignores that knight. And now queen f8. Danny, I don't know about you, but at some point, white should just capture this pawn f4 and say, you know, I'm up a pawn, I'll protect my e4 pawn, and in the long run, make use of the fact that I'm up a little guy. I, I agree, and I think the real issue, though, is that you make this permanent, okay, he's going for it, but the permanent weakness on e4, and it's really also about the dark square right in front of it. I was just going to say, as Magnus fills it with the rook, you're kind of, you gave black a little more squares there, right? If you look at the position before capturing f4, people are sort of wrestling each other for the few open squares. Now Magnus has a little bit of life. So, I mean, honestly, I don't really know that that was a massive improvement for white. A pawn is a pawn is a pawn, as they say. The uh, exchange rate's the same everywhere, but... Black's going to play a6 at some point here, Robert. That bishop is going to have to retreat as it just did, and here comes the other rook to e8. Yeah, I, I, kind of, I kind of like the transition for black from a practical perspective, although if white plays rook up and then h4, h5, and I get checkmated, maybe I'll feel differently, so we'll see. <laughs> well, I think from a practical perspective here, now all of a sudden it's black with the initiative, whereas before black had no real space, the rooks were just kind of stuck. White was expanding on the king side. Now all of a sudden it's Black's turn. This pawn e4 is the target in the position. Black can consider, if um, he protects his king, he can consider actually adventuring over to the queen side, right? White has no protection on that side of the board. So if the queen goes from d7 over to a4, for example, that pawn a2 is going to fall in short order, and that black a pawn can try to start pushing forward. That said, I don't believe that there's time to do that because of what you suggested, h4, h5. And if that queen ventures over to a4, well, then black might just get checkmated in the meantime. So um, from, I think that it's kind of the tension here is difficult to suggest moves on either side. I mean, h4, h5 seems very, very natural, but you're always in danger of overextending, particularly with this pawn on g5 under direct threat. So, Danny, I don't know, I don't know who I'd even prefer to be here. I think black, just because of the long-term chances. But, I, you know, white also has plenty of, things to be happy about in the position yeah i uh i guess i tend to favor the knight and magnus uh magnus maneuvering with that pony obviously if you could just trade squares here and put the knight on e5 and maybe even drop this rook over to like a5 you'd be super thrilled as black if that knight fills the e5 square it's going to be a lot easier to play 
And I guess Magnus is kind of just going to play tickle here and, be, and ask, ask Grishik if he wants to go all in for the attack, and, and Grishik's going to do it. I, I like that approach because, again, that's the practical prowess of, of uh, Black, of Magnus here. Just You can't do much to improve Black's pieces already. They're pretty much all on their best squares, unless you could, as I said, put the knight on e5. So don't take a lot of time. Move quickly. Let Grishik run this h-pawn and try to create some sort of mating net. And then, if we reach a critical position, we'll see who has more time to figure out the tactics, right? I just feel like that's the, that's the way you have to play Blitz sometimes, is, is like you said, it's sometimes better to have an easier plan than it is to be better. Right. And this Rook on E5, while it's a very strong piece in that it's, you know, cemented on that square, it's hitting E4, it actually can become vulnerable to an eventual F2 to F4 if this mm -hmm. Rook on F4 can get out of the way. I mean, I don't really see it the means by which white but, goes but, but no that's a great idea maybe even rook f5 comes i mean as much as i said we don't want to we don't want to open up the e5 square for the knight but if you could get a push like f6 at the end of a line like that and really blow open black's king you may get a mating attack so that, I, I agree with you i like that idea for for white if he could somehow find a way to get the full uh the full pawn storm pawn storm against the king show that king the full monty there buddy get the full pawn storm going and there it is, Danny. You should be proud of yourself. Suggesting the, the move that's been played by uh, Grishuk here. And it makes perfect sense, right? Because now um, F4 is a big threat. And that, mm -hmm. that pawn storm, as you, you mentioned, I mean, that's actually very scary. The weird thing, though, is that this rook on G4 is kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. uh, F6. Oh, wow. Magnus yeah, decides he's willing to open up this rook as long as he can get his F rook. He's like, if you play, then I get to play. But well, I, I feel G like that transition's got to be good for white, right? you got to just take it if you're Grishuk. Yeah, he does. Yeah, for sure. GF, GF6. And now if um, knight takes f6, you're stuck with the pawn e5 right after rook takes e5. If you take with a rook on f6, like a rook f to g5, hoping that you capture me on the g5 square, and I can take with the pawn even. And then, then I can start pushing my f pawn down the board. So I love this, that. This transition has been perfect for Grishuk. And now Blot's in big trouble because the extra pawn is a real extra pawn rather than just kind of um, being symbolic. I mean, it's not symbolic, it's there, but um, yep. now it's much easier to use it. Yeah, and the threat of F4 is, uh, is staring staring Magnus in the face. Not really something that can be easily dealt with here. The last thing you really want to do is take on G5, but here comes F4, and Black's going to have to take on G5. Yeah, Grishuk. Again, the smart thing to do here by, by Grishuk is, is to push and push so quickly, trusting the advantage, not allowing himself to get in a time scramble, where Magnus can can swindle, we saw and e5, we, right? You yeah, e5. Push. Why not? Yeah, I, I was going to say even even a move like queen e3 and queen d4 and kind of sit on it because is Black really going to take on d3 if I can play c takes d3? I mean, nope. Diamonds are a girl's best friend, and that's a diamond right there. So, uh, but Danny e5 threatens Bishop takes h7, so you're actually kind of forcing Black to capture in d3 there as well. Oh wow, that's so. nasty. That's dirty. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that, everybody! Oh. I got to show the fans what you're talking about. That could be that could be real, real sticky. So yeah, Magnus had to take anyway. You're right, and now the e pawn is looking real strong. And if it gets to e6, it's just over. White White's right. got to win this and, now. And rook f5, e6. Okay, so queen a3 played. So the lone hope for Black is that the White's king is in such bad positioning that there's some sort of perpetual check. Yeah. But I mean, the king hide on h3, right? So e6 here, queen takes a2 or queen b2 is just a single check the king goes to, over to h3 and now you're out of checks and so that e-pawn should uh, run free Ooh, rook f but again grishik has been really uh consistent in his approach throughout the day that he doesn't want to let magnus get counterplay uh but okay but what happens if queen b2 check here and then takes e5 what am i missing so queen b2 queen f2 will be played so forcing ah, okay got it very nice yeah forcing Forcing a trade into a lost king upon him. So Magnus sees that, takes a2. And by right, the way, can... by the way, it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have been a king a lost king upon him now because by taking a2, Magnus would eventually have this outside past a pawn. So that's why that's why he was able to do that. Yeah. Now the the big issue for Black is that actually rook f4, queen f4. You can try to go queen a1 and pray for a perpetual, um, you know, by just giving the king a million checks. But it doesn't seem like it's in the cards because. The king might even be able to escape via f5 at some point. So uh, I think you have to, from Black's point of view, take on f4 and go queen a1. Okay, on queen b1 first, which I feel like that's not the right way because actually the black king on f7 is more of a target. So yeah, rook, now, rook now you can take f7 and play e6 check and you immediately get access to the c7 pawn too. I think that 
Grishik's going to play e6 check the moment. Oh, wow. What's Magnus up for? Trying to swindle his way to a draw here. Gives check first. E6 check still looks pretty... So what? Are, you can't play queen of three check, right? King upon inning doesn't win. It actually loses. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it actually probably does lose. because both, both rook pawns are queen f2 check, king e8, e6. I mean... Or in whatever order. King look at here that. Now. He's going to play King G6 here. Oh, I thought he was. I thought he was going to go all in and try to come after the White King. Whoa. Okay. I don't know if I would have taken on C7, but it's probably still winning because the Queen can always retreat to F4 and blockade. And that pawn in game, I believe, is winning because your pawns are so advanced on the board. But I would have to actually sit and calculate for a bit. But now this is unclear, right? You trade Queens, the A pawn starts running. Right. Wow. What? What, what has Grisha calculated here? King F4 to E5? No, Black, Black is, is just win winning here. Yeah. Grishik just uh -oh. blundered away the entire game with Queen F3. You know what he yeah, missed? That... He missed King E7. Right. He thought the C pawn was just rolling. Back in this position, for... everybody, he thought that Magnus would have to play A4, C6, takes, takes, A3, C7, and White wins. He missed Magnus's amazing shot, King to E7. And OMG... Robert, Magnus Carlsen strikes again. He just won another game. He has no business winning. Grishik sits back in his chair in disgust, and Magnus almost gives an apologetic head shake. Robert, are you still breathing? I, I'm in disbelief, honestly. That's just, how does that keep happening? Grishik has an amazing position. It's really, it's the clock, right? If he uh, has I don't know how, but clock, somehow I blame you. I don't know how it keeps happening, but somehow it's your fault. I blame Fizbo, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't get that joke, Fizbo, the cl never mind. Okay, <laughs> LOL, moving on. You know, it really is a clock situation. Grishuk is not as strong with less time in the clock. We've yep. said this time and time again, and it was, we've seen in bullet portions in, in previous rounds. Right. And so um, in that situation, when you know what he needed to do instead of queen takes c7, is probably go queen f2 and play a little safer, and that way his king uh, doesn't his king avoids all the checks. And it should have been winning. I mean, yeah. it really should have been quite easily winning for a player of Grishuk's caliber. But with such little time on the clock and under that duress, he just let the game go. And in this game right now, Carlson going with a weird eight, early H4, which Grishuk stopped. And now that the point is that White has um, expansion over there on the uh, the king side. So at some moment, perhaps um, you can ex further expand by going E5, then go H5 and try to um, chisel away at the Black's protected king side. That being said, it doesn't really have a huge benefit at the moment because black can strike in the center first with d5. And oftentimes, when your opponent expands on the flanks, you want to return the favor in the, in the middle of the board, in the center, because that's where most of the action takes place. So d5 here is just, I mean, and from my point of view, is just black has done extremely well out of this opening. I agree. Shout out to Pawn Morphy, who just subscribed to our Twitch channel. Thank you for that, sir. Only 27 minutes left here in the 5-2 portion. And then it only gets faster from here, folks, with 3-2 blitz right around the corner. And uh, Sasha is, is on the edge of this match, really getting away from him, knowing what we already know about the difference in, in between really two players on the planet, Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura, and everybody else at Bullet. Um, so, uh, and then uh, there we have another one, another subscriber, Mr. Archer Knight 98 So, Robert, again... How, how do you change the momentum here, right? Grishik has, has seen the writing on the wall twice. He got an edge, but took too much time trying to play the best plan and just couldn't force himself to get out of time pressure. And he's, uh, you know, he's in a position that, that is, almost, is almost already a must-win situation down by three games here. Yeah, this lead could be insurmountable already, which is a sad uh, thing to face for Grishuk. And he's just is spending too much time, even in the current position, right? He's... Now, okay, now Mags is spending some of his time, but Grishuk was down at least, you know, 50 seconds on the clock before Magnus just took his thing. And so he has a, he had a position that was so normal. He's seen many, many times. And again, Grishuk does this in classical chess as well. He, he's a kind of a glutton for, for time trouble. He just really enjoys it. I don't know why. I don't know how. Well, you know what's happened. funny? Sometimes the most addicted to time pressure people are some of the best blitz players. We've talked about Sasha being a, you know, he's obviously a former World Blitz champion. He's beaten Magnus Carlsen uh, in, in blitz many times. And so I think sometimes players who, who are a bit of perfectionist and calculate at the level Grishik does get themselves under time pressure more. So they've gotten better at playing under time pressure. But no matter what, you don't want to put yourself in that position, especially against Magnus Carlsen. 
Uh, by the way, this King's Indian attack really similar to the uh, the to, to G uh, Agashima favorite. Excuse me for studying there. Uh, Ronian won with it in uh, the Grand Prix going on at the defeated Grand Prix in round four. So this H4 King's Indian attack and uh, it's it's sort of an old school opening. We don't see it as often these days. Uh, but we have been seeing it more and more recently. So maybe a, maybe a King's Indian attack renaissance happening, Robert. Yeah, and um, you know, unfortunately for Grishuk, this D5 pawn is falling. You know, next move. So you know, the renaissance. I don't know how great that renaissance is for the Russian here. It's working uh, right now, not for the <laughs> Russian, for the for the King's Indian attack players. The renaissance is that, working. This is true, but okay. I mean, it's actually not clear at all here because Bishop D5 takes. Uh, you put your rook on d8, and now b2 is hanging. Um, this is obviously the problem with the bishop on d5. So are we going to see lots of trades in the game peter out? Or, you know, queen takes b2, for example, and now the a1 rook is uh, under threat. The pawn on c2 is under attack. You know, I, I guess in general, you know, in general terms, that black is the one that has to be very careful because you don't want to go uh, pawn grabbing and lose this pawn f7. It's a very important pawn, especially with opposite colored bishops, right? King safety is paramount. So, um, you know, queen takes c2 runs right into bishop takes f7 check, and that's something yep. you have to keep in mind because the rook on d8 is unprotected. So uh, I think you can get away with it, but I would be very reluctant um, to to allow it to happen. So Well, he, he's – and there we, I was just wondering if he would allow and get away with it, but we're going to see the line you were talking about, f7 falls, and now maybe the light H5. squares. Okay, yeah. he didn't play h5. I was thinking h5, but – Queen c6 has the intention of – getting the bishop somewhere back on this diagonal. Even if black plays c3, you might see bishop b3 by white, and you're hoping to kind of flip the battery around and get the queen in front of the bishop with eyes toward the black king's light squares. Um, and again, it, despite it being close to equal, as you've said, Robert, with the Alps code bishops, you look at time pressure, and you, and you realize white is the only one who can win if either side really could win because of the potential weaknesses on the light squares. And you just get that practical feeling that Magnus Carlsen is up to his old tricks. Well, now white is probably going to win because it's, yes, it's opposite colored bishops. White's going up a pawn by capturing on c4. Yep. And white is just better, especially because black is a weak king, losing that golden pawn in f7. Instead of rook f8, which was a passive move that I, you know, I understand the intention, but bishop to d4 there seemed just to be perfectly logical, hitting the pawn in f2, removing all of these back rank threats. And now, I mean, from, from black's point of view, that if you even if you go bishop c5, I mean, you, yes, you're attacking the pawn on f2, but I guess maybe I'm... How does white get out of that? Your bishop c5. Queen it lo c3 it looks pretty check. straightforward. Queen you're right. Check. Queen c3 check is just game over. After bishop ah, c5. Duh, bishop c5, queen c3 check is... Uh, huh, that's, a, uh, that's a blunder. That's nobody's fun. Um, I, maybe Grishuk overlooked that, honestly. Maybe he thought that bishop c5 here just uh, held, held the game for him, but after, obviously, it, it doesn't work. And thus, black is now down upon fighting an uphill battle. Right. And again, in, in theory, probably this is still very good drawing chances for black. But you just never want to underestimate, as long as the queens are still on the board and you have an opposite colored bishop theme on the, on, in, in the game, everybody, that your king is always going to be under fire. And, and now Magnus is only going to work to continue to pry open more and more light squares where this bishop is essentially a bystander. To the uh, to the murder of his own king, you know, and and that's the risk of playing these obscure bishop positions where your king is the one more exposed. Um, and this is the largest time advantage for Magnus in the match. I mean, this is a three minute edge in the clock. Yep. So not only is shook down a pawn and his king is not safe, he's down three minutes. This is uh, this is not going well for Sasha. Kind of a bad day at the office here. Bad day at the office so far. But the the thing is, we know these guys are mentally tough. Um, and, and, and Grishik has, he's, well, frankly, he's been winning two of the losses that he had, right? Just purely blew it under time pressure. I think sometimes the, the problem is you get in the habit of getting under time pressure and it's hard to pull, pull it out. You, you see yourself making the mistake and you just can't stop yourself from doing it. But it, uh, if he, if he held a draw here and finds a way to get a win or two in these blitz portion, I think his confidence will rebound, um, Although, okay, all of that is easier said than done because as I look at this and, and Grishik has 40 seconds left, I just feel like we're getting closer and closer to another win by Carlson. Uh, yeah, it's he's, just so... going to play probably so F4 now, yep. And now he's going to... Deal with this because white is, you know, the king is actually quite safe even though, you know, if there are more pieces on the board, it would look quite open. And queen b2 is just one check. That's, right. that's the biggest 
to choose. And for H six G six, right? You you take back with the pawn on G six. But then there's well, then even takes G6 yeah, there's now, even right? bishop takes G six followed by queen E five check. So it looks like Magnus overlooked that tactic. But okay, the bishop on C two um, also will be a good place for for the the battery, right? Just yeah, yeah, just relocate. Battery. Old school chess, queen and bishop battery. Um. And you're right. I think Mag I honestly think Magnus did miss that idea, but it may not matter from a practical perspective because Grishik remains under serious time pressure and the only one with real threats to worry about. King h6 is probably going to be played, and then h takes g6, I think, by Magnus, followed by queen d7, and he's got a couple new diagonals to have fun with. h3, d7. He's, just, he's almost just trying to put his pieces on squares that increase the chance for a blunder, right, from your opponent. Sometimes in blitz, that's what you do. Um... I mean, Dan, you're right. Especially here, with 23 seconds on the clock for Grishuk, yep. and two, you know, two over two minutes and 40 seconds for Carlson. That is what you have to do to win a game like this, because you know, perhaps the engines will find a way to defend, but you know, with no time on the clock, there's no way to um, defend forever. So if, as long as the, the, the squeeze is on, you know, G4 might come at some point as well. Um, you know, Queen to E8 will be annoying. Yep. A lot of different options for Carlson. He's, I think he's using his time now so that he can play quicker later, and that way he can just really apply the pressure on the clock. Well, even though I uh, forgot to bring the jingle with me, talk a little bit as a teaching moment for the fans here, Robert, about the, the psychology of, of a strong player knowing they don't always have to find the forced win. They just have to keep their opponent in a bad position, and eventually the win, almost like letting the game come to you, right, to use a, an overly used sports cliché. Talk about what Magnus is doing here. Just that, that part of sometimes you just have to sit on the position. Less important that you found a concrete win. More important that you keep your opponent down and kind of feeling miserable about their position. Assuming Magnus goes on to win here and makes your teaching point uh, a really a really good one. Well, as Grishuk spends 10 seconds on this current move, and he might just flag because after A4, he now has a new threat to worry about in A5. Um, the, the biggest issue is that um, if you have a position... Um, that is better for you. You want a position where you have like five different good moves and your opponent is on the back foot at every turn. Right. So instead of having a forcing position where like you, know, you have to find a, a, every single best move, you can just shuffle around, slowly improve your position. I mean, look at this pawn A5. And the, the, now it's on A6, which I actually didn't like. I would have yeah. kept it on A5. I, I, I was just about to applaud him from getting this pawn to A5 because it prevented the scenario of the bishop and pawn being safely protected. But, but okay, Magus is still in the driver's seat. He still is, but I actually think his chances have uh, really decreased on that bishop's home on b6. His best shot is when that bishop is on an unguarded square because the Agreed. bishop takes six sacrifices. Um, now I'm just not really seeing the way to... Uh, there's no knockout blow that I, I see here, so... Yeah, I was just about to applaud him again for doing more of what we were talking about. The pawns on a5, taking away the natural defensive technique. And you just get the situation where black can't hold because of all these different threats. And that's very likely how you can win games like this, even without a concrete plan. But now Magnus has made it easier for Grishuk as everybody is defended. Queen, bishop, pawn. So, okay, right as we were applauding him on that right psychological approach of being patient, letting the game come to you, he... Maybe overpushed it on the A file, but uh, something tells me Grishik is not fully out of the woods here, though. Just, just the uh, the potential swindles on the light squares are abound. Right, and I, if I'm white at the right moment, I play G4 because Grishik has seven seconds left, and contending with a move like G4 will be a massive headache mm -hmm. uh, because that you know it unleashes a whole new set of threats, including G5. And so you know here a move like you know, here goes Queen C. I was going to say. Um, just trying to get this move G4 in so that it is going to be a big threat. So right now... Yeah, if G4, G4 queen takes F4, by the way, queen H8 and queen H4 would have been mate. So I wonder if Magnus should have already played G4, but we'll we'll see what he goes for. Uh-oh, here, here it's coming. Here it comes, you're, yep. You're wow. moving Black's counterplay, so G4. Grishik barely doesn't lose on time there. Living off the increment, if you saw that, everybody went from 0 0.6 seconds to 2.6, and he still survives oh. at 2.5. He's lost, though. Yep. But with there it, he's losing off. the position. Exactly. Wow, King, this is King amazing. G4 and Bishop F5 are both really easily lights out here. Bishop, Bishop F5 was well. a really nice move, too. Yeah, and Queen D7 was also winning. So, I mean, this, well, is, this is textbook. 
Danny, it's just textbook. Textbook. So even and despite our criticism of of him driving the punt all the way to a six, it also kind of worked out for Magnus in the end. You know, visualizing this setup with the queen on c8 there, the bishop on c2, the pawn on a6. Again, it's it's just like a comfort zone you're playing, right? Your pieces just feel good there. There's not even a concrete threat for white, but very hard for black to find useful moves, especially under time pressure when there's constant tactics. And sometimes I think beginners or less experienced players out there, I've even had that in lessons. I'm sure you have too, where students go, okay, well, I was better here, but what was my plan supposed to be? And I'm like, dude, you need to have the opposite mindset. You don't need to have a plan. Just sit there and, and you're winning and kind of, you know, let your opponent suffer a little bit and the blunders will come to you. Right, and I think there's an over-reliance on engines, right? Saying, oh, I'm, I know I'm better here because right. in a complicated position where I only have one path forward to maintain my advantage, the engine tells me I'm plus 0.5. Right. Whereas there are many positions where you're plus 0.3, and in fact, stemming from this very opening that we're seeing, where white gets a slightly better position, can just play forever, and just try to uh, nurse that advantage into a full point. So I'm much more likely to play a position like this where I'm uh, seizing the long-term edge, you know, a nagging advantage that I can turn to a full point. And for right. example, here, you know, you can choose between making d4 and forcing the complications, or keeping the status quo with the pawn structure and playing knight d2, as was just we just see knight f1, knight to either e3 or g3. Um, a lot of players are tempted to force the action. I like restrict strategy in this game to kind of keep um, the status quo for the time being before pushing forward at the right moment. So you're right. No, the engine, the engine generation, much like millennials, right? You know, instant gratification. I mean, sometimes instant gratification is very nice, but other times, you know, you gotta you gotta work. You gotta, you gotta work, work it. You gotta work it a little bit. Yeah. So well, let's prevent the conversation from going any further. Um, the, but I think here's a critical moment as well because okay. Black can consider the move d5 instead of bishop a7, mm -hmm. uh, but that creates a whole new set of weaknesses on that diagonal with the pawn e5 becoming directly under threat. Right? It's kind of a typical sort of martial type sacrifice by going d5 but you have to time it correctly and oftentimes it's easier to defend um, a somewhat passive position than an open position where you have to watch out for tactics at every turn then you know after a knight takes e5 there's gonna be a knight takes f7 sacrifices with this bishop on a2 so um i like white's position uh, for sure and i think that um actually i think white is significantly better at this point just because it's hard to continue suggesting moves for black yeah, it's tough, although I think Magnus is also showing patience there and kind of along the theme of what we're talking about, the patience of uh, the patient approach really being something that can pay off and not always needing immediate gratification or thinking that the engine tells you something you have to go for. But, but yeah, I mean, I agree. Grishik is, is, is definitely in the driver's seat here. But, you know, we've seen players, this is, a, again, a theoretically relevant type of position. We've seen players play these positions for both sides. Uh, a lot of this, not exact this exact position, but Spanish is similar to this variation played between Magnus Carlsen and Sergei Karyakin at the World Championship. So, you know, uh, yes, White's better here, but um, Wait, we'll, we'll but see if he can convert. Instead of a5, I was wondering if queen b3 was possible, right? You're attacking f7, attacking b4. It looks like a maybe standard I just, double. Oh, if I just defend, you maybe just go win a pawn? I was trying to. And if you have queen e7, I could have considered either knight f5 with the tempo or knight d5. Um, I... Maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm not convinced in my own suggestion, but I, it just, you always got to consider that, right? The double right. attack, you know, hitting the pawn f7, forming a battery, but... Here, here I was going to say, speaking of batteries, I'd love to play queen a4 with tempo, followed by queen a2, hitting the f7 pawn with a battery. Uh, this time the bishop leading the way, but that looks really irritating for black now, right? I'm, I'm liking Grishik once again, but we've liked Grishik for three games in a row, and he's got an, oh, he's got a donut hole to show for it. Um, <laughs> so we'll, we'll see if he can get a win here. The only reason I wouldn't like a move like queen a2, even though I think it will be good no matter what, is it then allows bishop e6. Bishop e6 is not possible because the a6 pawn has uh, been on pre, but if you go queen a2, then there's a pin on that diagonal. However, I mean, you can always follow up bishop e6 with knight d5 from white. And yep. so that, you know, you're kind of steamrolling black in that position. A queen a2 will be a nice threat after bishop d6. I think you have to go bishop d7. And, and you know e something's happening here. You can, you know, a, a ch a something wicked this way blows because uh, Magnus Carlsen is down a minute and a half, right? This is a rare, this is a rare change of events here with, with Magnus uh, being down on time. But we'll, we'll see if Grisha can keep that pressure um, and, and keep moving quickly. Well, uh, rook b1, Danny, right? Isn't that yeah. simple play? The bishop is stuck on c8 protecting Dude, a6. I love it. I mean, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. I love rook b1. I also like queen a2, but I think rook b1 is the more direct approach. It is the only open file. 
Go grab that beautiful butterfly. Go get it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Rook B1, I don't even see how Black keeps contending for that file because, well, if you trade, then, of course, I grab the file. Okay, he okay, I mean, he's still got Rook B1. Even, okay, and Magnus just concedes it and tucks his tail oh. between his legs, moves to A8. But, again, okay. this is actually another instructive position because white is clearly better as a nice spatial advantage as pieces on better squares but there's no clear target right the pawn a6 is well defended the pawn f7 is hard to get to so it's one of those positions where um you know if you're let's say an 1800 player you'll say i know i was better i just felt it but how do i uh, the way to become better is to get taking these advantages and turn them into wins so if i'm right. white here i consider a couple of things one how do i get d4 in safely Right now, the e4 pawn might be uh, fall if I go d4 too soon, so I need to maybe protect that pawn e4. Can I go h3 and just try to expand on the king side? Do I go rook b2 and double on the b file? Right? All these different options are at play, and black's main source of counterplay will eventually be go c6 and d5, right? trying to uh, push forward in the center. But if black ever goes c6, now the b6 square is white for the taking, and that b6 square is very important because it helps attack the a6 pawn, puts pressure on that, the newly uh, placed pawn c6. So if I'm white here, I make a slow move, maybe rook to b2, mm -hmm. and ask black, you know what, I don't see how I'm going to make progress as white, but black, what are you going to do to keep uh, your dis your disadvantage as small as possible? So I think it's a important moment here, and knight h4 was played. Okay, I mean, he's just not doing anything uh, too drastic. It keeps the knight on e7 stuck, because then knight g6 is a big threat with the pawn of 7 pin. And now white can go g3, rook f1, f4 as well. So opening up a new idea in the position. Yeah, I, the, uh, I, I agree with everything you said. And I, I think I would also lean toward being patient with moves like rook b2, not going for d4 too fast. Grishik bringing the knight to f5, which is, of course, another typical plan in this structure in this Spanish game. Um, but, um, but if the pieces are traded and white has nothing to show for what has been an edge, then black will get d5, as you're saying, and, and liberation, liberty will come, right? Freedom will come to the black pieces if white doesn't find something. I like g3. Oh, I did like g3, but now d5 well, comes in. If he can get away with that, then then what the heck? It's actually why I didn't like knight h4, because the knight f3 made d5 much more difficult with the pawn e5 under attack. Now, all of a sudden, blast on queen d6. The bishop on b3 is misplaced because the rook would love to go to b6. Um, so all of a sudden, it looks like black is getting out of this. Wait, wasn't knight e4 a move there instead of e4? I would have loved to put my knight in the center and hit c3. Because um, knight, e yeah, yeah, I think knight e4 was a decent option there. But now it's getting complicated with this transformation of pawn structure. The pawn d5 is backward. The pawn c3 is backward. Now the pawn a5, the queen removes itself from a2, can be... Uh, gobbled up so yeah i think you gotta go knight yep 95 was played black does not really want to capture um, but now the, now the d5 pawn is going to fall so despite what i also e4 felt like white was slipping I, it seems like both e4 and d5 falls and the only other pawn that falls clearly right away is e5 so maybe grisha can come out of this with an edge still even still uh, uh, although time has changed again robert grisha being down on time makes you wonder about whether he'll be able to handle the critical moments uh, against Carlson when the swindles start to come out. So. Right, but the problem for black is that you don't have bishop f5 because knight e7 check uh, saves the day. So after mm -hmm. the move king g2, for example, then black has to retreat with knight g5, and then white can just go rook e3 and try to consolidate, and it's a clear no, extra No, point. I agree. That's what, I, that's what I'm thinking is, uh, is white, white's getting two and, and black only got one. Okay, I mean, on a practical level, you look at the king on g2, you see the open, long, light square diagonal, you wonder about tactics uh, for Carlson. A move like rook b8 comes to mind now, ideas of taking on b3 so that we can win the knight on d5. Um, I hate this last move, rook h4. Yeah, I, I didn't like it. I, I feel like every other square was better. Go to d4, go to e3, go to b4, for crying out loud, right? b4 stops this threat of rook b8 that I'm talking about. Why did he That's put the rook on h4? What is he going to do? What is he doing with the rook on h4? Move, Danny. He's trying to prevent bishop h3 check, which uh, was a one check, no check may come. If you just go rook e3 instead, you prevent all this, you know, any sort of attack on the king's side. So rook h4 stops that one threat, but now it's such a weird piece. It, it's passive. All it yeah. does is stop that check. And now black is going to try to go rook c5, hit the pawn a5, hit the knight on d5. And so white should go c4 here and try to regroup the pieces. But again, this rook on h4 is a weirdly placed piece. 
Yeah, I, mean, I agree. Just, and, you know, I, I have to say, as much as this sounds like a, a general abstract evaluation of the tempo of the match so far, but do you feel like in several critical moments as well, Grishik has been overly defensive and, and missing opportunities because of his sort of almost trusting Magnus as having more tactics or more pressure than there really is? I feel like we've had several moments where Grishik has played a move like Rook H4 where we're like, oh, that was unnecessarily defensive. What are, what are your thoughts? I completely agree. I think he has played scared chess thus far. He's had plenty of good positions, and in critical moments, he sees a threat, and instead of just you know continuing executing his plans, he reacts solely to Magnus' threat. And you cannot play chess like that. Yeah. It just feels, you know, yes, Grishik had plenty of good positions, but he also, like you said, has been getting these good positions and just reacting poorly at a very critical moment. A rook h4 yeah. was odd. I still think White's doing okay here, not great, especially now that rook g1 check is a deadly threat. So you, you might have to go. Everybody, a move like C4 would be meant by Rook G1 check. And uh, Robert's idea is that we have a fork town right after that. And look at that. Queen E3 is played, and that already is not as good uh, as other options, mainly because this diagonal we kind of prophesized, foreshadowed, is becoming a real issue. What if Magnus just plays Queen A8 here, and now the threat on, on the Knight on D5 is coming with Rook to D8, and tons of pieces are joining uh, in the uh, in the pin on that pony, I, I'm actually just getting more and more worried about how Grishik handles this position as White with 22 seconds, with a king on g2, a rook on g1, tactics on the light squares. Um, we're not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy. We'll say that. By the way, I have to point out there could have been a really fun tactic, Robert. Let's have some fun. Oh wait, is knight f6 wait, what? check? What? Yeah, wait. What was that? Knight Magnus, f6 just, check is Magnus just blundered his queen. Oh wow! He looks. He just rolled his eyes and shakes his head with the apple. <laughs> Sorry, th we were just talking about how Grishik had blown the position, and Magnus gives a gift. Uh, Johnny Appleseed makes a blunder, and uh, I think Grishik will finally get a win here, though he only has three seconds, two seconds. What in the world, what? right? Yeah, that was bizarre. I man four. There's threats of bishop to f3 check, check followed by rook e8. Even rook e8 immediately is almost winning. What is going on here? You know, in basketball, let's say ball don't lie. I guess here... Uh, Score don't lie. Go. Ball don't lie. Wait, but now... Now is it going to be... A, no, black is better, right? Black's up a pawn. Black's so. just up a pawn, and the c pawn is... Uh, those doubled f pawns are useful, and the c pawn is very weak compared to black's a pawn. Black's a pawn is nice. Play a5 here. Yep, a5, a6, or, or, a4. I mean, you could also play king g7 just to make sure the bishop doesn't get pinned. Um, uh, I feel like this has been one of the more exciting games, but it happened because of back-to-back -back egregious blunders by both players. <laughs> <laughs> Magnus yeah, blunders a queen. That was just bizarre. Although in Grishik's defense, I mean, he was he had that look. He was looking for opportunities back there. If anyone wants to go clip that moment on Twitch, we'd appreciate that. Please clip some moments. Help us spread the chess love. Make a clip there of that crazy transition. Magnus blunders a queen, and Grishik unable to solve the problems and is, is, is back at lost position just like that. Just amazing. And Grishik has made several moves, like 0 .01, 0 .04 on no, the No, I know. I'm, I keep waiting for him to lose on time. And, and so, the very least, he hasn't lost on time yet, I don't think, in any game, despite living off the increment in several. And perhaps be able to survive this with so few pawns remaining on the board... Uh, the game is not quite over yet. Well, now rook e1 game is probably over. Yeah, there's so. a threat, everybody, of rook takes e2, followed by bishop c4, skewer town. Uh, okay, king d4 saves the day temporarily, kind of. It should, it should be seven. But yep. he's, he's still, he still gets yeah, the bishop that, back, at least. But he okay. gave the bishop on the right square. That way, uh, white wasn't taking the a5 pawn immediately. In fact, now black is up two pawns and should be uh, sh should be winning. Should be winning, yeah. Probably even just king g6, sacrifice the rook for the c pawn, and go win with two passers over there. Yeah, g3 would be a, a bad move here because rook b3 would screw up that pawn. Actually, it's, maybe it's a draw. I don't see how. Uh. Now rook b4. Yeah. Oh, I think Grishik should have played rook b4. Rook b4 he still has a chance. Why not rook b4? Oh, and he wants rook c5 to cut off the rook and get a queen. But king f6? Yeah, rook c5 would take, take, g2, and queen, queen. Black gets queen. a queen with check. Yeah, it may still that, be a draw, but he, Grishik has to make that decision very quickly. No, this is no, this this can't be good. Well, he's going to get king b4. That's the thing. So I'm thinking he may win the a pawn. Yeah, he's getting king b4. 
Yeah, but actually this is good for Black because the king's in a very bad spot in a3 because it's very uh, susceptible to checks. And the king on g7 is very safe. So what Black needs to do to win this is just slowly maneuver the king and pawn up the board. And, you know, you can... Okay, don't go f5 here because queen g5 check. So f6 is the better starting point. And, um, yeah, this is this is very bad. So king, I'm trying to think. King e6 now. White can never trade queens. Yeah, and, okay. and with only 30 seconds left in the five-minute portion, everybody, this will be the last five-minute game, last classical five-minute game. Right after this, of course, we will have some chess 960, but only 25 seconds left in the uh, the overall game timer here. I think, you know, for sure this is at this point the last game they'll be playing in five minutes. So Grishuk offered a draw, which... Whoa, though, it, it looks like there's a mate coming on B3, which means black can force a queen yep. trade. It's over, right? Because queen check, queen e7 check is the block response. And if you king takes a4, queen a2 check, followed by queen b1 check, picking up the queen. So, oi. Oi, oi, oi. Another incredible performance going down today by Magnus Carlson. I mean, I mean, honestly, Robert, you and I talked about the fact that I mean, okay, just from a pure match for matchup perspective, knowing what we know about Grishuk, we thought this would be a much closer match as compared to Magnus Carlsen's performance against Wesley So. But right now, Carlson is just, I mean, can, can, can the man be stopped? I mean, this, this is maybe go down as one of the best months ever, right? I mean, his, his performances in these Rapid and Blitz events this month have just been out of this world. Yeah, he's proving why he's the best player on the planet. But nobody, I mean, I bet you even he didn't expect that he would dominate such strong players as convincingly as he has. And uh, I believe, this is, okay, this is the eighth game in a five-minute time control. That has to be one of the shortest, if not the shortest uh, match in Speedjust Championship history. Which is the opposite of what we had between Carlson and So on um, on Saturday, right? We had a, I think we ended up having a 13-game five-minute portion. So, uh Tale of, tale of two time management uh, sessions, but it doesn't matter. It seems to be the same results for Carlson either way uh, with, with a huge lead right now. Right, and if we get into the position that we have on the board, we start off, you know, as 960, so it's, it's quite random. But for now, it looks kind of like what has an English structure, right? Knight yeah, yeah. on d5, knight on c4, uh, bishop on this long diagonal. Well, both bishops on the long diagonal right now. And actually, what... I don't like about black setups. The bishop on d8 will find it difficult to get over to f6 or g7, especially with this knight on d5. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, look at the bishop on a1 staring down the queen on h8. Not exactly uh, a good strategy for the queen. Yeah, not so, exactly a happy neighbor. Like the kind of neighbor that stares you down and you know they're about to smile, and the other neighbor that stares you down is judging you the whole time. That's what's going on here. <laughs> well, now after bishop f6, you can even you consider just, just take snatching it. That, that piece up. Bishop so, here. Bishop pair. Bishop. Oh, no. Well, that, this is actually I guess interesting. He's going to play knight g3 and then Rekarovka, drop the king on g1, and he's going to fix the only remaining dysfunctional aspect of white's setup, which is that the king and rook are kind of awkward, maybe. Yeah, time to get castled and leave the d3 square behind, because here comes black. Yeah, though, castling, you know, you do have to be worried about an eventual h5 move, right? Just trying to blast open that side of the board. Um, so... Hmm. Yeah, I'll, this... I'll take my chances with if I castle, they play h5. I'll play g5, right? Huh. Feels like I can get the f6 Did square. And... Four? Whoa, whoa. King e2. Wait. Magnus using the chess 960 setup says I'm not even gonna. I'm not even gonna castle. So I wanted to go e4, but you can just capture on e4, so it doesn't actually do anything. Yep. But you always have to keep an eye on that move with the with all the tension on that long diagonal. So. How do you improve your position as black here? I guess you, you know, King two might just be the best move. I mean, it yeah, covers I mean, that. it honestly looks fantastic. That's the truth. And, and now black, excuse me, white can still go in B four and then B five and take, you know, just expanding on the. the I, I really side. still like the threat of G five coming, and even if I'm not, I mean, one idea of G five and then B four, Robert, is that that frees up the E four square so that white's other knight can get involved in the F six party. But even if I don't right. get that idea, I mean, g5 and I put the knight on f6, I can win the dark square bishop. It just it feels like white has very good long-term attacking chances here. Right, and the reason, reason I was hesitant to play g5 initially from, from white's point of view, so I was thinking, oh, h6, and you might be 
forced to trade queens, but the queen trade actually helps white because right. g5, h4, and white is clearly first to that h file. So um, black needs to consider what to do about this king. You can't castle queenside. I mean, you, sorry, you are able to castle queenside, but it is a bad move because then b4, b5, knight e7 check will be uh, quite painful. So, um, yeah, not looking pretty for black. Um, and as we see, yeah, that almost sounds like back. you're about to bust out rap along with Carlson and Eminem right after this. Well, we were talking about rap before the before we went out live, so you know, yeah. you got some stuck in my head. No, but look how long King A2 made Grishuk think before. Okay, what about B4, B5 now? Doesn't bring the bring the pain on the B spot. It <laughs> looks pretty natural to me. I think if they're B4, you're forced to sacrifice pawn E4 because otherwise it's B4, 96, B5. I love it. I love it. It's resignable. Also, there's 97. Oh, yeah, I think that's why E4 was played because there was 97 check coming perhaps. and. Uh... Yeah, B5 first, right? Just kick that knight out, get get that check in. Just yeah. disastrous. But now just knight takes E4. It's a free pawn. Yep. Yeah, if the, uh, if the, knight, had, if the knight had moved everybody before... Uh, e4, there's there's threats of b5 and the 97 check, picking up the bishop over here on a8. Uh, so that was kind of Robert's point of the b pawn push. And wow, Magnus is giving the light square bishop with check no less. But I guess if black takes it, white takes back. And after the trade, Magnus will take on c5 at the end and then maybe pop a pony into f6, a nice little outpost square. Yeah, and then you can also just consider going rook b1, rook b3, rook other other rook to b1 and try and deliver. That, that's a, a nice bit. move there by, by Grishuk, though. Rook e8, I think you have to just leave the tension. Don't even bother taking the c-pawn. And Magnus is going to try to simplify the position. So takes, takes. We guess rook, yep, rook e6. Knight d4 checked, f3 is coming. Yeah, Perhaps I'm uh, liking Grishuk's pieces coming to life here. Magnus should gobble yeah. h7 probably, though. Just go go get, get a pawn, maybe. I think Magnus try to oversimplify. He's like, well, I'm, I'm, my position is so strong, and it is, right? It's, like, if you look at it, optically speaking, White's position is amazing. Right. However, there's clear tactics at play with knight d4 check, opening that bishop on a8, knight f3 comes, hitting the rook on g1, and both pawns on d2 and h2. So actually, Grishuk is uh, he's kind of changing the dynamics of his position in his favor. Because take on actually, Danny, take on h7 we might lose the knight. Knight d4 check, knight f3, and then rook over to h8. Your knight in h7 is trapped. Ooh, I didn't see that. The knight comes to f3 with tempo, everybody, hitting the rook, and now taking away the g5 square makes this move rook h8 a devastating threat. I like that line, partner. Yeah, I, I agree. This is getting this is getting uh, tasty here. Be be funny if Grishuk wins one position where he was completely worse as black in chess 960 rather than the three games where he was clearly better in, in the regular classical portion. But you got to take him where you can get him at this point if you're Sasha Grishuk. Got to get a win. Although the pawn structure might get really weird because knight d4 check. Okay, it didn't go knight d4. I thought he was going to go knight d4. E takes d4. Well, why should you just play f3 here? f3, d3. Do something to defend the knight so that your h7, sorry, so your f6 knight is free again. Yeah, I, I like d3. Maybe even f3 was fine, but. Yeah, take on c5 was very questionable. It should have gone knight d4 check. And again, I, I say this every time I do commentary. It's one of those positions where quality of pieces is more important than the quantity of pawns because. Right. Might have been down a pawn temporarily, but all of White's pawns are in weird squares, and your rook was about to get active on the e4 square if all those trades occurred. So now, I mean, okay, Black's still hanging in there because rook a6 will be annoying at the right moment, um, and not to mention that you can consider capturing on e4. Um, but let's see. Yeah, I agree. But again, I mean, I would classify not taking the opportunity to play 16, knight d4, because knight d4, king d3, knight f3 with tempo, then there would have been threats of knight e5 check, again, followed by just the threats against these two knights who are trying to guard each other. And, and it, again, puts us in a position to feel like, with aggressive opportunities on the board, Grishik is being much more defensive-minded than he is uh, being aggressive. And Magnus is taking advantage of that. I mean, on a practical level, Magnus is pushing... And, and creating weird dynamic tactics, even if they're not 100% sound for him. Yeah, the, speaking of not 100% sound... Yeah, this move knight There's no way Grishik isn't just better after rook takes d7. He's going to get two pieces for the rook. Yeah, rook d7, knight c5, rook b6. I wonder if he missed after knight takes d7, there's rook b2 check first. Because if you don't get that check in first, then, okay, white will go rook b1 and try to trade rooks. And, I mean, white will have a rook and two pawns for two minor pieces. But with the threat of rook b2 check... 
forcing the king onto the back rank, then it, the two pieces are just going to bring home the full point. So, And so here's a moment again where Grishik is taking 40 seconds what? to play the less than ideal approach here. I feel like there's almost a, a giving Magnus too much credit. This is what happens, I guess, when you when you win blitz matches by 20 games, you kind of intimidate your peers maybe. It just doesn't feel like Grishik is calculating all these lines as accurately as we as we know he normally does. But, but Danny, I just don't understand it at all. Because I don't understand it all. Now, now White gets Rook B1, and, and right, White's so going to grab the only open file and have very good chances here with the Rook and a bunch of pawns. Well, well my essential question is, in what universe is the Rook on D8 better than the Rook on D6, right? Even if you didn't or, see Rook B6 initially, mm -hmm. that Rook is swing to A6. This Rook on D8 is doing nothing. Well, I mean, his idea had to be to just get an active king, right? We know you want a more active king in endgames, but I agree with you that... Um, you know, the more these pawns get the center, there's no way this king can compete with those pawns and those squares anyway. And, and White's just, I mean, there's threats here of rook g5. There's threats here of rook b1. There's threats here of c5 check. And then king e3 and just push another pawn and get a massive, massive center storm going. So, I mean, all in all now, between rook g7, rook g5, c5 check, king e3, yeah, and then play d4 and d5 or something. I mean, White just feels in total control here. Yeah, no, this is uh, this is not going well for Grishuk at all. And I just want to give a shout out to uh, what a noobs in the Twitch chat. Hess judging Grishuk's moves, he would get wrecked thirty zero by Grishuk. <laughs> you know, I gotta respect people who call me out for uh, calling others out. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know what players expect, but isn't it isn't it uh, your job, our job to do commentary? But of course, I mean. A blunder is a blunder regardless of who plays it, everybody. That's a fact. Um, anyway, yeah, no, it, it seems that seems that Carlson is uh, is really going to show us how two rooks would outplay, how a rook would outplay minors. This is the kind of position, everybody, to offer some instructional takeaways. You have open files on both sides of the board. Okay, so that's, a, that's like a warning sign you can add to that little database of knowledge. When will rooks be better than minors? You have, you have numerous open files. You have numerous pawn weaknesses. H5, E6, C7, A7. And finally, you have the potential to create your own past pawns. The, the types of positions where rooks will do well is, is obviously, it's, it's, it's self-explanatory. Files where they can swing from one side of the board to the other. When there's ta pawns to target. The minor pieces would rather have all the pawns in one little grouping, a pawn island, if you will, so they can maneuver and work together. This situation is just one where the rooks are kind of made to outplay the miners. And Robert, what, what do you say? Is that a fair? Uh, is that a fair description? Although now it looks like Magnus just blundered. No, Magnus didn't blunder. He purposely was giving up. Well, I didn't like the move. I don't know if I love uh, what just happened there, but I was gonna say I don't think he blundered. He intentionally went for a line where he would give up the rook for the knight because he felt that he couldn't make easy progress and said, okay, my pawns are going to push forward and win the game. But now I think black is better because yeah. pawns aren't that quick. And in fact, if J Just black as I'm highlighting down, how the rooks could be better than the miners, Magnus makes a sacrifice of the piece. And so, uh, uh, well, he may, he may live to regret that. I think the rooks were doing very well there. Yeah, now, in fact, it's only one pawn for the piece. And, you know, they're very past pawns. But you can't actually go f7 with this a5 pawn. Uh, well, maybe you can because you've rushed the e pawn and queen would check. f7 okay. takes, takes everything. a3, e6, a2, e7, no, no. check. But f7 is bishop d7 checkmate now. So oh, that's... sweet. Oh, he mates him in the middle of the board and Grishuk wins a game. <laughs> <laughs> and, Magnus, and Magnus jumps back <laughs> and makes a funny face. Uh, you gotta love Magnus for bringing the entertainment there, Robert. And uh, he completely, he completely overlooked it. He completely overlooked it, and there's absolutely no denying it on his face. That was pretty funny. As he gets up and takes a break, so will we, and do a quick summary of what we've seen so far. Even with that game, Magnus takes a six-two lead into the three-two portion. Robert Hess, you're in the corner, soaking Sasha Grishik out of this hole. What do you say? Well, you just got to stick to your guns. He's had many good positions thus far, but he needs to play more quickly, especially as the time control gets shorter, three minutes to start the game with the increment. Um, you know, he just has to trust himself more and stop giving too much respect to Magnus Carlsen. Well, we, uh, we've seen 
uh, almost everything here. We've seen a one-move mate, right? Carlson just self-mated, and please clip that moment. Again, if you're a fan in the chat, Twitch TV slash chess, somebody create a funny caption to go with the clip, and we'll share it uh, via our chess.com Twitter account. Let us. That, that was pretty hilarious, especially given Magnus's reaction. Uh, but Robert, speaking of reactions, what's your reaction that you can now sign up for Gary Kasparov's course at Masterclass? They are our sponsor. We love the support for the Speed Chess Championship. Uh, have you seen the new trailers and some of the little teasers they're putting out about Kasparov's endgame? And ha did you know that rook ending trap that he teaches? Are you talking about the rook endgame where you rook before? Yeah, yeah. Did you out? know that one? Uh, no, I didn't know it. I pretty feel pretty confident I would have figured it out. But it is really cool seeing the legend Gary Kasparov uh, teaching everyone how to improve their chess. The, uh, the, your coach, Mir Miran Shear, didn't teach you that? Um, I feel like he probably did, but sometimes probably did, I'm... but you forgot. Well, either way, let's take a quick peek uh, into the class. Remember, you can go to masterclass.com slash chess right now and sign up. Chess.com members can get the full course, even though it's not available to everyone yet. If you sign up, it is available to you. Let's take a peek. I'm trying to come up with the comprehensive picture that will be helpful for you to become a better chess player and even a better decision maker. Check. I want to show you the ultimate deflection, the ultimate sacrifice. So here we are. White pawns, you see they are advanced. A7, B6, C6. Bishop is pinned. All's working in white's favor. But there's one problem, it's check. If white king goes on A6, then geometry works in black's favor. Queen E2 check. And it will be a perpetual. White king will not escape. Do you see any way to prevent black queen from attacking our king and uh, forcing a draw? Does it work? Queen g5. And that's one of the lessons of this endgame. Magnus Carlsen giving out a few lessons of his own, though he just got, he just got, uh, what is that, posterized? What's the basketball thing where you get someone, someone dunks in your face? Is that posterized? That is absolutely being so, posterized. But if, we, but if you self-mate, that's like stepping in front of Michael Jordan before he dunks it, right? Is there a self-posterization? -post yeah, that, I think it's one of those moments where you step in front of LeBron James, and that would be more accurate because that is just, you know, just the, you're just asking for it, right? You step yeah. in front of Michael Jordan, and it might get fancy. Step in front of LeBron, he's just slamming one down right in your face. Well, uh, we will we'll see how Magnus recovers here as uh, Grishik is, is still not at his seat. We wait yet a few more moments. Magnus already back there and, and ready to rock, probably wants to shake off that, that checkmate on D7. For those of you who maybe somehow just joined us, let's back up real quick and show you again. Magnus plays F7 and mates himself with Bishop D7. Good old-fashioned family front, fun, the PG kind. And we're about to see more of that right now as the three-minute portion Kicks off. Robert Hess, your call. What do we got here? Well, it looks like we got a little E4, E5 action. Um, we're going to, Grishuk must have loved the position he got from that previous game where he had the white pieces. And I, well, not just me, Daniel, we both loved his position. And we got a Berlin. Um, but this, we, we saw this in, was the computer match, Danny, the Rio de Janeiro variation where that knight heads to B7. Yeah, um, It looks like both sides know what they're doing. I used to play this as black. The point is that black has the two bishops. And instead of trading queens and getting your king stuck in the center, black is in a castle at the right moment attempt to play f6. Um, you know, the problem with playing f6 often is that right now, for example, um, f6, there, there could eventually be an e6 move because the pawn on c6 is undefended. So it makes um, black's life very difficult. And so black here should play a move like bishop to c5 or rook to e8 and then slowly maneuver out of this weird knight on b7 situation. Um, and, you know, it's, it's odd, right, Danny? It like, is odd. You, you, you've seen so many Berlin games in your day, but I think that's what makes it You know good me, for man, me and the Berlin hanging out real tight. <laughs> <laughs> your, your, uh, your favorite city in the world, right? Favorite city in the world, favorite boring opening to fall asleep to in the world. I just... Turn on, turn on commentary replays of the Vladimir Kromna Gary Kasparov 2000 World Championship match to go to sleep at night. Um, well, you were just recommending Gary Kasparov's master class. You can't uh, take away his, like, what's the opposite of a master class? No, that would, that would, that, yeah, that was the opposite of a master class. <laughs> Gary Kasparov not being able to bust the Berlin against Kromnik in 2000 um, because it's an unbustable opening. Not, he didn't, he did not try. It wasn't due to a uh, lack of, lack of trying. 
Uh, right. But yeah, you and I just saw this opening in the Chess.com Computer Chess Championship last week, right? Yep. This, this was uh, this knight on b7. Uh, did, does does Black know that knights don't move diagonally in this position? I mean, this is not an ideal position for a pony. It's not. But right now, bishop takes d4, queen takes d4, d5, making use of the fact that pawn e5 is pinned to the rook on e1, so no en passant possible, and from White's perspective, typically when you face this pawn charge, you want to go knight a4, go b4, and just try to make sure that those pawn, double pawns of c file are not making any progress. Can I just say it really, it really gets me hot when you guess four moves in a row? It really gets me going. <laughs> really gets my well, juices flowing. You just guess so many moves in a row, I'm, I'm shaking over here in my office. <laughs> well, you know, I was going to make a point about actually how the knight b7 is a good piece here because it keeps the c5 score defended. And so, you know, while normally white wants to go b4 and control that square, it doesn't really do anything because the knight on b7 is covering c5. And, I mean, white has c5 under control himself. But here, rook e6, swing that rook over to g6, go queen h4 in the near future to hit the knight on a4. So rook e6 here, and all of a sudden, whoa. Ooh, Magnus what? wants more. Um, What's going on with the c6 pawn, FYI? Ooh, wow, queen d7. A positional sacrifice if you trade on d7, everybody. Now you're going to have to play the move b3, and black is just better in this endgame despite being down a pawn because of white's horrible pawn structure. Look at that little wow, trick. That, that was uh, a that was, that was actually really awesome. That was, that was a Magnus specialty right there. Can I get one of the Magnus specials? Uh, now the c2 pawn is under fire. I mean, what's interesting is it's still hard to say that black is better here. I mean, he's down a pawn in an opposite colored bishop themed position but but with the pieces jumping to life this e5 pawn is weak the c2 pawn is under fire as we've said you kind of start liking black here yeah especially if that c2 pawn falls because then there's a pass d pawn um that yep. is defended by a bishop on c2 so here rook d8 right yeah you got to play rook a d8 okay c5 also i guess Ooh, nice move. Queen d5 threatens. Bishop takes d4, everybody, because the pawn is pinned. Something tells me we're going to have a sassy little three-minute portion. I'm telling you right now, we're going to have some <laughs> sassiness. And not only is bishop d4, though, if you have bishop takes c2, you can even consider going e6, right? That's a, yeah. definitely so, in the so card. So Grishik actually got out of that. He grabbed the, he, he, he took the money and ran, Billy Joel. <laughs> I love you just call it sassy. This is going to get sassy. I That's like that. That's something that the cool kids say, I think. My 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 12-year-old son says sassy. But then again, uh, he may not be cool. I don't know. You know, as soon as you uh, think your kids are cool. He's definitely cool. He's okay. a cool kid. Well, he thinks he's cool. That's for sure. Um, but no, seriously, though, uh, Grishik seems to have gotten away with the, the like a thief in the night for now. But still, you like Black's activity. The bishop on f5 hitting c2. Uh the rooks, the rooks are also better on d8 and e8, so. Magnus just and plays he, Tickle in these positions so well. Just plays h6 and says, okay, now now your turn, White. Right, and he, in some ways, Magnus is waiting for Grishuk to play f4, and we've talked about this in, in some of the earlier games. Mm -hmm. Once you make a move like f4, your king side actually becomes much weaker. Then the rook can go to e6 and over to g6 and may apply some pressure on uh, the king side. And that's why h3, I like that move, because there's no rush to play f4. Your pawn e5 is defended yep. for now. If I'm black, I consider bishop c8. You can go to a6 or to b7. Yeah, I, I, I love bishop c8 also to come to b7. I, oh, yeah, you did say that just to get the, the the potential battery over here. We know opposite code bishop positions can lead to really dangerous attacks if you can if you can get it going. Right, so the two out, I mean, queen b6 is also a good move. Swinging over to g6, mm -hmm. where you attack h3 and c2. It's one of those... Uh, nice double attack. The main so, reason I think you don't want to move the queen from a5 is you got the, you're got you nicely poking at e1, right, Robert? If the rook ever moves from a1, it's possible the a2 pawn could fall. So Magnus, as much as he wants to sit and just hold water as well, it's hard to see an exact way to improve his pieces that don't also give up something, right? Right. And shout out to our last subscriber there. Thank you so much for your support. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. I'm pretty sure we've had record numbers today, Robert, of all the Speech Chess Championship matches so far. Pretty sure we've had live viewer record numbers. I know you're really into that. You track our well, stats no, I, closely. I, I was gonna think that uh, Hikara versus Magnus last year probably was the. Uh... Oh no 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 not not. I meant this year. I meant numbers gotcha. of this year. Um, but yeah, yeah Mag Magnus and Hikara last year is. Um, this game is headed hmm, toward a draw. Okay. Well, White's have a, a clear pawn now. Yes, opposite colored bishops uh, make it difficult to make too much use of the pawn. But now Rook C five. 
right, hitting that yeah, eight pawn. Grishik is unwinding. He did win the last chess 960 game, everybody. A little bit of momentum potentially swinging back the Russians' way, thanks to KLNQ, who just subscribed to our channel. Um, Danny, I think both sides just overlooked a nice little trick. Instead yeah, of yeah. Five, rook takes a5, and if rook c2, then rook f4 hits the bishop on f5 and allows that bishop on b2 to escape the d4 square. So um, I think that was a great winning chance for Grishuk there. And now after a3, which looks more or less forced, the game should be uh, should peter very out to draw. draw. Although, no, you're right. That was... E6, Danny. Right? E6 is always something to keep in mind. You got to play but it actually, now. You got to play e6 it now. No! The shot there yeah. everybody Robert had in mind was just to open up the seventh rank potentially to try to do what you have to do to really have an edge in obstacle bishop positions, which is really get the initiative because small amounts of material, though that concrete aspect is often not enough to win when your opponent can just set up a blockade on the opposite color square and your bishop is helpless. So, so I, even just from a practical perspective, I would have liked to have seen one side try to be aggressive and look for an attack using their color bishop. Right, and so bishops, you know, okay, I would say bishop c5 into e7 into f6 is one idea to try to uh, keep black completely stuck. So now g h5, okay, maybe, I mean, maybe you play f5 it, here. Yeah, but then I take on f5, you I take guess, on h5. I guess it's unnecessary, yeah. King will just sit on h7. He's yeah, going to do it, though, and I think he has delusions of grandeur just like Danny going for a checkmate on the dark squares. Yeah, but he, with that, the bishop doesn't have an open uh, diagonal to work with, so. He'll play bishop d2. I think he's... He's he, almost trying to lose, you know? He's almost trying to lose, just like Danny would. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say it was a good idea. I just suggested it, Robert. Remember that. Um, <laughs> no, nah, I'm kidding. There's, there's no chance that White loses this game, but it's clearly a draw at this point. Yeah, well, Magnus needs to try to trade rooks, and he does so just to make sure there was no rook down to b8 or, or try to get the rook over on the dark square, so... But okay, for the record, is... they've offered each other like three draws. They just keep missing it. Okay, making... yeah, they're just uh, like ships in the night. Kind of like our relationship these days, Robert. <laughs> I, you, you caught me speechless there. Uh... <laughs> ships in the night. Um, all right, well, we're back to this uh, little Nimzo-English kind of Tarash defense hybrid dealio for Relio. Um, we're going to get an IQP, something that makes Stockfish proud. Yep, Stockfish was loving that in our uh, computer chess championship. And the point is, again, this black pawn on d5 is not always easy to defend. Now, if, earlier we saw a6, bishop takes c6, b takes c6, and e4. And that was actually a game that Grishuk got out of it and uh, even had a better position. Here he takes a different route and goes with the bishop on e6, keeping d5 exceptionally well defended. And now if white takes on c6, after b takes c6, um, you have the two bishops for black. You're in, uh, white isn't quick enough to go knight a4, rook c1, and apply real pressure on that side of the board. So if I'm white here, I, w I should retreat the bishop, to, let's say, to d3, rather than take on c6. And that's actually what Magnus just did. So. Once again, Robert guessing the moves and the ladies go wild. Um, <laughs> okay, bishop g4, h3, but... The uh, the main thing, though, is that even if white had to make this retreating move, you still, I mean, black's counterplay and what you normally need to justify this weak pawn on the open file, an isolated pawn has no long-term positional protection because it's isolated, right? Uh, I mean, black needs more pressure than he's getting here. I still kind of like white's position, given that normally you see black with a little more of an initiative to justify the permanent weakness. Right, and engines tend to, like, think that these positions are about equal because they think trading off pieces, well, and I mean, they they have no fears, their engines, but they think trading off the pieces makes black, uh, leaves black in an all right position. Sorry that I'm faltering my speech here. But, but yeah, no, I know what you're saying. But the truth is, on a human perspective at least, if the miners come off, it just gets white easier to a position where he can play for two results. Uh, maybe he's not winning, like you're saying, but when you have an isolated pawn in an endgame with no counterplay, your opponent is in the is in the driver's seat, and, and they can just gang up on that pawn until you break. And here, I mean, black has ideas of going bishop c7 or to b8 and going queen onto that diagonal, and that's what white has to be really careful about yep. because white sure is aiming down at this d5 pawn. Note that you can't capture on d5 here because after knight takes d5, knight takes d5, queen takes d5, there's always bishop h2 check. It's um, you know, important to keep that in mind always uh, for some of our 
newer chess players. No, you're right, and, and, I, and I like, and the Black is now trying to get the kind of counterplay we said we, you know, we want Black to get, to be able to justify the isolated pawn. Um, I actually like this move, Bishop e5, maybe he'll get d4 now and simplify the weakness, that's a very common idea uh, if you have an isolated pawn to look for an opportunity to trade it, because normally if you've done, if you played your cards right with an isolated pawn, you should have more active minor pieces, because you had, you had more open files and more open lines, due to just the natural aspects of the structure that your pawn was isolated, so with it came some open avenues. Um, and, and if black can get d4, normally normally it's okay, although here here probably white maintains a little bit of an edge if they just traded off everything into the endgame, because this bishop on f3 is immediately targeting b7 and these double pawns, but I still like d4 from Grishuk, and I, and I think this I think that black is, is equalizing now. It was interesting that he took with a knight because he could have taken with a queen on d4 and then uh, traded queens and just left the knight on c6, which kind of blunts that bishop on f3. However, I really like the decision here, uh, as you were kind of just hinting at, because if bishop takes b7 and rook a7, the rook can come over to uh, to, to d7 if it wants, Ooh. bishop can go back to b8, right? That's a and nice then, little battery there. That's what's going to happen. Gonna be... Yep, he flips the script on the D file, and and now you just you Whoa. feel like Black should have some tactics here. Where is it? Where's the discovery on the lady? Knight. Uh, I don't see one quite yet, but Bishop B. No, nah, Bishop B eight. I mean, you always consider Bishop B eight, right? To go Christie seven. Just to get the queen and battery going, yeah, just to do that. But you can also. I mean, I guess the other thing is, is what's white threatening? Okay, white is maybe threatening knight c5 in some positions. You don't want white to fork the rook and, and the pawn and kind of simplify. But I was going to say maybe white doesn't have any useful moves. So maybe you could sit on the position a little bit. And and you really like the knight in the center. You love the rook on the d file. But here's the problem. Grishik is going into the think tank. And now we have a, a minute, a full minute time advantage for Carlson. Right, and again, one of those moments, Bishop B8 was sort of the obvious move, right? You, of course, you know, you're thinking about playing that eventually, so why spend however many, he spent almost, what is that, 40 seconds on Bishop yep. B8? I guess he was trying to work a discovery, a night move, but... No, but you're right, again, again and, and again, it, it's easy for us to say, and you and I have already been poked fun at by the chat, who are we to criticize Grishik and Carlson? Believe me, everybody, Hess and I don't have any sort of thought of uh, or ego that we would be competing with them in this format but again like it doesn't mean that you know you're what you're assessing here as far as you can sometimes see the writing on the wall even better than the players do when they're kind of locked in the emotions and the and the x's and o's of the game it again grishik is taking too much time on moves that robert and i to be fair we suggested it like three seconds after the position was on the board right and, right. and, and so, again, those sort of things, when you it doesn't seem to matter, but then if you lose this game because of time pressure, one of the things it shows, you know what I'm realizing, Robert, we haven't talked about yet? It just shows that Magnus just played a match on Saturday, and maybe Grishik is a little bit out of form, because I think you can, you can agree with the fact that one sign that a player is not quite in their best form is taking 30 seconds on a move they could have played in five, taking two minutes on a move they could have played in 30 seconds, right? That, those little things add up when a player is not in their best form. That's, that's just true. And right now, Grishuk has found these ideas, bishop a7, rook to e2. This position is actually quite easy to play for black. You're down a pawn, yep. but you're the one with all the threats. This pawn f2 is going to be, quickly become a target. Um, look at how passive white's knight on a4 is. Right? We don't like our knights on the edge of the board. And so from Grishuk's perspective, he's done everything right except for keep his time above Magnus's. So with the yep. extra four seconds in the position... Uh, now, sorry, th almost 30 seconds as Magnus continues to think. And that's the only thing Magnus is going for him right now. The extra pawn, which is not real because I can even just take on b2 and go rook d2. Yep. And then take the pawn. Probably just rook d2. Oh, I was going to say maybe Grishik should play rook d2 first, be a little more little more, more stubborn on that trade. But he still is the one, as you said, a little better here. The pressure on f2 is real and nothing else in the position really is. Right, yeah, because white is very much stuck here. The rook can't move from f1 because f2 falls, and the knight actually doesn't have anywhere to go to protect f2 because knight d3 just hangs the pawn on b3 with the tempo. And so all of a sudden, black is going to be the one who is going to go up a pawn, well, I feel we'll like. We'll see, and right? I mean, what we've been talking about is the, is the practical aspect of time pressure. You see Grishuk really kind of arched and sitting up. I think he knows that this is something he, he doesn't want to have happen again to get under time pressure, and so... Um, I see some comments in the chat making being made now about our comments about Grishik's time management. One of the one of the best comments ever about that is the book Talbot from the book Talbot Binnick, uh, an autobiography about their match by Mikhail Tal. Hear his thoughts on on kind of time management, practical stuff. It's a lot about what we're talking about here. 
Um, all right, Grishik wins that pawn, and he is better again. And look at Magnus's time, but 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 will he get another win? He need he needs to keep the momentum going his direction. Yeah, and I'm looking at the time; it's actually getting quite even. And so, ooh, rook c3, interesting move. The idea of being yeah. knight take six, rook c6, this and that's is... a much easier end game to play yep. for black, where you're up a pawn with the outside pass a pawn. So yep. um, he's going to get it by Grishuk, who's now up what five seconds. Ooh, wait. Going for a trick. Rook d6 doesn't work as of knight f8 check, everybody. So Magnus is forcing the rook ending. But after, I was going to say, even rook f6 is almost interesting there if you can get the king out. Um, this is this is better for Mag, uh, for, for Grishuk than, uh, than some endgames he could have got, but maybe not the most winning chances possible. But, yeah, but I mean, don't underestimate that these endgames are winning. Here's what can happen. The rook can come to f5. Okay, Magnus being very smart not to allow that. Because one of the things there is if the rook gets itself in a position where the king is cut off from doing what Magnus is trying to do now, get it active, then, then these rook endings are winning for black. The, the black king will eventually get over to the A file and help the A pawn advance. But I think Magnus has simplified enough that this should just be a draw. Right. And the reason why is because the rook on a, the rook, white rook is behind the pawn, which is essential in defending an endgame like this. Black would love to switch places where the white rook's on A3 and the black rook's on A7, push the pawn up and then try to move the king over the queen side. Now, unfortunately for Grishuk, uh, with his rook in front of the pawn, it makes it difficult to, to push too far, and this move f6, I was going to say, at some point, just give up this pawn, the king goes into f5, into g6, and you're going to have to give up at least one pawn, and the game will end in a, a draw. So, Yep. Uh, now White will the king, right? rush the king back, and it will be a draw as soon as the king touches down on c3. There's no way to check with the rook and free the pawn without king to b2. And Bob's your uncle. Okay. Well, I guess from Grishuk's perspective, you haven't lost the last couple games, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, and after winning the last game in the five-minute portion, though it was just 960, the momentum feels much closer to equal now than it did where Magnus was up 6-1 six, six to one at one point. Yeah, it, I mean, it's definitely closer, but at some point you have to score points, right? You can't just say, oh, I'm feeling better. I feel like an even match with him. Okay, it's, when you're even match drawing every game when you're down four, that's not going to help. So, unfortunately for Grishuk, he really needs to play catch-up and has to do it right now. Yep. Okay, Is we have another run? another Lopez. I think this exact line we saw in the World Championship between Karyakin and Carlson several times. Yeah, and and actually Grishuk, he didn't get this quite position earlier, but the sort of same dynamism in the position where it's a slow, methodical, maneuvering game. And so I like the decision by Grishuk because he has been able to accumulate um, good positions. And so knight takes on a2, the knight on a5 has to move, and exactly, white goes c4 quickly. And yep. so white expands. Uh, and this reminds me, although it's not quite the same of a game recently between Karyakin and, and Svidler, where Karyakin got a C4 moving, but there were lights were vicious on the board, so it was different. Uh, but the point still holds that white is expanding quickly and trying to get a nice spatial advantage mm -hmm. and ask Black, what, what is your plan? I, I agree. Um, and, and I wonder if there's anything to that. We have uh, Grishuk the Russian, obviously a teammate of Sergei Karyakin, playing uh, openings that Karyakin is also employing regularly, both as white when he played Carlson at the World Championship and, as you said, recently versus Svidler. So... I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if there's something to that. I think that um, Grishik has shown he's trying to challenge Magnus in some mainline theoretical positions. The, these Rui Lopez's are not positions that they're only playing in blitz openings, right? These are these are right. serious openings where White feels like he can push for an edge, a small edge, and outmaneuver his opponent. So um, this is a much more theoretically relevant blitz match, I guess you would say, than the one we saw on Saturday, where lots of sidelines. Right, and here uh, already black has a bit of a difficult decision because oftentimes yeah. when a pawn on b5 is you know, a pawn right in front of it and there's a, an a4 pawn attacking, a5 is an idea for black, hoping that um, if black, white goes b takes a5, black goes b4 quickly and then takes back on a5 and tries to make use of this uh, isolated pawn on the a file. However, if you go a5 here, then white can take on b5, a takes b5, a takes b4, and b takes c6 with a tempo and the queen, such that white's pawns are all connected and black has um, this isolated B pawn that is a pass pawn for the moment, but if targeted, can quickly fall. So 
Um, A5 is not recommended from black, and instead it was D5, sacrificing a pawn in a different manner, hoping that if white captures a bunch on D5, black will go rook D8 and scoop that pawn right back up. Oh, also B4 is hanging, I should mention. Yeah. I, I over it first. So this D5 break looks timely then. Yeah, it's interesting. Timely and maybe also a necessity, though, right? Uh, necessity breeds timeliness or genius. I forget one of those things. Um, but no, I, I really like that that point you highlight about why A4 was such a strong move from uh, from Grishuk. And, of course, taking the pawn would have never really been an option. Everybody as this transition greatly favors white. Um, and so Grishuk needs to handle the tactics well, but he should get a small edge probably at the end of some sort of forcing line here given that black was kind of forced to play d5 aggressively. But the truth is, with b4 falling, it's hard to imagine a position where everybody is not just coming off the board, right? White's going to trade, black's going to trade, takes and takes and takes, and everyone just takes and we're going to get a draw because black will eventually re-scoop up those pawns on the d file. Right, and so the only thing that black really has to be concerned about is if somehow um, after queen takes d5, we trade the queens, and then bishop takes b4. If the bishop in one turn go bishop b6 to c7, mm -hmm. that would be very problematic for black because then d6 is, uh, uh, is cemented and black has no way of actually attacking the pawn on d6 because the rook can't go to d8. So instead of taking on b4, Magnus first plays rook to d8, and this should be, um, well, okay, if I take on b5, so a takes b5, a takes b5, rook a7, bishop takes b4. There's no way to... At least not no way that I'm seeing to protect this pawn on d5. So well, you get rook no, but that's a good line. Rook a7, bishop takes b4, rook b1 with tempo, and then rook takes exactly. b5. And I, and I think exactly. that would be a line that white could could maintain the edge. So I, I really like your line. A takes b5, a takes, rook a7, pose the difficult question to the bishop, gain a tempo. Okay, Grishik finds another approach he likes, though I'm not sure that ours wasn't better. Um... Shout out real quick to uh, Justice Bot, bon, uh, Bonzani, uh, several title players playing Guess the Move in the chess.com uh, arena there, chess.com slash live, or just click on one of the buttons below Chess TV and you'll follow the games instantly. So uh, fun to see so many players playing Guess the Move, especially title players. I wonder if that's a good way to get better, right? Studying chess, right? Try to sit there and actually guess how Magnus Carlsen plays in real time. Probably can't hurt, right? Um, well, how's it, how's it doing I'm for asking for a, I'm asking for a friend, Robert. We all know I stopped trying to get better years ago. Asking for a friend <laughs> about how to get better at chess. Yeah, I mean, it definitely uh, should be helpful because you're watching the best players, and that's how, in general, you get better. You look at top-level games. And um, here, in this particular game, this is just, let's see. Okay, so bishop c5. Do I take with the pawn or the rook? That's the uh, essential question I have. Um, okay, if we trade Probably everything. Probably with the rook, and, and the point is, after rook c8, black is not actually threatening to take this pawn because a back rank checkmate everybody. So now I, I think Grisha can play rook a5. But I'll, rook a5, b4. I guess right? it's just, just going to be a big equal trade. b4. Yep, rook b5, and then just make love for your yep. king. And white take on can't b4. get there in time, yeah. Yeah. If white could get the king to stop the b-pawn in time, you would see white maintain serious winning chances. But next move, everybody, yep, we get the trade of this pawns. And once again, now we're in an endgame where maybe maybe only Magnus could win. But given that it's a rook ending, I would just offer a, graw, a draw if I'm Grishik and try to get as many blitz games in as I can. And, but if you're Magnus, you might start playing match strategy and just prolong yeah. this as much as possible. Well, I think, so. I think Grishik is playing match strategy. or Either that or he was listening to me and he offered a draw. But... Uh, um, I, I don't know. I think of all the players, I feel like Magnus's best match strategy is just to be Magnus, and he doesn't think like that. He's like, I'm just going to play every game the same thing I would do overall and, and win. Although he, we, he, did, he did display some match strategy versus Nakamura in the final last year. Weren't there, weren't there a couple games where Magnus just kind of drew it out and didn't let Nakamura make a comeback and bullet? Do, do, we, we, we commentated on some of those games, right? Yes. No, he definitely, he, you know, Magnus knows what he's doing for sure. And he, uh, speaking of knowing what he's doing, he once again goes for this variation in the uh, Sicilian. So he's not testing Grishuk's, who is an extremely strong Sicilian player in main lines, but kind of going for slower, offbeat, more solid lines uh, without risking any huge theoretical discussion. So um, the point here is that White eventually will try to go E5. So in, Black just played e5 himself, and once again, if we see the move d5 come in, which I, I 
was going to hope that Grishuk avoided as he just did. Um, that you know, black goes d5, then the e5 pawn becomes a target, the bishop on g2 becomes open. Instead, the bishop on g2 is still staring down into its own pawn, essentially on e4. Black can continue going b6, rook c8, queen d7. Um, and I think black is doing quite solidly here. So nothing to be too concerned about at the moment. But strategically speaking, um, black has to be very careful before making a move like f7 to f5. It's one that you always have to keep in mind but you also really have to be concerned because uh, you're opening up that bishop on g2. So yep. for the time being... Well, black is probably going to be preparing it. Moves like h6 are suggestive of the fact that black wants to guard the g5 square from the knight, and, and because he may be preparing for a kind of a, a spatial assault here. But I really like Magnus' last couple of moves, I just had to say, because c4, giving this knight on, on, on b1 a new, a new plan, and uh, the knight comes into d5, I feel like... I feel like this is this is an, not I don't want to say an easier edge, but it's a, it's a flexible position for White. It's easy for White to play this position on both sides of the board. It's a Botvinnik English structure, actually, a symmetrical Botvinnik English, which again, not something you see every day. And not a fan of this A takes B five stuff. I mean, by, by Grishuk. Yeah, when I get these positions from the, the black side, and opening up that rook to attack the pawn is never. A good idea in my opinion because the yeah. pawn a3 is well defended the bishop just sits on c1 uh, but at the same time i guess the knight can come to c6 and then the queen can you can i guess i don't know how you double in the a file because there's always knight c7 threat so if you're black you have to consider taking on d5 at some moment well i think maybe black's idea is to play his knight to c6 uh knight e7 to c6 and then and as he does so then maybe look to take on d5 so that he can pop his pony into d4 We'll be getting a structure where maybe if it becomes... Ooh, but in exchange, did Magnus miss knight a7? He definitely missed knight a7. Why didn't he take on first on d5? I think that was better. If he took on d5 first and then took on b5... Oh, I absolutely. Said, no one... Although he's still going to be able to do it. But I agree, Grisha could have... Everybody, once Magnus missed that he trapped his own rook, Grisha could have taken and then played knight a7. A little bit easier to play without uh, the extra white minor piece here. But I think... I think Magnus making another blunder here. Again, okay, this is not a huge... Okay, the white's not resigning here, right? But but black is definitely better. There's no way Magnus was sacrificing that exchange. I wasn't looking at his facial expressions. I know, rare, but I wasn't. So I, did, I didn't see his reaction to trapping his own rook. And now white has to do something like knight d2 to c4. So, you know, structurally it looks kind of nice for white because you often like having this A and B pawn versus this backward B, uh, B6 pawn. You put a knight on C4, throw an A4, A5, and that seems to be uh, in white's favor. However, given the current situation where black is some material, it might be uh, just not enough to provide anything close to full compensation. Though, um, again, knight D2, knight C4 is very natural. And I said this earlier, look at this clock. White um, is up a minute on the clock. It's a much easier plan. At any moment, black has to consider... How do I consolidate my position to get a full point? Because Grishuk desperately needs to win this game. Mm. And, and that might four, be it. Look, at, look that. at that. I think that's the I think that's the right practical approach. Making sure that we don't get exactly the kind of position you were just talking about, Robert, where this knight comes to d2 and sinks itself on c4, and white's in complete control, especially if the position remains closed. The the rooks can't flex their muscles. I think c4 is a great move by Grishuk. I would agree, except for the fact that d6 pawn is now uh, under attack, but though I guess you can consider, I mean, is he going to take on B4 now? Because I don't see how you get an mm. advantage otherwise. And the important thing to see here is of knight C5, D4 is a bad move by white. It looks like you're getting rid of your double pawns, but after E takes D4, knight takes D4, bishop takes D4, queen takes D4, it's an amazing knight on C5 versus a bishop on G2 that doesn't really have a great future. So something to keep in mind is that D4, um, you know, you might have to play it at some point, honestly, Danny, but it gives... The end, the well, not the end game that will you'll see in the future is just very good for black. I, I agree, and it, it does make me think for a second. Okay, maybe I overreacted to how how much I liked that thematic kind of positional sack of c4 a few moves ago, but I still think black is the only one who can win here, given white has so many weak pawns. D5, B5, B3. I can't even highlight them faster than the players are moving. Um, okay, but man, if this knight comes to c4 again, Magnus just in a very practical fashion not caring about all of his material. He knows he'd rather give up the d3 pawn in order to get this knight to c4 and get the pressure it can exert. 
And that, that kind of attitude may be what saves White's game here. White's going to make sure that he gets his knight in just as good of a position as Black Knight's. Here comes knight c4. Yeah, I, I like I like Magnus's defensive idea. Yeah, here I think Black has to try rook a2 because otherwise now the, one of the d6 or b6 pawns will fall. So rook a2 threatens e4 followed by bishop d4 idea. So rook a2 mm-hmm. as play, but maybe White, exactly. Yeah. They're moving faster than they can even talk. A pawn is a pawn. Here they go. He takes b6 and uh, Magnus has... Intentions on the B spot. I'm pretty sure that was a rap song. But there's actually a big attack going. So if like White moves the knight, uh, then Bishop D4 is yeah, a really and, uh, big threat. Even without the queens on the board, once again, how many opposite colored bishop themed attacking ideas have we had today? A lot. Right, and actually, if that F2 pawn falls, then Black may be able to sacrifice the bishop for the B pawn because the E3, the eventual E pawn is hard to stop with the knight on d3. So this is well, actually he, very... He's going for it, and Grishuk has fully sat up again, as Grishuk does well, uh, arching his back and, and uh, really kind of kind of being on the edge of his seat, knowing he doesn't want to get under time pressure, but a little bit too late for that with only 20 seconds. Wow, this is... And this is a very, very complicated position right now. So yeah, look Brooks... at that. Threats of knight f2 check now, followed by a bunch of checks and a draw. Maybe Grishuk has to bail out. Yeah, I, I would. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna guess Grishik just has to bail out. Knight g4 check probably. Yeah, just you know, the the king can never run anywhere. King f1 always runs into rook f2 check and loses. So just this is a a nice little a surprisingly repetition. peaceful result to a uh, to a really sharp and an exciting game. Um, but uh, but no, no def- king no king denies himself a little pickle tickle. And we move on with a draw. I don't know how to respond to that, so I'm going to just look at the chessboard because that was... <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't know what, I don't know what you're thinking about. It's just a game that they play. Tickle. This reminds me of a Rick and Morty episode. <laughs> broadcast. So, um, anyway, back to the chess. So, <laughs> we see another um, King's Pawn game where we become quite acquainted with these lines. As you mentioned, Danny... Um, a lot of these kind of closed structures are very popular in the World Championship match between Carlson and Karyakin. But again, I think it's, uh, it's some good Russian prep here. I think that Grisha, Karyakin, Svidler, I mean, this is a, this is a line that Grisha is, is believing he can play comfortably. He knows the plans intuitively. He can play the lines quick. I mean, so this is like main line stuff. He's going to try to get an edge against Magnus. And if nothing else, people who actually still care about getting better in the Rui Lopez might actually learn something from these games with a little post-review, because I'm not convinced Magnus it doesn't take 15 seconds there to play Bishop D7 for a reason. He's trying to think, you know, he's really trying to assess and play a position that he knows is theoretically, you know, sort of uh, sort of relevant. Right. And speaking of, well, actually, this is not relevant at all, but everyone on Twitch is going crazy about my Pickle Rick reference from Rick and Morty, so... <laughs> You, did I'm you just I win could... yourself some Twitch love? I think I did. Oh, I'm man. Gonna... You know how I feel oh, about Twitch love. The last, the last chat says, thanks, Hess, for ruining chat now. So <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll go back to doing what I'm good at, or tr- hope that I'm good at, is uh, talking about chess games. And here, this is thematic from Carlson, is the C5, E5 setup. You're trying to challenge white in the center on the D4 square. Yep. But at the same time, look at that bishop on F8. So white's ideal situation is trading off uh, both bishops and knight for the light square bishop and both the blacks knights. Getting knight versus dark square bishop is always favorable for white. Well, not, I shouldn't say always, but often favorable for white because the bishop on f8 is very passive. Um, and this is, look at the bishop on c2. It's kind of just a piece that's sort of stuck for the time being. That said, um, white at any moment can consider going d5 or a4 as was just played. And so you're competing both in the center and on the queen side, particularly because the rook just left the A file over to C8. That's why Black doesn't want to allow the opening of that yep. file. And so, I don't know, Danny. I feel like these positions always require a, really a ton of maneuvering, and I feel like I need Anatoly Karpov. And, right, know, right. Karpov is a master class, but I feel like I need uh, Karpov to yeah. whisper in my ear what to do here. Because, and I, either of them would probably be a more useful co-host than me, as I'm offering him very – I mean, okay, no, we, we can talk strategy here and, and, and apply – 
uh, some good takeaways, but you're you're doing all that all by your lonesome, so I don't need to add much. I think this move D5 is interesting because it also kind of puts the kibosh to Black's intentions with the rook on the C file. The, the disadvantage when you push the D-pawn robber is you're always making, as you highlighted, the bishop on C2 even more of a big pawn behind your chain. But you prevented Black from, you know, a, a transition sometimes Black looks for everybody as White does something else, and Black takes on C3, takes on D4, and just blows open lines and opportunities on the queen side. So, okay, now now Grishik has gone a maneuvering route where he's going to try to take advantage of these potentially weak B and C pawns because they're, they're sort of extending too far, and now the knight comes to C4 and D6 is a target. I actually really like this entire transition for Grishik, and once again... I mean, I don't know what the result's going to be. Once again, I mean, this has been a very successful Spanish from Grishuk about as theoretically, you know, you, you're about as happy as you can be with white in this position with an awesome past A pawn and, and positionally better in the center on the light squares. Right, and if you're white here, firstly, you love that A pawn, right? That's a past yep. pawn. And you ask black, where is your compensation going to come from? Mm -hmm. At some point... Black would love if the queen was on b8, for example, to go rook takes c4 and then b3. But that's just, you know, that, that's just a hope. It's hopeful chess. It's folly. It. Folly. Sorry, is that the right? <laughs> I, sorry, I've always wanted to use that word, folly. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, otherwise. I think, I think Grishik's just going to chop on f4, too. Yeah, and look at Magnus is all in on, the, on your idea, partly because, you know, Black's position was either sit there and let myself be grinded, ground. A gr gr grained it? A gr what's the... Okay. Uh, never mind, Ground I've down. lost it. Ground down? <laughs> but I think I think Grishik goes on to get a win here. I think this is this is exactly the kind of Spanish game that Grishik knows so well. And look at the time. Time goes with it to prove it. Grishik is actually up on the clock. Yeah, and look at this bishop on b3. You know, it it's, looks like a big pawn, but it just defends everything. Yep. Now white can go a5, a6, if he so chooses. e5 is, is definitely uh, something to keep an eye on. And so... You know, what does black do here? If you move the yeah. where's the rook on e8 going? It, it doesn't have a good square to move to because it's rook a8, everything's defended. Okay, bishop c8. Well, I guess it's going over to a6, but now e5, right? Just blast yep, open e5, the center. Bust it open, especially when you're up the exchange. Shout out to uh, our, our, our Archangel Condor for subscribing. Thank you for that. But whenever you have the rooks, obviously you want to open up new lines and opportunities. That's how the rook outplays the minor. That's what you do when you're up the exchange. And look at that. Grishik plays e5. I don't know why I'm getting so excited about this, but something's tingling inside me, and I need to I need to let it out. <laughs> I don't. I I wish I knew. Oh, I don't know where to, to go anymore. with that. Um, so, queen d6. I guess overlooked because bishop d6 is the more natural pin, but bishop d6 runs into rook takes e8 check. So queen yep. d6 is a bit annoying, but rook a e1, then maybe knight d7. What's going on there? Yeah, Rook A E one. No, I think I think White is fine. Rook A E one. Knight D seven. I mean, I can I can sack my I can sack my lady, can I? I don't know. I'm concerned about that because then the pass pawns look kind of annoying on B four and C three. But Rook A E one, Knight D seven, maybe Knight F five is also possible there. Just huh. to maybe you're distract. right. Maybe this is a little. Oh, man, well, Grishik obviously agrees with you that there's something to think about here because the tables have turned and suddenly that tingling feeling I had inside has gone away. Everybody gets nervous their first time trying to convert here. Um, all right, well, he's going to go for this line. But, yeah, I mean, look at how quickly Magnus is playing. And yeah, Magnus Grishik. is like, well, I'm not going to miss my chance. But Grishik finds that f5. That was the way to save White's edge right there because now if Queen b8... You can take on, on E8, Robert, and then Knight E7 check. Does that help? Uh, uh, I was thinking just Knight takes H6 check. Knight right takes away, H6 right? check. And, and then, then give me a check on the G file, and then take your rook on E8. So the wow. queen stack is, I think, forced by black. Oh, yeah. And now look at this. The queen, queen somewhere. Queen E4, right? That way you pin the knight. Lots of pins. Why not just push the pawn? A5. I guess you're worried about bishop C5 coming from black. And surprisingly, Magnus is actually still not out of it. If he can grip the dark squares, white lacks white lacks a dark square bishop to challenge that. That's a really critical point. That's why Grishik plays d6. you got to stop bishop c5. Now the there's knight d7 check coming, maybe. So bishop f5, queen f5, yeah, it's, then c5 is always in the card. So here when knight d3, but knight... Oh, wasn't knight takes h6 check just winning? Oh, knight takes h6 check and then queen g3. I didn't see that. That would have been now nasty. Black well. Little double attack. 
D6 is falling with check now. Or not. Now I'm very confused. Maybe queen D5, and then you can push C5 next. Just, you know, don't get too excited. What? G5? G5! And the Knight queen H is running out of squares. But he could have taken on H6. I mean... Yeah, but now black has more than enough for the queen. Right, but white should have taken on H6 and gone queen F6 there. Threatening queen D8 check, threatening the pawn on G5, and the bishop on H6. That was the last hope. But again, no time for Grishik to calculate all this. Yeah, um, and again, still, it's, it's the time that's coming back to bite him, and and he may so, he may go on to lose this game. I'm shocked. And again, it has nothing to do with the opening or a really, I think, sound uh, match strategy approach from Grishik. He is getting an edge against Magnus Carlsen in the Lopez, but he just can't convert under time pressure. Oh, oh man, oh, oh man. This is sad to see. Just C2 here, right, and just get a queen. Yeah, that's a lady. That's that's a new lady. That pawn had dreams to one day grow up and dance on the stage with the other divas. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I wonder if, you know, there was like an analysis of a percentage of time that a side was better if Grishuk Gr has actually been better for more of this match than Carlson has. Because, and maybe I'm just, is a recency bias of, you know, him just winning game being in winning positions and blunt like you know kind of blundering it away but um i don't know it feels to me like krishika had so many good positions just can't pull them through i agree and that would be um like a time with it's almost you're asking for like a football stat like a time a time of possession stat right like and no it, it isn't interesting because often when you see games where a player or a team really dominates they dominate all the stats and time of possession is a big one having an edge on the board in chess is about as comparable to time of possession as anything and, and i would agree that grishik has had an advantage for the majority of his moves even if it's a slight one and then big blunders under time pressure has uh, has basically been the story of this match um i like that you know that's a stat we should add that's a stat we should try to track is, is time on the clock. And it's something we can only do in the Speed Chess Championship, Robert, because of this, of this overall game clock, right? We can actually track the match time. Um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be pretty interesting. I just, I don't know, it just keeps seeming to me like Grishuk is ahead and then all of a sudden not. But in this current game, um, let's see, what's going on here? I think hmm, it's complicated because, you know, if White is going to capture his pawn in C4, to try to go up a pawn, you have to watch out for this long diagonal. The bishop on g7 is already and, and threatened. And the rook on the d file, but yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. And so it's already a big threat to just go make a move like knight to g4, knight to d7. Knight to d7 will be very strong, actually. Uh, for example, b takes c4, knight d7, uh, bishop before a5, and already black is winning a piece. So, um, Yeah, I like yeah. it. I wonder what Magnus um, calculated there, because clearly now he's trying to think his way out of the position. Lots of tactics on the diagonal. That c3 knight is a problem. But even here, knight d7 is still interesting for black. I guess maybe better just to develop bishop e6, bishop a6. Uh, yeah, bishop e6 is normal. Yeah, and black, black is doing okay. But again, this hasn't been the problem, right? We've had... Right, uh, now, now knight d7 actually is tempting as well. So knight d7, bishop d4, it's kind of thematic. After bishop d4, you can even capture and go knight e5 and just try to take over the d file. Um, the c4 pawn falls, and he does go knight d7. I like it. This is very similar to uh, to a line in the King's Indian, uh, the Zamish King's Indian, where black sacrifices a pawn for sort of long-term compensation on the dark squares. And, and here black is down this e4 pawn, but white, white needs coordination in the worst way, and black is likely going to win back his pawn before white gets it. Well, actually, it's I mean, huge threats are on the board. So maybe white might, I don't know if I would play this, but I would consider playing a move like knight d5, just sacrificing the pony and trying to uh, kind of re-coordinate the pawns. But looking not good for and then maybe Magnus f4 and e5. Match. That's an interesting idea from a practical perspective. And there it is, knight d5. I feel like, you know... I feel like Magnus finds those moves... Uh, just more than anybody, right? The, the 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 thread is slipping, right? And he finds the way to keep some sort of thread on the position to make a make a practical imbalance that makes you have to rewin the game. Not to say black isn't better here again, but we've seen this dog and pony dance before. 
Grishik is better here. He's up a piece for two pawns, but but now it's a whole new psychology. In in the in the previous position, Robert, you're you're grinding down and you're trying to work your way into the dark squares. You're looking at all these ways to kind of have long-term compensation for the pawn you've sacrificed. Now you're in a position where you're better, but you have to deal with the onslaught of pawns and find optimal minor piece coordination before it's too late. I just feel like that those little things are things that add up in the bigger picture of the match and, and make Grishik now spend some time on the clock. He's no longer going to be up on time. And, you know, rinse and repeat, prevent your receding hairline, which I've been meaning to talk to you about, um, about <laughs> your hairline. So. I appreciate that. Thanks. Um, but... I, when you said pawn onslaught, they used to say a pawn slot. Like you had the opportunity right there in front of you. Pawn but slot. Then you got not, yeah, oh my gosh, slot. you're right. I missed an opportunity to make up a word. I did not bring <laughs> my A game. Well, speaking of not bringing the A game, well, we've seen Grishik go down the scoreboard, but you're right, Danny. I mean, he's, it was a good practical decision, and not just because I recommended it for Carlson to go knight d5, but how do you convert a position like this? You know, from my perspective over here, it's annoying really annoying that I can't actually chisel away at these e5 and d5 pawns, right? Because I can't really go f6 anytime, and the pawn on d5 is very well defended by the bishop on g2. So if I'm black, I need to figure out the best way, and I guess at some point I can go bishop f8 and bring this bishop to the uh, other diagonal just to kind of avoid the pawn structure altogether. But I, I don't know. Mm. I'm not seeing a clear path forward. But I like that move. Maybe you don't chisel away. Maybe you bring a jackhammer, baby. Woo! Put that knight on b5. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, knight on b5, knight on f5, maybe. maybe. I mean, he did just take advantage of a very timely pin, and that knight on c4 had had served his purpose. So I, I think you play knight b5 anyway here, and then you look you look to be aggressive with your rook. Okay, now Grishik is... Grishik he, is... He's he's, you know what? If anybody should have some good old Russian schoolboy technique, it's Grishik. So he needs to put on those big boy Soviet pants and go to work here. He needs to get some technique on and win up a piece in this endgame for the kids, for the boys. Yeah, no, definitely. For I mean, the problem is, again, is that this rook is now struggling to find its activation. Uh, that was what's ne that is what's necessary to actually win this game, to get the full point, is getting the rook activated in a way that doesn't actually allow white to activate the rook first. So, ooh, rook b3, I don't know about that. Wow. Rook c1 check, rook d1. Just make uh, white's task as difficult as possible. So you don't want to rook trade behind. rooks here? I guess you, trading rooks probably makes white's hold easier, I guess. So you want to keep your rook on the board to create counter chances against the king. Oh, uh -oh. I don't like this. I don't like Grishuk, that. Grishuk doesn't agree. He likes trading, but... But again, I feel yeah. like in some of those moments, Grishuk is making decisions based on time pressure and defensive-mindedness against Magnus. Although, you know, it still is very clearly better for black. But again, without the rooks on the board, I don't see you're going to make any progress. You can't even attack any of the pawns. Shout out to our sub there. Um, I'm not going to read your username uh, aloud uh, because I was tricked several times on Saturday into reading <laughs> non-family friendly usernames. Robert, I don't know if you caught that. And I didn't realize what I was reading. Nope, didn't catch it at all. So I, d I avoided it right there. You're welcome. I know I don't want to hurt your virgin ears. Um, I, I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I was about to say something, and now you just – now I, I, none, this conversation is better left for off, off stream. So, um, <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway, back to chess things. Back no, to look chess. At white you know, G4 is coming. Yep. If, uh, yep. He, yeah, and he, he pulled a, he pulled a uh, Rio de Janeiro and fianchettoed his knight. <laughs> but now but he's I mean, working his way out of it. Yeah, and the more pawns that are traded, I mean, at just a certain point, there's just nothing left. So, um, Black somehow needs, but I just don't even see a way to win this game. Black needs to get his knight magically over like h2 and yeah. win the g1. Like, there's nothing, I can't even think of anything conceivable to happen that Black could win this game. Yeah, plus the pawns are running out, right? Every pawn that's traded is uh, less opportunity for. For winning an endgame where you're only up one minor piece. And uh, maybe yeah. so much so now that Grishik is just going to throw in the towel. I mean, there you go. There's a move. Come get it, big boy. Come get it. He's going to well, undermine honestly, the E5 pawn, everybody. Takes, shake, and bake. And the D6 pawn falls. 
Well, if you go f5, bishop e5, bishop takes g5. I mean, the idea is to just take the knight on d8 and take on f7. And maybe so I can go... play f6. Yeah, and then I go bishop f4, I guess. Yeah, but that's, this is the best way to play for uh, a win, is just to try to maneuver around. And No, Grishik's doing his best to make yeah. it interesting, but I just don't think there's enough left here. You got to find a way to win the d6 pawn before your f pawn gets traded. If you do so, you have a long-term chance of winning, winning like a knight and bishop checkmate kind of endgame, uh, which wouldn't that be some highlightable, clippable material? Let's hope we get that, friends and family on Twitch TV and chess.com TV. Uh, let's hope it's we get. It's actually getting more and more difficult for white because bishop d1 check already yeah. is, you know, going to put white in an uncomfortable position. I told you, good old-fashioned family fun, good old-fashioned. Russian schoolboy technique. That's what Grishik is going to show here and get a, get a big W as black. Bishop D1. That's, Bishop no, D1 not check. Not okay, anymore. but this also works. He's going to win that D6 pawn before the F pawn falls. That's the key. Okay, I thought he was going to. He's not going to. I was tricking you. Um, I you think better move. Yourself. Zero time on the clock. Here comes G5. And that should be enough, actually, for Magnus to draw. Um, okay. Yup or doodle scoodle. Draw town. Draw town. And the reason this is a draw is because um, the king can just sit itself on h2 and the bishop yep. will just remove on that diagonal and there's no way to actually deliver a checkmate because you can't deliver a check without trading the bishop. So Last um, time we checked, you can't mate with a solo king and bishop adventure. Oh, Robert, Robert, Robert. Only seven minutes left in the three-minute portion. Uh, the Russian is running out of time to make his move. Um, and apparently Magnus is running out of time for something that has nothing to do with this, uh, with this match here. Maybe he has to go attend to some services. <laughs> yeah, you know, Danny, I, I'm a little disappointed in you because you started getting inappropriate when you said you're welcome to me earlier. <laughs> Did I and really? I just watched I just watched Moana the other day for like okay. the fourth time. And you know the scene where the rock sings, you're welcome? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was going to like do a play on that, but you just got really inappropriate way too quickly for me to deal with I'm it. I'm sorry. So. I'm sorry. So let's reset in our relate. What, what did you want to say? Just no, say it's, it. it's over now? Late. Is it too it's late? It's over. I'm past. Yeah. Yeah. You know that guy at a party who like the moment has left five minutes ago and he just continues to try to bring it back because it, that's his moment is to tell a joke yeah. and, and the process ends up just kind of outing himself as a total weirdo. Yeah. I just didn't know if you knew that guy. That was all. That was all. Okay. Um, I, I, know, I know his name too, Daniel. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Magnus is back. He's got his headphones back on. All is right in the world. We've got a Berlin. Come on, give us a main line. None of this Rio de Janeiro. That's what I'm talking about. The main line Berlin. All right? That's what I've wanted this whole time. I feel like you're joking because I don't think you ever want to see a Berlin again. <laughs> but. This, is, this is where it's at. Queen's off the board before move 10. Very little opportunity for an advantage for either side. Somebody's, <laughs> <laughs> somebody's really getting heated over here. Getting heated <laughs> up, man. Um, all right, but jokes aside, right after this, everybody, don't go anywhere. Of course, we will have the bullet portion. There's a good chance, Robert, we're looking at the last three-minute game right here. Uh, and Grishuk being down five games, um, knowing what we already know about bullet, this is, this is getting tough. And again, Magnus Carlsen, like, he's, he's just good, right? He's just good. It's hard. That's the most insightful thing you've probably ever said. <laughs> I, I mean, thank you. <laughs> I think, thank you. Yeah, he's just good, and it's and it's 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 really hard to play chess against him. Is that also insightful? It's really hard to yeah. play chess against Magnus. Well, I mean, just you know, quite honestly, he's very he's such a strong intuition, and that yep. in longer time controls, it still matters a great deal because you know they're spending more time and they have more time to think. But there's so many different branches, so many variations, and it comes in useful when you can conserve your time and still find the best moves. However, in three minutes and one minute chess, you know, if you're able to just find things at the speed of light, or you know, I don't know, I, I'm not a scientist, I shouldn't use that expression. I was going to call you out on that, but I, I thought you might have stayed at a holiday or something, so I was letting you get away with it. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you just, if you're able to find things so quickly, then it saves you the time, and uh, you know, you're essentially avoiding situations like Grishuk gets into. And Grishuk just played e6. 
which is thematic in many Berlins because it opens yep. up uh, this bishop on b2. And now, ooh, f6. Yeah, and this, this is also a thematic one. response, right? Because you try to take advantage of the overextended pawn by making it a target rather than taking the bait and immediately capturing it that might fall something like knight to b5, kind of a, a double attack on c7 and g7. Right. And now knight h4 is an idea for white, trying to use those light squares, the g6 square, the f5 square. And what black needs to do is, like, for example, knight h4, knight, uh, bishop takes e6. Maybe there's some knight b5 stuff going on. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting pawn sacrifice just to get the initiative. Um, and already it's becoming very difficult for black. So knight e6. Here comes the thorn. Yeah. No, this is... This is a like you said, it's a thematic idea. This e6 sacrifice is not something that was just pulled out of the uh, the wind here. It's very typical. And both when the bishop is on the b2, uh, let's say g7 or a1h8 diagonal, and when the bishop is on the h2 c7 diagonal, right, Robert? So if you're a if you're a Berlin player for either side, take note of this idea because it's very often kind of a key way for white to turn the tables on black and really get some pressure like white's getting here. Although I actually. I don't know if I'm seeing the full pressure. I guess the knight e6 can't move for the time being because rook e7 check. But, I mean, knight f4 here, isn't the knight f5 just hanging? Yep. I don't know, Robert. I was trying to talk about the idea, not the specific tactics. Why well, are you going to no, do me I, like that? The problem is I was going to agree with you, but then I realized that was a bad idea. So right. then I said, well, okay, Danny must be missing something. And knight f4. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so just your pur pure principle of disagreeing with me brought you to your senses. So in a way, you're welcome. Okay, it's okay. Yep. I'm just an or ordinary demi guy here. All right. Um, <laughs> so wh who are you watching Moana with? I get tortured to watch that with my daughter. I mean, I don't know where where you're at. Is that a is that a voluntary thing there? It just it just happened. Just let it be. <laughs> it just happened. Let it be. <laughs> uh, um, but no. Okay. So white sacrifice upon hoping for an initiative. But nine four is though. just honestly, it's just winning. I think that I think that Grishik is. He's throwing his hand up in kind of just frustration with his calculation there because you're right. Is Even though it doesn't change anything we said about e6 being a thematic idea to open the bishop on either diagonal, this was just this was just a a, a blunderful game. And, and I think they have one more game now to play in three minutes because of that. Um, and uh, I'm not sure why they haven't started their next game yet. Neither am I. But what I was going to say, though, is that, um, you know, the problem is rook e7 is just one check. And, you know, the king can just move out of the way and then your attack is over. And so with hanging pieces, of course, the 9 out of 5 in that position, uh, and just not, not doing the trick. So, yep. all right, we have another Sicilian. Oh, and this time we don't have the, um, the kind of slow, methodical, you know, French variation Sicilian. Um, and maybe we'll get some kind of mainline... Tamanov going on, right? So this is going to give us some extra match time today. I mean, this is uh, one of those rare times where this game is starting and it's going to end very quickly as far as that total game clock. We see there's only 42 seconds left. So this game will probably go on for several minutes past the hour, sort of uh, extra, we'll call it stoppage time. Um, and uh, and then we'll get another chess 960 game before we move into bullets. So still lots of chess to be played. I'm having a blast. <laughs> We also should give Max a little more credit for that last win because didn't he like go to the bathroom at the beginning? I mean, yeah, I, I'm not looking. What at did the he do? Whatever he did, I told you he was attending to some services. Often it's <laughs> either a snack or or something. Well, he did, he did services, and I wasn't sure if he was going, you know, to temple or synagogue or whatever right. he well, goes. You know, whatever to each his own. Whatever services you yeah. need. Um, yeah. As long as they're not no, Danny, don't say that. Don't say that. Um, <laughs> let's keep going. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. It's just something about. Something about chess here. Do we have uh, a note? Mike Klein just said something that I also can't read on air, which is fine. <laughs> we have officially reached the end of the 3-2 portion, and uh, we have our first truly mainline Sicilian. We should actually be focused on this here because you described the fact that Magnus has been avoiding the, the Sicilian with his King's Indian attack. But if we back this thing up on the analysis board, everybody, we've got a, uh, a mainline time on of Sicilian. This is all theory, and uh, after bishop d4, bishop e7, queen f3, this is, I, 
okay, I'm not an expert in this particular line of the time on off. I, I actually play uh, more of an English attack style time on off with a move like Queen D2 and Castle's Long back on move 7, Robert. So what do you know about this particular time on off as far as the theoretical relevance and, and what both sides are playing for here? Right, well, you see White just went Queen G3, and I was going to say what also is always in the air is some kind of Queen to the H file, so Queen H3 or H4, trying to open up the Bishop on D3. So um, unlike some other positions where this bishop on d3 can be attacked by a black knight, those knights have been traded off um, right. early, and thus those bishops sit pretty in the center. That said, um, you know, black is actually quite solid and has a, a couple of things to consider. g6 is always a consideration, you know, knight at h5, just kind of poking at the queen a little bit and saying, even okay, Even, even the, the Nigel short knight e8, right, and just try to bring the bishop to f6 to, to simplify the pressure on the dark squares, right? Right. And so here, um, g6 probably does not come recommended, so it re returns back to f6 immediately. And now there's the queen h3, exactly what I was talking about. Queen so, h3 has an interesting thread, everybody. Black has to watch out for the immediate moves like bishop takes f6 and then e5 with a discovery on the h7 pawn. So that idea Robert also, highlighted. There are also knight d5 threads. I mean, same idea, kind right. of just clearing that diagonal for the bishop and uh, trying to get at this knight on f6. So h6 here, or g6, are the two moves that are you're going to have to play. g6 I'm always nervous about, but um, could just be all right, because then black can go e5. And once you go e5, you're, you know, the reason why you're nervous is because the d5 square is the one that you're trying to keep under control. But that said, by going h6, you also have to keep in mind that at some point, white might consider a sacrifice. You know, Bishop e3 takes h6. is certainly not out of the question mm -hmm. at the right moment. And so instead, knight e8 was played, and now knight d5 is probably just great. I, I love knight d5. Ooh, do I love it. But e5 now, maybe? I mean, e5, it's got to be... Just grab the bishop pair even and run home. Well, the thing is, e5, right? You have to go g6, I think. Am I just and pop now, an opponent into f6? Um, yeah. Why not? Well, g6, I'm, I might just take on e7. Queen e7, then take on d6, and use my bishop on d4 against the exposed dark squares. So There's um, nothing wrong with exposing your own dark squares as long as it was voluntary, but you may regret it here. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, Danny. Danny I honestly Danny, Danny. don't know what you're laughing about half the time, but I do appreciate it. Uh, you, just, you, know, you just are a funny guy. But um, knight takes e7, queen e7, e takes d6, and you can't take back with a rook on d6 because then bishop c5 wins an exchange. If you take back on d6 with the knight, well, then the you know you, queen h6 is tempting. You can just go bishop back to c3 at some moment. The bishop go to b4. Um, yeah, this is not pretty for black. Yeah, this, this is, is, this is, this gone is a very scary wrong. time on of attack here. This is uh, something has gone. Something is, is not right here for white, for black. I think I like the simplest approach best, the one you described with knight takes e7 and gobbling the d6 pawn. And even if I have to play a move like c3 just to hold that bishop on d4, I've got the dark squares even without any concrete threats. Um, plus, we may have some real fun puzzle book mate of like rook e5 and then sack the queen on h7 and rook h5 and mate on h8. But okay, I digress. In my fantasies of possible checkmates. Um, Whoa. Whoa. Peace sack alert. What? Oh, he's going to take on e8. This is getting closer and closer to some sort of tactics trainer-like finish. If he takes d4, Robert, he's going to play rook e7 first, I think, in Mizzo, push the queen back to c8, and then maybe something like bishop eight, takes g6 in some position. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you're right. And actually, in this, just a second ago, black could have gone taking on f6, because uh, now bishop e3, if you take on f6, there's bishop g5, right? Pinning that knight on f6 to the rook on d8. So bishop e3 here keeps everything under control, and white is just much better. Yeah, but I still wonder if Magnus didn't doesn't get the best or the easiest position to play this way, because the f6 pawn is also a target, whereas the variation we were sort of considering for white, just to take e7 and open up d6, felt like such an easy position for white to play, given the mutual time pressure that always occurs. But okay, Magnus Magnus wants the whole thing, apparently, this game, and he's willing to get under time pressure himself. This is one of those rare moments where Magnus is actually as low as Grishuk on the clock. Yeah, I think Grishuk has to go knight e4 here. Oh, I don't like knight d5. 
the, the problem is that in an open position, the bishops are much stronger than knights, and you also have a two-on-one majority on the queen side. Blacks, yep. king side pawn majority, they're not going to get moving anytime soon, especially with this bishop on c4 pinning the knight on d5. So, um, yeah, it's looking real nice for white here. Yep. Uh, double just... the bishops, double the fun, and uh, yeah, this is this is just such a tough position to be black, especially again with not very much time on the clock. Um, and bishop d4 is a very smart move with yep. the idea of going c5 with the uh, check. Yep. So. Yep. And also, if the king stays on f8, you're just threatening to play a4 now because there wouldn't be any knight takes b4 due to the double attack. So. Now All rookie right. seven, right? Bishop d5, I take on, you can take on a6. I can even just trade uh, bishops on d5 if I wanted to. Um, you win the g2 death. pawn, kind of. Well, bishop e3? Yeah, I was going to say bishop e3, rook d1 check, king f2, rook f1 check, king g3, rook f3. No, Wait. rook f1 covered. Oh, rook f1 was covered by the bishop. Touche. You got an F plus on that one. You barely passed. <laughs> you know, I was going to throw a Waterboy reference there. I was going to call me, myself Bobby Touche. Mm -hmm. because he said, Bobby you, Touche. You LOL. Gotta, come on, Danny. That's about as corny as you get, buddy, right there. Bobby Touche. Yeah, that's why you should have said it. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. One okay, of us well, specializes Bishop, in corny here. Yep. I was say Bishop B7. Not only does it pin the 9 and D5. Oh, I love that B8. move. A4, A5, A6 is uh And the pawn goes marching on. Do you want to be in the number? That's right. Born in, I was born in that number, and uh, Magnus Carlsen's putting up some big numbers, okay? I mean, I don't even know what to say right now, Robert, but another win in the books. Chess 960, classical chess. You're back on camera due to some requests in the chat. I think Chess Bay and some others were really looking for that face of Robert Hess. So, Robert, <laughs> oh, tell the people what they're seeing here, the greatness of one of the uh, – I think Magnus Carlsen beats anybody in history in this format. I mean, he is just the rapid and blitz – it's like he's better than he is over the board. I swear it. I mean, his his numbers don't – if the numbers don't lie, then it's probably right because he's been so quick – um, in every single match, he's been. I mean, has what's the closest match he's been a part of? I don't even know. What did he beat Hikaru by in the finals last year? The Grishik like match. Was... The Grishik match last year was. You and I were on the edge of our seat. It was the opposite tale of what we're seeing here. I mean, Grishik was leading the majority of the time, um, and I think they entered Bullet within a one or two game, you know, um, standing, and then Magnus ran away with it. Um, uh... Yeah, by the way, Chess Bay said that you're lying because that you're, she's the only name that you know in the Twitch chat. So. That is not true, Chess Bay. I know lots of other names. You're just my favorite, okay? <laughs> so Hikaru was the closest. Hikaru, and he 14 and a half, 10 and a half, okay. And a half. So only beat Hikaru by four games, which is something. I love how that's an only, right? Like yeah. We always thought of Hikaru as being like the best online Blitz player of all time, and you know he only <laughs> managed... Uh, to beat him by four. But in this position, Danny, I mean, this is a weird position with the queens in the A file. Yep. Uh, very close. White can go D4 at any moment. Well, actually, no. You need to get the queen off the uh, A file it's, first. These guys are doing everything they can to get Lopez type. Okay, this isn't a Lopez, but anything with pawn tension, whatever. I feel like we've seen this type of maneuvering game. Critical uh, components being, you know, whatever happens with the pawn tension we're going to see with D4 and the A pawn, where, where the minor pieces place themselves. So uh, this is, again, a very maneuvering type of game here. D4 and the A-pawn sounds like a new band. D4 and the A-pawns, right? Yep. Um, but, I almost said something I really would have <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm worried about you today. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. You know what? I'm a little tired. There's been a lot of speech chess matches and uh, been going to a lot of therapy, looking to looking for more opportunities to air out my uh, my craziness. Um, but uh, we're having a blast here. Thanks to all 15,000 of you who are watching us, whether you're on Twitch TV slash chess or chess.com TV. Magnus Carlsen putting on a show. And uh, we haven't really talked a lot about this today, Robert, but the stats don't lie, right? We talked about Magnus Carlsen being predicted to win this match by 10 games or more. And uh, fun fact, he's well on his way um, along with a specific segment uh, segment uh, predictions right there. So for those of you... 
uh, who wonder sometimes why that's a fun thing to highlight when the numbers say that someone else is just going to win by a lot. Well, sometimes the truth hurts. That's the first thing. But, you know, I think from an odds perspective, the more we provide uh, insights into what we know these guys are capable of in different circumstances, the more that gives us the future as, as a, in the chess community to to add other elements and have a lot of fun making predictions and, you know, and, and, and getting uh, – getting more analysis. I really like Robert's idea of time of possession because I think this has been a match where Grishuk, once again, by the way, slightly better in this position, has been better most of the match for given how many decisive results have gone against him today, Robert. That's a super interesting point and a, a very, that's, you know what that is? That's a telling fact of what you and I have been saying, that he's losing games under time pressure because the majority of the game he's playing very well. Isn't he just going up upon here? Yeah, like, he is. He Grishuk, five... Grishuk's going up upon him. Magnus is shaking his head. Uh, I, I'm not looking at the players, but I'm just, you know, looking at the board, and all of a sudden, e5 pawn is just gone. So, uh, bishop b6, that move that Magnus just played, I guess he forgot about pawn takes a5 first, distracting the bishop from the diagonal, and then taking a pawn on e5. So, so looking uh, really good for Grishuk here, but I feel like we've seen this one before. Whoa, d4. All right, well, Magnus is going to do the thing he does. He's going to go for something practical. Shout out to Smarter Chess, who just subscribed to the Twitch TV slash chess channel. Um, here comes D4. Does so Rook takes D4 uh, possible? Rook takes D4. It looks good. I would probably just take F6 even. I don't even know. I mean. Now Rook takes D4 is probably. Rook takes D4 wins, takes D4 wins a clean pawn. That's a clean. Knight takes D4 loses to Queen takes C3. So I'm like, okay, I don't want to just hang up hang the board so yeah there's rook d4 that's a free pawn no transmitted diseases coming along with it it's over oh boy <laughs> danny you're so ridiculous today <laughs> what <laughs> oh gosh anyway um the problem though for white is that you couldn't move the rook because the 93 was hanging with check so now black is up in exchange but for the price of two pawns and a very exposed king so rookie one here for example should be yep there it is Rookie one, and then, I mean, just look at the black king side, right? If the bishop goes to f7, knight g4 is really annoying. Yep. You can even go knight f5. Grishuk, Grishuk. Didn't Sasha Grishuk take two of three at least against Levon Aronian um, in their blitz match from last year? So I feel like Grishuk, Grishuk has a good record in chess 960. If he wins this game, that's a 2-0 that's a result so far in the, in the Fisher random portion. And he's on his way to doing it. Bishop h4 looks fun. Queen f4. Looks delicioso, Dora. There you go. Knight f5. Let's let's uh, let's go with the brute force method. Knight h6 now. Undermine the knight on g8 and uh, open up the bishop against the king. Yep. Grishik sees it, and we're gonna get a big win for Grishik, which he needs to bring this match to six games. I mean, I'm predicting a little early, but hey, that's what we do: is predict, predict things and then be wrong. You've been doing that for a <laughs> long time. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but I think we're, we're correct here because the black king is uns is not safe. The white king is perfectly safe, and white is also currently up two pawns. So um, hard to imagine black surviving this, though. But we've Magnus seen Magnus yes. do it before, right? Oh, too many times to count. Too many times. Oh, I mean, I I, I had I literally had nightmares about rook takes g seven from uh, in the match with Wesley. So I mean, it literally, <laughs> I mean, it was just nutty that Magnus was able to do what he did there. Couldn't lose. So and now, honestly, he, he's making this a little bit of a mess. I guess Grishik is just going to go with the simple approach. Yeah, and then just go knight back to g4, rook to e3. Um, yeah, maintain maybe, the two-pawn edge, and it should be I enough. I guess knight to... check is also possible here. Knight e4. I don't think knight e4 was the best way to handle that. Now he has to, if he has to play rook a1, is he going to run into bishop takes e4, f takes, and rook e3? And, and actually white is headed into a rook ending instead of what you normally want with the knight on the board. Wow. Grishik found a way to make this not so easy to win. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, now all of a sudden you have, you're stuck because the two on one on just purely the g and h files is not that helpful. But the, you know, the, if, if the e pawn was gone, of course it's not winning. With the e pawn, I believe it should be should be winning, but it's very difficult because you know you got to keep that rook attached to the pawn there. So, not not well played by Grishuk. Yeah, and this also, is 
this is, you already highlighted, and again, from an instructional perspective, this is the ideal defensive setup. The rook is behind the one and only pass pawn, and therefore actively able to disrupt and create threats against the other pawn. And that's really important, because if your rook is in front of the pawn, your scope gets smaller with every pawn advance. When your rook is behind the pawn, your rook scope increases with every pawn advance, and that allows you to do things like this, which of course is keeping the white king trapped in the corner. So I, I'm, I'm going to say right now, it looks like Magnus may be holding a draw in, in what was a, a losing position for sure. I mean, this is... Okay, I mean, Grishik, I guess, is still... He's still poking and prodding. No, just king f5, and you can even take on e5, yeah, probably. king f5, That's... and even the king and pawn ending is... I think Magnus, exactly. Magnus is probably calculating that right now because that's a big decision if you're going to commit to the king and pawn ending. All right. Well, he calculated it. We'll see. Is he doing it? He's doing it. He's doing it. Doing it and doing it and doing it well. Who said that? LL. Oh, my gosh. That rhymed. LL Cool J. You remember that guy? I know who LL Cool J is. Did I just got very confused with what you're doing. So I was, I was you, quoting you an LL Cool J song, Robert. Earlier it was Busta Rhymes. Now it's LL Cool J. You had some Eminem in there. Sometimes. You're going back. Going back today. I told you I woke up real early this morning. Good, uh, good. Wait, wait. He's what? Blunder. What just happened? Magnus. What did he do? He played King of Six. How is this a draw then? Did we just think it was a draw and it wasn't? That's possible. King d4, king f6. Magnus is looking at the position too. Oh, was it just not a draw the whole time? No. Thinking, but... Yes. No. Yeah, I guess it was It was not a draw. Huh. huh. We'll all be. All right. We're as confused as you are, Magnus. <laughs> That's a highlight. <laughs> um, That's a low light. For everybody there. That was weird, right? I guess just totally... Uh, yeah, I think it was winning the whole time. I just kind of assumed that because Magnus was doing it, there should be a draw, but... Whoops. Whoopsie poopsie. Either way, we are going to be headed into the 1-1 portion with Magnus Carlsen um, in, in complete control, a six-game lead in the match, despite... Despite an odd ending to the uh, Chess 960 game, but Grishik does grab a 2-0 score in the Chess 960 and maintains one of the best records we have in the format. So, Robert, it's Bullet. We've seen Magnus put on a show before, but stranger things have happened than, than uh, an underdog coming back in a Bullet match. But uh, what, what do you expect to go down here as the, as the fastest segment of our show takes off in about two minutes? Well, Magnus is the Demogorgon. You said Stranger Things, so I got to give out a shout out to that show. Um, but, you know, Magnus is invincible somehow. Like, yeah, he blundered this game, and, you know, he's had many positions that haven't been good, but he just is he just so fast. He's accurate when it counts, and uh, Grishuk hasn't been. So I think that, you know, what's it, a six point lead right now for Magnus? Six point lead, right? the score of 11 and a half. At, it's going to end up at 10 points. Yep. I do want to go back to this because, you know, we have a break and let's provide some more instruction while we have 15,000 people watching. So this is this is an interesting moment, everybody, because the reason Magnus took his time here, we were talking about that. You see, he went from a minute and three seconds down to 48. He was really trying to assess because if you're drawing in a rook ending, the last thing you want to do is make a transition into a lost king and pawn ending. And very often amateur or lower rated players do that too quickly. They just kind of assume, oh, more active king, like I can get away with this as a draw. But what's interesting is even with that, even the world champion can misassess those transitions, right, Robert? What do you think it was that he miscalculated about about this transition? Did he just miss the eventual idea we saw, which was pretty clear? White White does a little flanking action. Flanking everybody is when you take opposition, and uh, regardless of what direction he goes, you take the square that he's given up, and you win. Is, is did he just simply miss this king d4 idea? You think? Yeah, I think perhaps he, he, yeah, I think that's exactly what he missed. That the king is actually running over to the center of the board and kind of shouldering off the black king. Because right. once the king, as we saw in the game, after h4, the final move, the king goes to e6, king g5 just scoops up the h pawn. King to g6, the king goes to e5, and again will shoulder that black king out from the protection of the h5 pawn. So yep. I think, you know, um, in which, you know, I guess it was a difficult drawing 
at difficult drawing chance of huge uphill battle he must have thought that this was just a draw and clearly we missed it as well so sometimes when um, you're making those transitions you focus on the things you think you can control you're like well i i can get this position with the kings and if they play g4 i know i can draw because my king's more active and it's easy to miss something like that but okay an instructional moment there, even the world champion making a mistake, perhaps a clippable moment if you're watching this, please, on our chess channel, maybe highlight that. King and pawn endings are some of the most important things for people to master, not just so you can brag to your friends, like, I'm the king and pawn ending master, whatever, but because um, it allows you to make better decisions in those practical rook endings, knight endings, bishop endings. Can you make the trade and draw or win those endings? You don't really know if you can without knowledge of those technical uh, king and pawn ending ideas. And you see, you know, Robert, I think sometimes you and I just Assume that Magnus is making the right decision, so we're not even assessing. We're like, okay, he decides he can draw, he goes for this, and all of a sudden, in hindsight, we're like, wait a second, that was just a horrible decision. Very rare, yep. but happens. Yeah, and earlier in the match, I was definitely being more critical. I think I just decided, okay, it's not that peace on the board. I trust the world champion, but always got to be thinking for yourself in, in these positions. And uh, speaking of thinking for yourself, Grishuk out to an early time advantage, so that might uh, he might lose that in a couple moves here, but. This b6 sacrifice is thematic, trying to ruin the black queenside pawn structure, keep the bishop on c8, so you can't go you know, pawn b7 to b6 and the bishop to b7. Uh, but I don't see how white is going to regain that pawn. Now white is just simply down a pawn. It's going to try to make use of the light squares, but I think the extra pawn is, uh, is sufficient for an advantage for black. And yes, the knight's coming into d5. But if I'm black, I'm even going to start considering at the right moment going g5 and trying to swing that rook over to the king side. But um, maybe yeah, but as this well. Is, uh, I mean, if you just look at the the human aspects of good knight on d5 versus bad bishop on g7, don't we just don't we just go bananas for white's chances here? I mean, I'll put my rook on b5. I'll put my knight on d5. I love white. Yeah. Now, now white is uh, doing extremely well. I thought. And actually, taking on f5 and queen d5 check already scooped back up with the pawn. So, yeah. Um, oh, look at this bishop on g7. Holding on so the light squares. Yeah, this is this is checkers, right? And uh, white can play rook b5, sit tight. Although, rook, you know, the rooks come in the h file, so you do have yeah. to be careful. King, you know, but he, so is white's rook, right? King g2, and white can bring the rook to the h file. It feels like black's pieces are much more tied down than white's at this point. So, that's true. F3. And, king f8. King g8, whatever. It's king somewhere eight, queen h7. Coming. Wait, is is black flipping the script? Bring the king to g5 and queen to h7. What? Okay, I don't like king h6 because it gives white the, the time to take on b7. Should have went king to the back rank. Yeah, because maybe. now queen h7 doesn't come with any threats of rook h2. I see. I was about to say maybe b6 is the move, just kind of yep. distracting the situation. Knight takes b6, maybe queen h7. Yep, right. there it is. And uh, yeah, Black this... still has a ton of pressure coming. Is he? Is Black uh, it's over? Be... Black's winning. So, yeah, Black is winning because King G five next, and you can't stop me from essentially mating you. Don't talk about mating me right now. It's you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're 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 entertaining people, please. Um, the there's no counterplay here. That's fascinating. Rook H3, queen H three, Queen. You know, just check, 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 mate. Uh, we talked about a potential turning of the tides. And what it would take for Grishik to come back and win. Has it begun? Grishik wins the, last the time he saw Well, he wins the chess 960 game, wins again. He's only down by five. When's the last time you saw Magnus lose two games in a row, by the way? Um, sorry, I blacked out. I'm not sure that that happens in this, in this uh, dimension. So um, you're <laughs> right. I mean... Could be could be a, a really interesting sign of things to come. Here we have an Evans Gambit. Think, speaking of exciting openings, let's hope that this bullet match continues to to be nutty. Um, yeah, and this this already looks strange for Black because now the knight again. I, I was about to say it beat me to it. Knight d5, and now you can take on b6 without sacrificing a pawn. So you get the two bishops and ruin Black's queenside pawn structure. So for the record, really until until that last loss. Magnus hadn't lost a single game in the match outside of Chess 960. Until that last loss, Robert, and Bullet, Magnus, Magnus hadn't lost any of the classical games. Wow. Well. Fun fact about the Evans Gambit, Robert, I have to say is that uh, Gary Kasparov actually showed his, uh, his famous Evans Gambit win over Vichy Anon in the master class. And uh, those of us who have a sneak preview to Gary Kasparov's master class course, we know that, Robert. Do you? Did you watch it? Nope. Okay, come on. I gave you a sneak preview. 
Yeah, I know, but I didn't watch it. <laughs> anyway, anyway uh, here, you know, seriously, guys, Gary Kasparov showed his win over Anand, and uh, it was a huge, a huge game in his career. So this will be fun. See another Evans Gambit. Although this looks like an Evans Gambit gone. Gone totally crazy. It's gone like, totally. I wanted to play Rook G3 there. That's what I wanted. But it was bad, so I, so I didn't that been, it. That would have been awesome to see, but yeah, very bad. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it was a really great idea, just kind of cutting off the queen from the protection of E5, but even queen H1 check, trading the queens off and then taking on G3 was good for black. But here, I think Magnus has to play bishop G6, because if you move the knight, then the E5 pawn falls, you go queen H1. Okay, now we just trade queens. Queen F1. What? Here, queen takes F3? Here, Bishop E2, yeah, trade everything. Trade everything, and then black is going to lose the pawn right back on E5, and with that, white's going to have a much, much better ending. There's a lot of pawns over here on the queen side, everybody. A lot of them. How many? One, two, five over there? Yeah. Five. A... I didn't know you were going to make me count. But, uh, okay, black is trying to draw this endgame unless white's king gets himself mated here with the rook and knight. If Magnus can pull a Magnus... And get a swindle. That would be uh, that would be the way that Black saves this endgame. Grishak handling himself in bullet right now. Here comes Rook A2 though. If D3 happens, look for Magnus to swing the Rook. A4 is gonna fall. Ooh, I, I, I think, yeah, I was saying, I think White's too quick here. Yeah, Rook F8, nice. Still, Rook A2 should have been played maybe, but okay. Go, go over to H8 or H7, whatever, and then go D6, D7. King E3 here, game over. Okay, rook a2. He still has knight d1 check coming. But the bishop on d6 covers h2, so now... Sorry, yeah, that, just that, is, that is irritating. Agreed. Yeah, I think Grishik... Are we talking Grishik. three wins in a row? Yo, Grishik is the man right now. Grishik is... Uh, he's there goes finding the his mojo. Similar to uh, Austin Powers. I mean, Stella just got her groove back. Look at this. I'm actually... I'm really pumped because honestly, for a while it got hard because the match was so one-sided that this is making me much more into the match. So I, I mean, know. already Magnus could be on tilt. He's got three straight games, and you know that is, I mean, unheard of for a player of Magnus' caliber. So we see a French from Grishuk, and this G takes F6 line, even in classical time patrols, sometimes it's very difficult for White to keep that initiative going, and then you have to face the two bishops. So a smart choice, um, from my point of view, from Grishuk. Yep. And well, and to me, anything that's dynamic, unbalanced, bishop pair here versus castles long and weird pawns. This is what you have to do right now. You're still down by four games with 22 minutes to go. But if you're watching this match and your friends left and thought it was over as soon as Magnus reached the bullet, you might want to call them and, uh, yeah, that, and tell, tell them to come back and tune in. The Heat versus the Spurs when all the fans left and Miami won that game. So you don't want to be like them. Yeah, in, in their first meetup last year's Speed Chess Championship, Carlson won the bullet portion by a score of 8-1. to one. So he's already lost the first two games here. Grishik has already bested his performance from last year, Robert. And look at this pawns in the center. I mean, he's Grishik's really going for it. He can just uh, end up castling. He can, you know, at some point you have to be careful because F3 or G4 uh, is just going to break open the, the position for for white, but again, the bishop on the dark squares could be quite valuable uh, given the current circumstances. But look how underdeveloped black is. I loved black's position earlier. I feel like things did not go right. Uh, because look at the knight on b8, can't get out. The yep. bishop on d7, even if you capture on a4, that doesn't hurt uh, white whatsoever. So the only... Uh, well, he, kinda, he, he didn't know what else to do to get the knight developed, so he had to give up the light squares, but you're right. This no, I'm actually it. starting to like black again. It's getting like really another sacrifice to open up more dark squares. That is how you work it, everybody. You got to open up activity for your pieces. Knight takes c4. Knight takes c4. The knight f5 is hanged. You can't take with the queen. This is over. Knight takes c4 just crushes white. Knight takes knight c4. Knight we'll see if Grishik can find it. He doesn't uh -oh. find it. He misses a win. Grishik was winning on the spot with knight takes c4. He misses the shot, and that could be one that comes back to haunt him if he doesn't win another game here. This is, He's also uh, down 25 seconds on the clock, so that's not going to help either. White has all kinds of threats here. White chooses to take a6. There was also ideas like swinging to the king side moves like knight h6. So remains unclear, but Carlson has gotten away with one as far as that uh, 
that opportunity Grishak had earlier. Okay, but he's still got pressure here. He's got pressure on the dark squares. D4 coming. Here comes the knight to D5 and knight to C3. I like black's chances. No, I don't like black's chances. The bishop comes to D3 and it's over. Why not bishop D3? That was lights out. Well, no. Oh, wait. Well, queen B2 is... Okay, so what's going on here? Bishop you gotta... D3 was lights out a move before by, uh, by Magnus. Yeah. I think, anyway. Um, okay, well, Grisha getting counterplay, but not a lot of time. Living off the increment... Queen d8 is going to be made. Followed by so. rook g2, or, yeah, or this way, okay. That's a yeah, huge, but... huge win for Magnus, everybody. Stops the bleeding. Almost went down four games in a row. I don't know if Magnus has ever lost four games in a row. Um, so, huge win there from the world champion to bounce back and push his lead back to five games, Robert. Yeah, that was really, I mean, this knight takes c4. The queen was overloaded on d3, so couldn't take on c4 because the... F5 was knight was hanging, but a huge escape there for Magnus. I mean, to be fair, he was probably better before overlooking that in the first place. But, um, you know, if you're Grishuk, you got to find those things because otherwise you're just going down. Yeah, it's snap. so weird. It was like he, he worked so hard to open up the dark squares, make really timely pawn sacks, and then and then miss the knockout blow. So, okay, it's, it's a close match, though, either way. 18 minutes and 52 seconds left on the game clock. Um Plenty of time if you keep winning games like you have so far as Grishuk in the bullet portion. I love b4, by the way. Love it. Queen d2, yep. Queen d2. Yeah. Very nice, very thematic. Just saying, okay, please take me on b4 and open the a file because I'm 9 and a yep, 6. Just bishop d3. Three. This is how you do it. Maintain the tension, everybody. Don't break the tension. Build on that tension till you can cut it with a knife or, uh, or whatever Bobby Hess likes there. Um... um. Yeah, take but up, now... Take a 5 yeah, and then knight d4. Take advantage of the pin if you're Grishak. Pop a pony into e6. No! Is, yeah, you're on fire right now. Knight d4 was a really nice move heading to e6. So if only uh, Grishak had listened to you. I've always I've been popping ponies since I was 5 years old, buddy. Um. Uh, <laughs> 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 you just, you're just setting me up for just so many inappropriate comments. So Okay, c5 is a thematic break. Aiming for this uh, pawn on e5, but now knight e4 comes. Takes, takes, bishop takes a6. Looked possible, but I don't know what was going Rumors on Rumors have it that the only time Magnus ever lost four in a row at anything was playing Chuck Norris in a game of rock, paper, scissors, and his hand cramped up, and he accidentally played rock 12 times in a row. <laughs> Danny, remember when we used to play rock, paper, scissors? That was pretty fun. I actually have uh, figured out kind of the secret to rock, paper, scissors as far as the psychology, but that's another tale for another Whoa, time. Okay, so F4. Ooh, I like that. He well, wins the F-pawn straight up. I think he Magnus blundered it. He, he put his bishop on F5, forgetting yeah. that pawn F4 no longer is protected. But now He's going to get yeah, the exchange, but White's got a lot of pawns for it. Here comes B5 and B6. Me like Dan, you got to love that knight on B8 going absolutely nowhere. <laughs> yeah. <And> so, <laughs> two pawns. That's, that's for... undevelopment that would make Karpov proud. Uh, so B6, just go B6, right? Isn't that Queen B3 works? B6 is coming. We're not going anywhere. This I think is, Grishik, is... I think Grishik strikes again, continues to put pressure on Magnus, and says the bullet is not going to be a free segment this time. Wow, pretty shocking. Ooh, look at that F4 is going, going to go F5, go Bishop Cement B4. Cement the knight. Well, Grishik did eventually deliver on my prophecy. Of a knight landing on e6, and I think oh, so he will the get time, this game. Look at the time situation. Yeah, now this is this is this is a turnaround. Grishik is up on time, winning every game. Could have and should have won the last game. Carlson, beat, like how many times has that move? Like six times, and gone nowhere. Yeah. This is ugly. Take the pawn. What happened here? Magnus is down on time now. Yeah, Magnuson, C7, give me a queen. C7, do it. Yep, there it is, game over. Wow, Magnus getting crushed in the bullet section so far. So what is that, plus three for Grishuk and bullet? Uh, plus three, plus, it's plus two, right? You know, he won the first two games because it was just 960. So he's plus two wow. right now, right? Sound yeah, that sounds right. So he's plus two in the bullet, which is shocking because I mean everyone was in awe of Carlson's bullet since um, last year's win over Nakamura. 
Yep. Um, well, Grishik I mean, is. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm shocked. I'm I'm in shock right now, but I'm excited. I'm excited. This is this is it, right? This is game on. And the crowd's going wild. The crowd is going wild, right? You just see Carlson get crushed like this. Carlson and did lose the bullet portion to Nakamura, by the way, five four. I mean, okay, it was Nakamura, but yes, he crushed Grishik last time, eight to one, when they played bullet. And I mean, Hikaru actually. I mean, okay, he has to get through Sergey Karyak, and that's a huge matchup. But Hikaru must be very happy to see that Magnus Carlsen is not so invincible in the bullet right now because yeah. that's really the kind of control that you know, Hikaru is really renowned for. So, yep. um, all right, so far in this game, it looks like White is doing very well because that pin on the C5 Knight is really annoying to deal with. Um, Knight A4 is going to be a threat. But um, even if White captures on C5, I guess it's not that easy to get to the C5. Pawn. I mean, I still like White here. Oh, I love White. Yep. Okay, never mind. Yeah. C five pawn's pretty easy to get to. So G five here, or F three at some point. This is getting a little unclear, a little uncomfortable. Ooh, I guess F three first might have been better than um, because it, it would have forced the bishop away to H one. Then he could have went G five and threatened Queen H five. So he's going to have to close the king side or else get checkmated. But if he does so, White should be winning. I mean, this is. Kind of okay, right? Practical decision, even though it's probably totally unsound. You got to go for it if you're Grishuk. And then a smart decision back by Carlson to give up the rook and try to shut down the light squares. Yep, smart decision by you to shut your window so that that alarm didn't get too loud. Uh, um, my windows are shut, but I'm in New York City, and that's what I going... said. Your windows are shut. Smart decision by you. <laughs> I know it's hard for you to realize when I'm giving you a compliment, but hey, it happens. Um, it happens so frequently that I just don't know. Bishop g4 or knight g4, but bishop g4 is... Okay, again, Grishik is doing what you need to do here, people. He's just making open lines, keeping it tactical, hoping for the opportunity of a bullet blunder. It happens to the best of them. Um, this is... This looks like a pretty clear loss here for, for black, who has nothing. White, it's just a matter of time before moves like bishop... I was going to say bishop f5 there was even nasty. But uh, this also works. White up yeah. a piece and uh, the only one who can win. Grishik needs to resign. He needs to resign and, and play into the game. He's smart. He knows match strategy. Don't keep playing this one on, Sasha. Okay, I think he's uh, going to realize it here in a second. Resigns. And with that, he resigns. Twelve and a half minutes to go in the total game clock. And uh, this one is going to come down to the seconds and the wires if Grisha can keep winning some of these games here. Evans Gambit, Gary Kasparov, Masterclass, our sponsor of the 2017 Speed Chess Championship. Check it out. See Gary's uh, review of his epic win over Vichy Anon from their World Championship match in the Evans Gambit. I just I, always hate these positions for black. Like, yeah, I see, don't... So, like, why doesn't the Evans Gambit get played more? I mean, seriously, right? I it's, love it's, it. You know, it's fun. It's very saucy, as you would say, but it's sassy. Um, sassy is what the cool kids say, Robert. Saucy but, is what is what um, bros try to say who think they're cool. Okay? So that's why you would say saucy. No, that's why you just said saucy. Okay. Okay, whatever. Anyway, I think so. <laughs> eight, eight straight games have been decisive. So we, you know, that's that's no exciting. No draws. And Grishuk is once again down by five, and you said there are 12 minutes left approximately, so... Yeah, now 11 and a half minutes left, racing against the game clock. They are hashtag Yoda. Um, so now all of a sudden, Black is just doing extremely well, right? Black is up a pawn here. There's a weak C pawn. There's no attack on the king side. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Black node knight h5 here, pretty thematic. Wow, so I'll suddenly hate White's position a lot. Well, I mean, despite you you liking uh, Black's position uh, in this situation, I don't want to remind you of uh, of your own loss in this in this uh, Evans Gambit in a famous event. Do you want to bring it up now or later? You my loss to Hikaru. <laughs> Why did you have to do that? Well, because it was instructive from the perspective that you've also felt the pain that Carlson's feeling right now, getting getting beaten in the Evans Gambit. Carl, firstly, I was black in that game and I lost, and Carlson's better. With no, black. I was. That's what I'm saying. You were black in that game, like Magnus is, and I think I think Grishik's going to get it. 
Why do you think Grishik's going to get it? I don't know. Grishik's down like a zillion pawns. He's going to play rook c2, rook c1. We love the Evans gambit here. And then, then b5, and I just protect my knight. So I don't know what you're talking about. All right, I wish, fine. I wish you were correct. <laughs> I also wish. Uh, all right, okay. knight a3 comes for black. Oh, I thought Magnus would play knight a3 and simplify. Wait, isn't knight d2 just... Good for white now? Mm, no, knight d2, rook c8, trade on... Uh, on uh, C4, bunch time to take on B7. This isn't a bad C4. idea, though. And also, I mean, Grishik is going to have a mating net if he can somehow get a rook and a knight together over here against the Black King. That knight on F5 is super sassy. H4, H5. Cement that knight's position. Maybe start with King F2. Yeah. Just to avoid. Okay, but now Carlson says no, thank you. So that knight on h4 is looking real good. King h6, king g5. <laughs> yeah. In case you didn't catch that, everybody, that was Robert Hess's favorite form of humor known as sarcasm. That knight on h4 <laughs> is not looking good. <laughs> uh, sometimes sarcasm isn't noticed, so I have to clarify. All right. Magnus this is, is going to win the king and pawn ending, mainly because he gets a queen and gets all the pawns with it. So... Uh, What's the easiest road here? Probably also could have just gobbled the h3 pawn, but this well, is Well, the queens enough. are traded by force there. Ah, uh, yeah, four. I didn't see that. Yep. Uh, if king b7, everybody queen d5. If the king did the d file, queen d5. So it was just over. Well, you know what? Honestly, that was the that was the world champion doing what he needed to do, Robert. That was him rebounding, re-grabbing a six-game lead, and honestly clinching the match with it. I mean that that's yeah, I think that's pretty Magnus much it. Watch the computer chess championship because he played this line in the exchange French that we saw. One of our favorite openings ever, right? Yeah, but I mean this was played a number of times in the uh the, you know in the computer chess championship. So Magnus must have had his eyes on the on those that tournament. Well, we got to yeah. ask Magnus how he was feeling as Grishik went on a run there in bullet and uh And how, how he rebounded, right? So, interesting decision. Okay, giving up the b7 pawn because queen b7, rook b8, and then there's no queen takes a6 because bishop h takes h2 check, picks up the queen. So, queen a7 and queen c8, and I think that queen's trapped over on a7. So, not a good look for Magnus right now. Magnus is losing this. Yeah, I think he's... A no, little, go queen c8. A little frustrated. Queen. queen c8, maybe white has d5, getting the queen out? Then I go bishop c5. At the ah, end. you Take trap my lady. There Very you go, nice. Sasha. Very nice. Sasha, you found it. So much easier to do commentary than play. I mean, just unbelievable. You know what? <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, so rook... Do I take on f6? Gf6? Rook, take on f6? Okay, he's going rook a8. Makes sense. Another way to skin that cat. Black has the queen and should be pretty easily winning here. Um, an endgame with and enough I pawn weaknesses on both sides of the board lets the queen do what she does. Bounce around and just outplay the pieces who can't quite coordinate in time. Yep. So the worst thing that could happen for black is if the knights, the two white knights they traded for the bishop and knight, and that bishop stays on e5, that yep. would not be a good look. Yep. Um, so there goes c5. That was a nice little uh, transition there by Grisha, queen c6, queen b5 with tempo. I was thought I thought maybe for a second he was blundering c7, but but indeed I was wrong. Big surprise there. Uh, okay, but this is really nice because as Robert was saying, what you don't want is to, is to trade off everything but the bishop and the rook. That would let white get what they need with rook c7. Although now he's... What? what? It's, it's worth noting, as I'm being told, that Grishuk is 0-2 in games where he has the extra queen. So that's not a, not a good sign for Grishuk here. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that sounds like a Mike Klein stat right there. Stat boy. Mike Klein, Mike Klein did inform me of that, so good on him. The, uh, uh, whoa, knight d6? Okay, I don't see how black is gonna. It's just winning here. Yeah, I agree. The counterplay has, has arrived. And all, and now with no more tar, I mean, this is exactly what I was trying to say in the beginning why the queen was better, everybody, because there were targets on both sides of the board. 
uh, so the Black Queen could outmaneuver and outplay. But now, now there's only play on one side of the board. So unless he swindles some sort of checkmate here, this is exactly how the pieces can not only hang with the Queen, but have those rare scenarios where they can outplay her. So and there's uh, not a lot of time left. Uh, there's a Queen C6 here, for example, would have been very tricky. So um, I'm not even sure who's better, if anyone is better. But yeah, it may just nine- end in a draw then because of that. I mean, Grishik wants more than a draw, as he is, as he needs, and is required to go for. But this is this has not gone well. I think, I think this initial plan we applauded with c5 maybe maybe wouldn't have been as good as just trading off that bishop originally for the knight. Oh, queen d5 check. Okay, oh, and, and Grishik does blunder. He does blunder. A queen e2 check comes, and queen uh, you work your way out, and you win the bishop, and black resigns. Mick, White Carlson resigns. blundered that one away. Magnus had it. He had uh, he had um, he had things going where he wanted. Shout out to Master Leaf, FIDE Master title player playing Guess the Move, who just won that round with 35 out of 77. So first of all, kudos to you for guessing on 77 moves. I mean that's pretty awesome. Um, but uh, last chance to play Guess the Move, everybody. You can log on to chess.com. So only a few minutes left here. We have just crossed under the four minute mark, Robert. Um, in the match. And we will have the players joining us for interviews. So, looks like Magnus Carlsen is going to be moving on into the next round of the Speed Chess Championship. I think we can pretty much call it here. Yeah, it's impossible for Sasha Grishuk to catch up with, you said there are four minutes left, so Magnus yeah. just flag the next four games and still win the match. Yeah. Oh, actually, they have the 960, but you, you get the point. So. Yeah. Magnus moves on. Magnus moves on, and uh, it's going to be Magnus Carlsen in the finals while we await the matchup within a couple weeks of Sergei Karyakin and Hikaru Nakamura. So uh, make sure you are staying tuned to Chess.com TV uh, and all of our news sections at Chess.com slash news as we make the announcement of that date official. We've already talked about it being tentatively planned for December 15th. Nakamura versus Karyakin is going down. Uh, that's the tenth straight game with no draws, FYI. That last uh, that last game. So lots of decisive chess here to end the day. Gives uh, gives the fans what they want, right? Lots of winning games makes Jack a dull boy. Wait, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> that didn't make any sense. But this so, this third position also looks exciting because Black is about to try to go d4. If like Bishop c5, you consider going d4 and sacrificing some material. And now white is trying to. Uh, okay, now pieces are coming off the board. I guess not. Trade exciting rook c8 should be a draw. Yeah, bishop e6. Oh, or not. Ooh, now he, now that he's allowed bishop c6, suddenly black actually. No, I mean it's just I'm looking at the past d pawn and thinking that black has chances here, but I'm likely wrong as usual. I would say black's better, but I don't see how to to get this full point. The bishop d3 here feels like the move. Bishop oh, okay. takes bishop a6. a6. That's also very nice, and that's actually that's actually probably too many problems for black right there. That's clever. That is clever. Because if black keeps trying to win, he might end up in trouble. Bishop d3 here with rook yep. h7. Yep. H4. That h4 pawn is falling. And now here comes the b pawn, b5. Keep it going. Grishik has, uh, he's magnus Magnus in this game. Rook d7 is a great move because giving up the a pawn for the past b pawn. And- much better. That b pawn becomes much closer to queening now, everybody. Totally worth that exchange. Okay, still probably should just be a draw, but this has become one of those wacky positions where it's a draw with, like, computers playing easily but humans can make blunders when both sides have past pawns and all kinds of weird stuff going on we'll see if we get a little tickle here <laughs> so it looks like the tickle's happening and rook f4 should be a repetition get your tickle on nope he wants more than tickle well he wants less because i was about to say that always runs into rook h4 wait did grishik just lose the game no yeah did he really <laughs> i think he <laughs> That that wasn't the uh, optimal plan of action there. A scientific uh, term, less than ideal, I guess. Wow. 
Game over. That pawn's cleaning. Well, Grishik may or may not have known that uh, that this was his last chance to get a victory. Um, it looks like. We are officially moved on. The eight, the uh, total game timer being a few seconds behind our official judges' clock, which means Chess 960 has started, which means we are at the end of the match. So what questions are we going to have for them as we look at this super interesting and, as always, unique Chess 960 position? Um, well, I guess we have to ask Sasha about, you know, all those games where he slipped up, where it seemed like he had great positions, and, you know, when he got into time trouble, it just wasn't working out for him. So there's, there's definitely that. Right. And I, what do you got in mind? I guess we could ask. No, I if, think we can definitely ask Magnus how he was feeling there. Obviously, that's the most games he's lost in the bullet portion. Oh my life. God, he lost the same already. Look, Danny, the, the king has no moves. What? <laughs> he got essentially made in the center of the board to sacrifice his queen because he forgot about Queenside Castle. <laughs> S- slightly surprising, I guess. Um, but that means That's the match is quickly over where we were not expecting it to be. And uh, we will invite the players back. Uh, yeah. they, are, they are here. Ma- Magnus, can you hear us as well? Uh. Hi, Magnus. Hi, Sasha. Yeah, hello. Uh, that, that, ended, that ended rather abruptly. Can you tell us what happened on the D file there, Magnus? Surprising. Yeah, I just forgot uh, about the the rules, sort of. But, yeah. Got it. Um, well, anyway, uh, teasing aside, obviously, congratulations. You, you played a played a great match today. Uh, the bullet portion there got a little bit sticky to start. Were you were you feeling nervous there, and were you were you surprised by how the first few bullet games went with Sasha going on a run? No, I mean it's just kind of difficult to play. I mean, it felt like my pieces are stuck in mud. You know, it's. Uh... Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, we need to. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you just it's. Yeah, the game becomes rather slow, and it's it's sort of hard to get get uh, a rhythm. But okay. Any, any anyway, yeah, I I, uh, I I think I was outplayed in the bullet portion, but fortunately, I had a very big lead. So. Yeah. Uh, Sasha, it was. The five-minute portion there felt like there were there were a few opportunities with you having uh, a slight edge, sometimes sometimes a clearly better, almost winning position there. But time pressure seemed to be the difference. Was it something you were kind of aware was going on that you were that you were under time pressure, or or did you have a different thought about about how the five-minute portion went? Yeah, first of all, congratulations, Magnus. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think at the beginning I played very slow. I mean, which is. Uh, which almost equals uh, to very bad. I mean, I mean, it's impossible to play so slow. I mean, I just could not calculate uh, any tactics, any simple tactics. That's why just to avoid blundering pieces, I was spending so much time. <coughs> but of course, then once you go down to seconds, when you cannot, I mean, when you are not in a good form, then you start blundering. You are just a sort of postpone uh, blunders. Yeah, I mean, I had some probably good positions, but but I think overall Magnus played very good. I mean, extremely well in, uh, in the, at the beginning in five two portion. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Already after five two, it was I was minus four or five. It was very difficult. But at least I'm happy that uh, I sort of competed in a bullet. Like the only thing, uh, the only good thing for me in this match. Found found yourself in the bullet. There. Well, yeah, we definitely uh, apologize, and and we will work on the uh, the feeling of the of the bullet there, Magnus. But in, in regards to your overall um, game, uh, what's it, happened it, with the rhythm and bullet? Sorry, what? What has happened with the rhythm and bullet? Magnus was describing he was struggling with some of the some of the feel of the of the pieces and the board that we're we need to work uh, on. Uh, that's a chess.com problem. We'll work on. But um what I was gonna say, Magnus, is the flip side of of, of, of Grishik's 
uh, of Sasha's time pressure was you being up on time. Is that something you just come into with these matches, just knowing that even if you can't solve everything in the moment, you seem to constantly be up on time against your opponents when it matters? And, and if you could maybe talk a little bit about how you manage your time throughout these, uh, these matches. Yeah, I th but I think it's a lot about uh, what Sasha was talking about, that when, when you're feeling good, when you're playing well, then you also play much faster. So at the, f at the start, I, I, I think I was playing very well, uh, at least much better than I, I had been in my previous matches. And then, yeah, then it wasn't, wasn't so hard to, to play fast. But, but then, yeah, when you start to struggle, you kind of slow down. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's, the w that's the way it is. So yeah, I try not to get in time trouble, but towards the end it was impossible because I just wasn't thinking, you know, very, uh, very fast. Magnus, we were wondering that, you know, you just had a match against Wesley So the other day. Do you feel like you were informed because you followed up a match so quickly with another? Yeah, I think it's certainly an advantage, and it probably told at the start. Yeah, uh, he needed a bit more time to get into it. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, at some point in the match, it doesn't matter that much. But certainly, I had an advantage at, at the start. Uh, what do you think about this game where you sacrificed the queen for Dabio's compensation? Uh, I mean, it's a five-two. I think it was some Rui Lopez. And you had rook on a1, and I had rook on h4. You had king knight on g5. What do you think? Or it was, uh, you think, a good sacrifice? Because I, 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 I blundered. <laughs> I just blundered. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was just lucky that it was not completely losing. Yeah, but, but I, I could not find uh, uh, salvation for me. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we that was definitely a, a highlightable. And yeah, sorry, Sasha, that didn't work out. But it was uh, we we were debating amongst us whether Magnus had blundered or not. But I think we could tell from his face that he that he that he didn't see it. But uh, yeah, it, it definitely was an interesting one. A lot of interesting games today. Thank you both so much. Um, obviously, we'll continue to to work on everything, Magnus. We really appreciate both you guys being uh, great in our interview here. And uh, Robert, any final questions for our players before we ask Magnus? How, how he thinks the Karyakin Nakamura match will go. Yeah, one last question for uh, Sasha. Sasha, you just are a beast at the 960 chess. Is that something you specifically work on, or you just feel like you have a natural knack for uh, that, that form of chess? No, but I mean, it's just luck. I mean, at least in this <laughs> match. Okay, just last game, I mean, uh, that's all you need to know about my chess 960. That's my <laughs> last game. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you did go 3-0 and in the Chess 960, so uh, a, a takeaway there as far as the match goes. But Magnus, Sergei Karyakin takes on Hikaru Nakamura. Um, it's going to be an exciting one, we think, and, 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 and very close despite Hikaru's online uh, beastly blitz and bullet reputation. How do you see those two players matching up with what we think Hikaru having a big edge in the bullet and, and then Karyakin uh, maybe having a slight edge in some of the blitz? But how do you see those two players going at it? Uh, well, first of all, when is it going to be? Uh, the, the plan right now is December 15th, mid-December. Ah, okay, okay. So it's a long, long time. To, Unfortunately, uh, yeah, with, uh, with yeah. Uh, the, the Grand Prix and then the London tournament. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think Hikaru is obviously uh, a favorite, uh, but Sergei was very, very good in his match with Jan last time out, so, so you never know. Uh, but I wouldn't bet against Sigara, that's for, for sure. All right. Well, thank you. Um, we're, yeah, we're all we excited. Might, uh, arrange a bet with you, Magnus. <laughs> so so who, who are you betting on then? I mean, I don't think uh, that uh, Karekin is an underdog. I mean, it's just extremely close. Maybe. He, yeah, he's become very good at blitz. All right. Well, we will see. Um, obviously, it's it's more more it's longer away than anybody wants, including Magnus and the fans. But very very busy uh, global chess schedules these days. So, thank you both, Sasha. Congratulations on getting this far, uh, beating Maxime Vache Legrav. And uh, sorry it didn't work out today, but best of luck next year. And Magnus, thank you once again for for uh, entertaining all of us. And uh, we'll we'll see you in the finals. Thank you. See you. All right, well, we, um, 
there you have it. We have uh, the final comments there from Magnus and Sasha. Your your final comments before we move on and and get set for the next match. First again, I just say how much I love Sasha Grishuk. He is so <laughs> he is the best post match interview, win or lose. He is just awesome. Agreed. And like he just went right into the chest, you know, from a game from like the beginning of the match that none of us were thinking about. Right. And he's such a nice guy. He's a great competitor. So I, I think. It just goes to show how strong Magnus is that he was able to take out uh, Grishuk in this in this fashion with such a you know a big differential here. Five points is a lot when you're facing Sasha Grishuk. But I, Danny, you know if if Grishuk was on a different side of the bracket, didn't have to play Magnus potentially until the final, you never know. He could make it all the way. So uh, really strong competitor. I was impressed by his play. I think he just wasn't in the right state of mind today. He was blundering at inopportune moments. And Magnus Carlson, to his credit, played some really good chess as. Uh, Grishuk admitted as well. Yep. Well, agreed 100%, and I can't wait to see what happens in the in the next matchup between Karyakin and Nakamura. And I love it when top players tend to disagree on who the favorite is because I think it keeps all the rest of us who uh, don't know these players as well as, as Magnus and, and Sasha do right on the edge of our seats in regards to who might win that match. So uh, also really fun to note that uh, Sasha overperformed our, our uh, statistical modules predictions, which is awesome. We love being wrong because that gives us an opportunity to get better. And uh, today, Sasha, even though he was, um, he was given a line of, of 10 games, he only lost the match by five. And uh, really, really performed incredibly well against Magnus, despite, like, I think everyone agreed. He started slow, made some blunders in the five-minute portion, was constantly under time pressure, which, as we highlighted, is usually a sign of being out of form, out of shape. Um, and, yeah, definitely, definitely um, interesting to note that Magnus may have benefited greatly from just having a match a few days ago versus So. So... Great stuff. Either way, we thank everybody for being here. All uh, more than 15,000 of you at the peak, uh, peak viewership. Don't even have any idea how many of you are still here. But me and Grandmaster Robert Hess signing off for the two of us and sending you out one more reminder that you have to go and uh, sign up at masterclass.com slash chess. Check out Gary Kasparov's course. Sign up for it. Chess.com members, you can now get the full masterclass from Gary Kasparov. It is available Go get it, and uh, here's, your, here's your final sneak peek from our sponsors of the 2017 Speed Chess Championship. I'm here to share with you my knowledge of the game of chess. It's not just checks and attacks. You have to be creative. Check. And now we can look at a few studies when changing pieces could lead to a decisive advantage for one side or to be a defensive mechanism to save the game that looks otherwise desperate. White has an extra piece, but our pawn is under attack and our knight is under attack. In the middle game, or in the opening, you definitely have to pay attention to this threat because knight is more valuable than a pawn. But we're in the end game. So protecting the knight doesn't do us any good. If we protect the knight and black takes the pawn, that's a theoretically drawn position. Rook and knight cannot win against a lone rook. But how can we benefit from keeping this pawn alive? The trick is that we play a quiet move, a3. It doesn't seem logical, black simply takes the knight with a check, but then king g2, and surprise, surprise, the rook that has so many moves cannot avoid the exchange. If rook goes back on h1 or g1, then rook d1 will exchange rooks, and our pawn is unstoppable. But instead of moving to the first rank, rook h1 or g1, black rook can go back to f4. And then we understand why our pawn moved not to f to a3. Sometimes it's very important. You make a, just a small move, one square, but it has devastating effect because this pawn protects square b4. And after rook b3 check, king goes on c2 or a2, doesn't matter, then we'll go rook b4. And rook, black rook is trapped. Technically it's not trapped because black can exchange rook, either taking on b4, and after a b4, our pawn is unstoppable, or moving rook on g4, and then after exchange, our pawn is again unstoppable. And that's one of the lessons of this endgame.